Section One of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah. Voiceovers by Kirk.com. Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume One. How it feels to be fifty by Ellis Parker Butler. To tell you the honest truth, I am obliged to say that if I had not been asked to write these few lines on how it feels to be fifty, being fifty wouldn't have meant anything in my young life. Of course, this will be a terrible disappointment to the thousands of people who for twenty-five years have been counting off the months and days and hours and minutes, saying, In twenty-one years he will be fifty. In ten months more he will be fifty. In eight minutes more he will be fifty and then he will show us how it feels, and we can absorb the knowledge from his wise old lips and get ready to feel as we ought to feel when we too are fifty. It is a shame to disappoint such a large and intelligent audience, but I am compelled to state that I do not feel like a doddering old wreck, teetering on the edge of the grave. I remember a lovely underwear advertisement that depicted a sort of cradle-to-grave scene, with a toddling youngster at one end of the bridge of life, and an aged man at the other end, and men of various progressive underwear ages scattered between. They were all arrayed in nice, comfy underwear, and the bridge over which they were ambling was highest in the middle. It suggested that a man climbs up the bridge of life half his years, and then goes downgrade, until he doesn't need any more underwear, because of circumstances over which he has no control. This bridge of life, or hill of life idea, with its forty years uphill and then forty years downhill, is pure fake. If life were like that, I would now be writing a sadly introspective farewell ode, telling how I had reached the apex of life's hill and now saw before me the long slope down into the valley, toward the river all must cross. I would ring in something about the setting sun and the cooing of the turtle doves in the neat little cemetery at the foot of the hill, and then say I was shouldering my heavy pack with hope and resignation for the final weary downhill hike. I would add something about being footsore, about spent talents and honorable gray hairs, and everybody would weep and begin to save up money for a floral funeral wreath for me. The fact is that except for the almanac, I don't know whether I'm fifty or twenty. Judged by the way I feel today, I shall keep right on going uphill until, it may be a thousand years from now, I come to a jumping-off place. At fifty I have no feeling of starting downhill, or having reached the top of any hill. If you want to call my life a hill, I'll say, I see the road rising just as steadily and regularly and pleasantly ahead of me now as when I was twenty and the top of it is so far from where I am now, and so much higher, that I can't even see it. Life is just beginning to be interesting. At fifty, I feel like a young teamster who has just got his skittish colts broken in, and is now ready to start out on the real job. Until now, I have been a raw hand, stopping to adjust the harness, talking about what I meant to do, studying the guidebooks, getting the stiff wagon greased, laying in provisions, fussing around one way or another, trying to find out where I wanted to go, and why I wanted to go there, and how to get there when I started. At fifty, a man should feel younger and stronger, and more fit than he ever felt before. I do. Most men do, I believe. Younger fellows do not even play properly. They make a sort of work of it. It is not until a man is fifty that he knows that golf and fishing and poker and pinochle are play, and that work is play, and that life itself is a kind of interesting big game, too. I took out an old photograph of mine the other day, one I had taken away back in 1887 when I was eighteen, and I remembered how full of cares and worries I was at that time. I used to stay awake night after night and worry over getting married, for instance. I used to wonder how I could ever get up enough courage to go up to a girl and ask her to marry me. That awful necessity loomed up before me and filled me with woe and agony, gave me cold chills and hot flashes, and made me absolutely miserable for years. 
I remember that when I was about twenty, I saw an item in a newspaper, away inside somewheres and tucked in a corner. It said statistics show that bashful men are usually the first to marry. That item was a wonderful source of relief to me. I cut it out and carried it in my pocket, and whenever I felt the cold chill of fear come over me, and I began to sweat at the thought that some day I must ask a girl to marry me, I got out that clipping and read it, and tried to brace up and be brave. Today I have a wife and four children, and that worry is gone. My hair was another great worry in those days. My father is quite bald, and he had become bald when he was a very young man, when he was twenty-one or twenty-two, I believe. I don't know why a young man should think a heavy head of hair is such an imperative necessity when hats are so cheap, but I was haunted by a dire fear that I might grow bald while still young. I was in continual distress lest the butler baldness might be hereditary. I had just one great hope, that at least some of my hair might stay on my head until I was married anyway. When I became engaged, this hair fear took the place of the afraid-to-propose fear. It was with me night and day. It was a keen personal agony. The thought that I might have to walk up the church aisle to the music of the wedding march, with my bald head shining like a white watermelon, almost made me collapse with shame. And the worst of it was that my hair did begin to come out by handfuls. I shed hair like a cat in the springtime. Those were awful days. I saw myself doomed to a life of hairless disgrace and degradation. At fifty I have more hair than a man of that age is expected to have, and I don't care a continental whether it stays or goes. It has worn well. If it goes tomorrow, I can say, no matter. It was a good crop while it lasted and it lasted well. If I become absolutely bald, it will be a good publicity feature, like the late Bill Nye's baldness. I should worry. At fifty, the few pains and aches I have are, so to speak, standardized. They are old friends. If they went away, I should miss them. I should not be myself without them. There is one I'm especially fond of, because I've had it so long. It resides in my tummy. I have had that pain so many years that I have, so to speak, built my character around it, as an oyster builds the beautiful, lustrous pearl around the intruding grain of sand. Forty years ago I used to howl when that pain came. I used to lie across a chair or a log or a hummock of ground and howl when it made remarks. Twenty years ago when that pain gripped me I used to imagine death was about to end my promising career. Today. I treat it like an old friend when it makes itself felt. It can't fool me. I know its tricks and its manners. I say, hello, hello. There you are again, are you? Welcome home, old top. Sorry I can't give you more attention, but I've got such a lot to do. Just hang around until you get ready to go, old sport, and make yourself comfortable. At fifty, my general health is better than it ever was. I have shaken off a bilious headache that was the curse of my youthful days. Proper eyeglasses have corrected an astigmatism that gave me other headaches twenty years ago. With the same glasses I can see as well now as I ever did. My appetite is as good as it ever was. I enjoy everything in life more than I ever did. I am more sure of myself. I know what I can do, and I'm not afraid to do it. At fifty, a young man should have just about completed his preparations to begin to live his real life. There are some precocious young fellows who get their growth by the time they are forty-five, but I'm not one of them. There are some few prodigies who do worthwhile living before forty, but there are not many of them. At fifty, a man begins to live the worthwhile life of a man, as distinguished from his life as a mere animal. At fifty, he should have his family pretty well built up and complete, his experimental crops sown, and ready to do his work and to enjoy his life in a hearty, unafraid, efficient manner. Without checking up the items carefully, and without claiming that some things done by the youngsters are not worth keeping, I venture to say the world would be surprised to find out how much of its best literature, art, the drama, mechanical inventions, and so on, would remain if everything done by men and women under fifty were eliminated. At fifty, a man is just about mature in this climate. 
and he is not a tomato. He does not decay as soon as he is ripe. He stays ripe and sound for many years, and each of his years beyond fifty should be worth five or ten of his earlier unripe years. To the young fellow of twenty-five it may seem that the man of fifty is an aged and doddering wreck, who must have the thought of death constantly in mind. I'll venture to say, judging by myself, that, except when the life insurance man comes around with his propaganda, the man of fifty never thinks of death at all. Why should he? Personally, I worried a great deal more about life insurance and what style of coffin I'd like when I was twenty-one than I do now. Now I carry all the life insurance I can afford, as a plain business proposition, and I let it go at that. When I was twenty-one, I worried about dying at some untimely age, and leaving someone or other to starve to death, as per the prospectus. Well, I have become skeptical about people starving to death. I've never yet seen anyone do it. I mention this death business because I'm trying to imagine what a young fellow believes a man of fifty thinks of. I know some of them think we fifty-year-olders are decrepit old ruins, dwelling in the past and looking fearfully forward to an early dissolution. Take my word for it, Sonny. No man of fifty, unless he be suffering from some dire disease, thinks of death at all, as applicable to himself. As for myself, seeing how things are going nowadays, I don't give death a thought. For all I know, and all you know, before I'm ten years older, the great manager of things may decide it's time to go back to the old regime, and make men live five hundred or six hundred or nine hundred and sixty-nine years, as they did in the days of Methuselah and Noah. So why should I worry? At eighty or ninety, I imagine, some men do get a little weary of life, and begin to be indifferent to its continuance. But at fifty, many things are just beginning to be interesting. Until lately, I've been so busy raising a family and getting a home and one thing and another that I have not had time to give proper attention to my golf. I am planning to put in thirty or forty good years improving my game. I have discovered that you cannot avoid faults in your golf unless you know what they are, and you cannot thoroughly know a golf fault until you acquire it. I think I have now acquired all the golf faults there are, and from now on I mean to have a lot of fun getting rid of them. Another thing I need a lot of time for now is my postage stamp collection. For forty years or so I have sort of fooled along with it, getting acquainted with the general methods and outlines of the sport, and deciding just what to specialize in. I have now a pretty fair working knowledge, and I know what I want to do in that line. I need a lot of time for that. I don't expect to do any very great things at it until I really get some leisure, say when I'm eighty or ninety years old, but in the meanwhile I want to pick up a few rarities now and then. To do that I'll have to make a little more money than I have been making, because I have reached a point where the stamps I need run into money rapidly, and I expect in the next twenty or thirty years to spend quite a little on my fishing. After forty years of it, I'm just beginning to learn how to fish properly, and I want to grow some real flowers. I want to have a tulip bed that will draw people from a hundred miles and make them beg for bulbs. But I haven't been able to get at the tulip affair this year, because I've been out touring the country as a platform humorist. There are a half a dozen other things I'm planning to do, but these are all subsidiary to my writing, of course. At fifty, I feel I am about ready to begin my life work as a writer. For the past few years, thirty or forty of them, I have been experimenting around and trying to get my bearings and learn what life really is. I have done some pretty raw, inexperienced stuff, but it has been worthwhile because a young fellow has to go through the experimental stage. It takes time to decide what one really wants to do and how he wants to do it. But when a man is fifty, with a long life ahead of him and a fair notion of what he wants to do, he begins to be hopeful. At fifty, I feel I am about ready to begin writing the eight or ten novels I have been wanting to write. Amelia E. Barr was about fifty years old when she began writing novels, and she wrote about seventy of them after that. Richardson wrote Pamela. Some called it the first modern novel when he was fifty. Daniel Defoe turned to fiction only when he was fifty-five. 
There are hundreds of writers who did all their work, or most of their best work, after fifty. Oliver Wendell Holmes was forty-eight when he wrote The Autocrat of the Breakfast Table, his first great work. Longfellow wrote Hiawatha when he was forty-eight, and much of his best work followed. Whittier wrote Snowbound and Maud Muller at fifty-nine, and continued writing until he was seventy-nine. Tennyson was still writing at eighty-three. Trilby was written when Dumayer was sixty, Les Miserables when Victor Hugo was sixty, Kenleyworth when Scott was sixty, with sixteen novels following it. Reckoning a man's life by years is the biggest sort of flapdoodle. All of a man's worthwhile living may come after his fifty. Between fifty and fifty-one I may catch my biggest trout, and I expect to do it. After fifty I may write my best stories, and I mean to do it. In my backyard is a huge white oak tree. Some experts say that it is three hundred and fifty years old, some say six hundred, and one has estimated it at eight hundred. It does not make a bit of difference to the tree. It is as young and enthusiastic when spring comes as it was when it was two years old. It puts forth leaves, grows new and tender twigs, bears sound acorns, shelters its colony of bird families, and holds one end of the clothesline just as well as it ever did. It is a healthier, happier tree at six hundred years of age than thousands of pert young ten-year-olds, and is producing more and better oak leaves. If you went and asked how it feels to be six hundred years old, it would say, What do you mean, six hundred years old? What has that got to do with it? A few hundred years one way or the other mean nothing to a sound, healthy, white oak tree. A few tens of years one way or the other mean nothing to a sound, healthy man. We know that Homer and Socrates were aged men because certain famous portrait busts have advertised it. But how many know whether Cicero, Plato, Marcus Aurelius, or Pythagoras did their best work before or after fifty? We don't know, and we don't care. Take Noah, for example. At fifty, Noah was a comparatively unknown citizen, with a neighborhood reputation for homely virtues, and a nice growing family but he had cut no very great figure in the world. Some of the younger fellows thought of him now and then as a sort of aged gentleman who was about ready to drop into the grave. Probably they thought it was quite a feather in Noah's cap when one of them stopped him and asked him to write a short paper on the subject, how it feels to be fifty. There's a chance for you to produce a wonder, the young fellow said to Noah. Make the essay just as personal and real and funny as you possibly can. Age is one of the most interesting subjects in the world. Everybody either looks forward to being fifty or back to having been fifty. There's no subject about which human beings think more. All right, said Noah. I'll do it. But you must expect to be disappointed, because I don't feel old or aged or any of that sort. I feel young and lively, as if I were just beginning to live. Shush, said the young fellow. You're old. At fifty you have one foot in the grave. That stands to reason. Now be a nice old fellow and write something that will please the neighborhood society. Something about standing on the apex of a hill of life, looking down the farther side, and that sort of thing. So Noah did. He aimed to please. He wrote the essay and said he was now fifty, and had but a few years to live, and that he did hate to think of it so soon, having to part from one and all. The paper made a great hit. It was loudly applauded. And fifty years after that, Noah was still alive. And fifty years after that, Noah was still alive. And then another fifty years passed, and Noah was still alive. Then one hundred years passed, and Noah was still alive. And two hundred years after that, Noah was still alive and going strong. And it went until one hundred years after that, that Noah made the big hit of his life by gathering his folks and his livestock into the ark. He was six hundred years, two months, and seventeen days old when the big rain began that was to make him famous. You can read that in Genesis, seventh chapter, eleventh verse. That was just five hundred and fifty years, two months, and seventeen days after the young fellow asked Noah to write how it felt to be an old man of fifty, starting on the downward path.
I think we should all take Noah as a model, and keep a young heart and an eager, forward-looking spirit until we are at least six hundred years, two months, and seventeen days old. Our forty days of glory and greatness and good service may come long after we are fifty, five hundred and fifty years after, for all we know. I like Noah. He had no surrender in him. Old at fifty? He considered himself a mere baby at fifty. At six hundred he was just getting into his proper stride. He was just ripe to tackle a big job like the flood. Chapter 9, verse 28. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years. Verse 29. And all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. It was about time he died. Nine hundred and fifty years ought to satisfy any man. In my family, barring accidents and diseases, we live to be ninety or ninety-six, and I ask you frankly, how you can expect me to fret and worry and be agedly philosophical when I am still only a young tart of fifty. It's too much to ask of me. At fifty, I feel myself just reaching my full powers mentally and physically, capable of more work and better work, more play and better play, and with so many years of work and play ahead of me that I never so much as think of my age or of being my age. I am keen and eager to get right at the next job I have on hand, and to make it a better piece of work than any I have ever done. The great expectations are not all on the younger side of fifty, but the great satisfactions are nearly all on the onward side of it. Life is not an up one side, down the other side hill. It is a long, winding road, good all the way, and the freshest, brightest flowers and the sweetest, solidest fruit usually grow beyond the fifty-year mile post. At twenty my life was a feverish adventure. At thirty it was a problem. At forty it was a labor. At fifty it is a joyful journey well begun. End of section one. How it feels to be fifty. Section 2 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Redhead and Whistlebritches When Tim Murphy let his enthusiasm get the better of his judgment, and in the excitement of that disastrous night, joined the front ranks of the strikers in a general mix-up and cracked the head of a deputy sheriff. The result was what he might have expected. Two years in the penitentiary. That was all right. The peace of the commonwealth must be preserved, and that is why laws and penitentiaries exist. But it sometimes goes hard with the mothers and wives. That is also to be expected, and the boy should have thought of it before he crowded into the front of the angry mob or struck the deputy. It went very hard with the boy's mother and wife. It went hard with his old man, too. It is a cruel thing to have one's only boy in the penitentiary, even if one is only a village hod carrier. Maggie Murphy, the boy's wife, did not suffer for food or shelter after the boy went to wear stripes, for old Mike had a handy little roll in the bank and a shanty of his own, and he took Maggie into his home and made a daughter of her. But the girl grew thin and had no spirits. She cried a good part of the time, quite as if Tim had been a law-abiding citizen instead of a law-breaking rowdy. Then... The baby came, and after that she cried more than ever. As for the boy's mother, it was to be expected that she would weep also. Mothers have a way of weeping over the son they love, even if he has gone wrong. It is not logical, but it is a fact. It is one of the grand facts of human life. When Maggie's baby came, the boy's mother could stand it no longer. It had been urged and there was some evidence to support it, that the boy had acted in self-defense. He said so himself, but he admitted that he had been in the front rank. The strikers had carried things with a high hand all along, and the jury had decided against him. Night and day the boy's mother begged the old man to try for a pardon, but Mike knew it was not worth a trial. The governor was an old man and a strong man, and not one to forgive an injury done to the state or to himself. He had never been known to forget a wrong, or to leave a debt unpaid. He was a just man, 
as the ancient Jews were just. It was this that had made him governor. His righteousness and fearlessness were greater than the cliques and bosses. Old Mrs. Murphy, however, was only a woman, and the boy was her boy, and she pardoned him. She knew he was innocent, for he was her boy. Mike refused a thousand times to ask the governor for a pardon, but as Mrs. Murphy was the boy's mother and had a valiant tongue, the old man changed his mind. One day he put on his old silk hat, and with Father Maurice, the good gray priest, went up to the capital. A strange pair they were to sit in the governor's richly furnished reception room, Mike with his smoothly shaven face red as the sunset, his snowy eyebrows, his white flecked red hair, and the shiny black of his baggy Sunday suit. Father Maurice, with his long gray beard that had been his before the days of the smoothly shaven priests, his kindly eyes, and the jolly rotundity of his well-fed stomach. The father's gentle heart was hopeful, but Mike sat sadly with his eyes on the toe of his boot, for he knew the errand was folly. Not alone because the governor had never pardoned a condemned man, but because it was he, Mike Murphy, who came. He remembered an incident of his boyhood, and he frowned as he recalled it. Think of it! He, Mike Murphy, had bullied the governor, had drubbed him and chased him, and worried the life out of him. That was why he had told the old woman it was of no use to try it. Who was he to come asking pardons when years ago he had done his best to make life miserable for the quaking schoolboy, who was now the stern-faced governor, the governor who never forgot or forgave, or left a debt unpaid, when the governor entered the reception room, he came in unexpectedly, as Father Maurice was leaning forward with one of Mike's red hands clasped in his two white ones. Mike was wiping his eyes with his coat sleeve. The governor paused in the doorway and coughed. His visitor started in surprise and then arose. It was Father Maurice who stated their errand. His seamed face turned upward to the serious eyes of the governor, and as he proceeded, Choosing his quaint, Frenchified English carefully, the governor's face became grave. He motioned them to their chairs. He was a gray-haired man, and his face was the face of a nobleman. Clear gray eyes were set deep under his brows, and his mouth was a straight line of uncompromising honesty. He sat with one knee thrown over the other. With one hand he fingered a pen on the desk at his side. The other he ran again and again, through the hair that stood in masses on his head. His face was long, and the cheekbones protruded. His nose was power, and his chin was resistance. He listened silently until Father Maurice had ended. Then he laid the pen carefully by the inkstand, unfolded his gaunt limbs, and arose. No, he said slowly, I cannot interfere. But his wife, his mother, asked the priest. He should have considered them before said the governor sadly. If you prepare a petition, I will consider it, but I cannot offer you any hope. They all come to me with the same plea, the wife and the mother, but they do not take the wife and the mother into account when the blow is struck. It is late to think of them when the prison door is closed. You will pardon me, father, but I am very tired tonight. He extended his hand in token that the interview was at an end and Mike arose from his chair in the shadow. He stood awkwardly, turning his hat while the governor shook the priest's hand, and then shuffled forward to be dismissed. "'Good night, sir,' said the governor. "'I did not hear your name.' "'Murphy,' the priest said quickly. "'Michael Murphy. He's the father of the boy.' The governor looked the old man over carefully, and the old man's eyes fell under his keen glances. "'Mike Murphy?' asked the governor slowly. Are you the Mike Murphy who used to go to old number three school in Harmon Town? Forty, no, nearly fifty years ago? There was a Mike Murphy sat on my bench. Are you the boy they called Redhead? The old man tried to answer. His lips formed the words, but his voice did not come. He nodded his head. Be seated, gentlemen, said the governor, and Father Maurice sat down hopefully. Mike Murphy dropped into a chair with deeper dejection. Well, well, the governor nodded his head slowly, his gray eyes searching the ruddy face before him. 
So you are the Michael Murphy who used to drub me? He smiled grimly. His eyes strayed from the old man's face, and their glance was lost in the air above his head. He smiled again, as he sat with the fingers of his left hand pressing the thin skin into a roll above his cheekbone, for he recalled an incident of his boyhood. The governor had once been an errant little coward. His mother lived in the big white house two blocks above the schoolhouse, on the opposite side of the street. Redhead Mike lived across the alley in his shanty. The governor's mother bought milk of Mrs. Murphy, and Redhead brought it every evening. Redhead was a wonderful boy. He was the first to go barefoot in the spring, picking his way with painful carefulness over the clods in the street. He was the only boy who chewed tobacco. Others chewed licorice or purple thistle tops. But Redhead had the real thing. He even smoked a real pipe, without dire consequences, and laughed at the other boy's mild substitutes of corn silk and lady cigars, and the way he swore was a liberal education. All the boys swore, more or less, especially when they were behind the barn smoking corn silk, but they knew it was not natural, it was a puny imitation, but the redhead article sounded right. But it was when it came to fighting that Redhead had proved his right to the worship of the world. He could lick any two boys in the school. The governor, who was plain Willie Gary then, could not fight at all. His early youth was one great fear of being whipped. The smallest boys in the school were accustomed to practice on him until they gained sufficient dexterity or courage to attack one another. He had a hundred opprobrious nicknames, which he accepted meekly. Crybaby was the favorite. When he was attacked, he hid his face in his arm and bawled, leaning his arm against any convenient fence or tree, while his tormentor drubbed his back at pleasure. He was happy when he could sneak home unmolested. The chiefest of his tormentors was Redhead, but there was no partiality. All the boys drubbed him. One day, Mrs. Gary made him a pair of breeches. They were good, stout breeches of dove-colored corduroy, and his mother was proud of them. So was Willie. As he walked to school, he felt that everyone saw and admired them. He felt as conspicuous as when, in a dream, he went to school in his nightdress, but he felt more comfortable. He took his seat in the schoolroom proudly, and when he was called to the blackboard to do a sum, he walked with a strut. He felt that even the big boys, the wonderful youths who had money to jingle in their pockets, observed him and he blushed as he imagined the eyes of the little women on the girl's side of the room following him. As he crossed the floor, the legs of his breeches rubbed against each other, giving forth the crisp corduroy sound of whooshed, whooshed, whooshed. It could be heard in the farthest corner. All the scholars looked up from their slates or books. He caught Bessie Clayton's eye upon him, and his cheek flamed. She had blue eyes and yellow curls, and snubbed him daily. Even the teacher glanced at his new breeches. Willie paused in his sum and looked at them with satisfaction himself. When he walked back to his bench and the corduroy spoke again, whooshed, 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 it was as musical as the clumping of a new pair of red-topped boots. As he slid into his place on the bench, Redhead turned his face and made a mouth. "'Don't you think you're smart, whistle breeches? he whispered. "'Whooshed, whooshed said the breeches in reply, as Willie moved, and every eye in the school seemed to gaze on him, not enviously as before, but sneering. Who'd want whistle breeches? When the recess bell rang, Willie walked to the playground with short steps, but still the corduroy whistled. Two boys behind him laughed, and Willie burned with shame. They must be laughing at his new breeches. Bessie Clayton passed him, and he stood motionless, crowded against the wall, until she was out of hearing. He paused in the doorway timidly. Redhead was standing just outside, one shoulder turned toward Freckles Raymond. It was the signal for a fight, and the small boys were crowded about them. "'Ah, oh, you're one yourself,' Redhead was saying. "'And you dasn't say it again. I dare you to say it,' he cried. But he caught sight of Willie. "'Huh!' he shouted. Look here, fellers. Here's Whistlebritches. Let's spit on him. The boys crowded into the entry and spat on them. 
Redhead pulled Willie's hair twice, drawing his head forward as he would pull a bell rope. Don't he think he's smart? Wouldn't have him. Whistle breeches! Whistle breeches! They shouted in derision, and Willie whimpered and edged into a corner. Don't you do that, he said in a choking voice. Uh, I'll tell teacher I will. Redhead stuck his freckled face close and shoved him with a warlike shoulder. His fists were doubled, and he jabbed Willie with his elbow. Ah, you tell them then, why don't you, whistle breeches? he inquired. Just you tell him, and I'll punch your face off. He drew his arm back and fainted. Willie crooked his elbow to hide his face. Ah, come on, fellers, said Redhead with deep disgust. What's the use of fooling with him? He ain't nothing but a crybaby in whistle breeches. He ain't no fun. That noon, Willie remained in the schoolroom until the boys had gone. Some went home for dinner, and the rest ate their lunches under the oak tree at the side of the school. When the room was clear, Willie stole out by the back way and ran rapidly up the alley. He knew he was branded for life. The shame of the name of Whistlebritches bore him down. He meditated wild plans for getting rid of the offending garment. He would burn it, lose it in the river. He even considered running away from home. After dinner, he slipped quietly away from the table, crept up to his room under the slanting roof, and put on his old patched breeches. He came down quietly, but his mother caught him tiptoeing through the hall. "'Why, Willie,' she said, "'where are your new trousers, dear?' "'Upstairs,' he said simply. "'I don't want to wear them. They're, they're too tight.' His mother saw the prevarication in the droop of his head. "'Nonsense!' she answered lightly. "'They fit you perfectly, dear. "'If they are a little stiff now, they will soon wear soft. "'Go up and put them on.' "'I don't want to,' he replied stubbornly. "'He meant, I will not. "'But he had learned the disadvantage of contradicting his mother flatly. "'William,' his mother said sternly, "'go upstairs and put on those trousers this instant.' He climbed the stairs slowly. He hoped he would be late to school. He would be so leisurely in donning them that his mother would make him stay at home to avoid the greater disgrace of being tardy. He thought of playing sick, but decided such an illness would be too sudden to excite his mother's sympathy. If only the schoolhouse would burn down, or word come that the teacher was dead. But neither came to pass, and his mother's voice sounded from the hall, bidding him hurry. With his load of shame, he slunk out of the gate and crept to school, hugging the fences and making himself as insignificant and as small as possible, walking with short steps to avoid the endless wished wished of the corduroy. He sniffed as he thought of what the day still held for him. Some men, going back to business, glanced at him to see the cause of his whimpering. He imagined they were thinking cruel things of his breeches. He heard the tardy bell ring, and then ran in and hurried to his seat. As he hastened down the aisle, the corduroy spoke louder than before, but if Redhead heard, he made no sign, and as Willie sidled on to the bench beside him, he kept his nose buried in his book. Willie did not go to the playground at the afternoon recess. He would have died, rather, and for once he saw the advantage of the rule that the tardy scholar must lose that half hour of play. When school ended for the day, Willie hoped the teacher would keep him in. He was willing to be whipped rather than meet Redhead again, but he was dismissed with the rest. He paused in the doorway, gathering his breath to make a run for liberty, as he had often run to escape his persecutors. As he waited, he saw Redhead approaching, and he drew back, but Redhead stepped up to him and took him by the arm. "'You let me alone now,' whimpered Willie. "'Ah, shut up,' said Redhead roughly. I ain't going to hurt you. You shut up and don't be a crybaby. Come along, and I won't let them hurt you. Fighting and scuffling were not allowed in the entry. Willie put his thumb in his mouth and gazed at Redhead doubtfully. Such friendliness was unnatural. It savored a plot to entice him forth to be slaughtered. It was not easy to believe that the Redhead who had drubbed him a hundred times, and who scorned him as a crybaby, should seek to defend him. Redhead waited. Come on, he said at length. 
I'll let you help me drive the cow home tonight. Still, Willie hesitated, although he was almost willing to risk a licking to be allowed to slap the sleek legs of Mrs. Murphy's cow with a limber willow switch. Come on, said Redhead. I'll let you smoke my pipe. You won't lick me? asked Willie doubtfully. Nah, I won't lick you. What would I want to lick you for? Willie followed Redhead hesitantly, with an eye to a safe retreat, if necessary. One of the boys came forward from the group by the gate. Hi, here comes Whistlebreeches, he shouted gleefully. Whistlebreeches, Whistlebreeches, Whistlebreeches. Redhead turned and clenched his fists, his blue eyes blazing. Shut up, Bob Palmer, he cried fiercely. Don't you call him that. That ain't no name to call a feller. You just wished you'd had breeches like him. Bob stopped suddenly. He looked at Redhead in astonishment. Then he turned and ran to the boys by the gate. They listened to what he said, and then began a loud sing-song chant. Whistle breeches, whistle breeches, whistle breeches. Redhead bounded forward, his eyes glowing with anger. He toppled two boys over and rained his blows right and left. Don't you call him that, he cried. It was a surprise. The boys drew back and stood ready to scatter at the next onslaught. Redhead waited, puffing with clenched fists. The next feller that calls him that, I'll break his face, he threatened. And I ain't foolin' neither. They saw that he was not, and they waited respectfully as Redhead and Willie walked away. Willie went with Redhead to drive the cow home, and Redhead taught him how to double up his fist for battle according to the traditions of the school, with the knuckle of the second finger protruded. "'You just do that,' he explained, "'and you can hurt em worse, and if they fightin' back, kick em in the legs. That's how I do. Why, you're as big as I am, and I bet you're just as strong. You just stand up to em. There ain't nothin' in fightin' when you know how.' If you just stand up to them, they almost always back down. You begin on Tommy Ament. He's a bigger baby than you are. Anybody can lick him, and I lick him with my little finger. And then you tackle Shorty. He's a baby, too. You're just afraid. It was Redhead who egged Willie on to strike Tom Ament the next day, and Redhead coached him until Tom took to his heels, defeated. Then Redhead made him lick Shorty and with the lust of victory in his veins, Willie worked his way upward, and soon the other mothers began telling Willie's mother that he was a bad boy, always fighting, and Mrs. Gary wept over him. But no one called him Whistlebritches, and he learned that he was as much of a man as any of them, and more of a man than most. Then came a battle royal, when Redhead and Willie stood face to face and pounded each other for a good half hour for supremacy, and Willie went down with a bleeding nose and an eye that was dark for days. But Redhead had taught him self-confidence, and self-confidence made him the governor of a great state. When the governor's eyes came back to Mike Murphy's face, they rested a moment on the grizzled red hair, and a smile softened the lines of his mouth. Mike, he said, I believe you used to give me a drubbing about once every day. The old Irishman moved uneasily. His hands played nervously with the rim of his hat. He drew his feet under his chair and moved his lips without speaking. He thought of that last fierce battle when the governor had fallen with a bleeding nose and he shifted his eyes from spot to spot on the soft carpet. He felt as a mouse does when the cat plays with it. The governor turned to Father Maurice. Father, he said, I do not often allow myself a personal indulgence, but I have an unsettled score with Mike. I shall settle it now. I am going to pardon that young man. Two tears fell from the priest's eyes and rolled slowly into the white forest of his beard. Mike Murphy stared straight before him, while his fingers felt vaguely for the rim of the hat that had fallen from his hands. Go home, Mike, said the governor gently. "'Go home and tell the wife and the mother.' When his petitioners had departed, the governor sat long in the reception room, thinking of the old days. When he opened his watch, it was not to note the hour, but to look on a woman's likeness, and he crossed his arms on the desk and buried his face in them. 
the old days had given him much that the later years had stolen from him. He sighed and lifted his head. Poor old Mike, he said. I'm squared with him at last. I wonder why he took my part that day. And he wearily climbed the stair to his lonely room. He did not know that when Redhead went home that noon, nearly fifty years before, he had found Mrs. Murphy cutting out a pair of corduroy breeches. End of section two. Redhead and whistle breeches. Section three of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Confessions of a Daddy, Part One. Our neighbor's babies. I guess we folks that live up at our end of the town think we're about as good as anybody in Colorado, and maybe a little better. We get along together as pleasant as you please. We are sort of a colony, as you might say, all by ourselves. Me and Marthy make especial good neighbors. We don't have no fights with the other folks in our end of town, and in them days the neighbors hadn't any reason to fight with us, for we didn't keep a dog and we hadn't no children. I take notice that it is other folks' dogs and children that make most of the bad feelings between neighbors. Of course, we had mosquitoes. But Providence gives everybody something to practice up their patience. And when me and Marthy sat out on our porch and heard other people's children frettin' cause the mosquitoes was bad, we just sat there behind our screen porch and thanked our stars that we didn't have no children to leave our screen doors open. It wasn't but right that me and Marthy should act accordingly. I don't mean that we were uppish about it, but we did feel that we could live a little better than our neighbors that had all the expense of children. And if our house was fixed up a little better, and we was able to go off three or four weeks in the summer to the mountains, when all the rest stayed right at home, we had a right to feel pleased about it. Lots of times we had things our neighbors couldn't afford, and then the little woman would say to me, Hiram, you don't know how thankful I am that we ain't got any children. And I agreed with her every time, and I did it hearty, too. T'wasn't that we hated children, far from it. We just thought that when we saw all the extra worry and trouble and expense that other people's children brought about, we were right satisfied to live the way we had lived for the five years since we was married. Our neighbors still called us the bride and groom, nor I can't say that we were happier than the other folks in our end of town, but we was more carefree. We lived more joyous, as you might say. One night, when I come home from the store, Marthy met me at the corner, and when I had tucked her arm under mine, I asked her what was the news. Bobby Jones had cut his finger bad. Stell Marks had took the measles. Little Tot Hemingway had run off, and her ma had gone near crazy until the kid was found again. The Wallaces wasn't going to take no vacation this year at all because Fred was to go off to school in the fall, and they couldn't afford both. T'was the usual lot of news of children being trouble and expense. I was feeling fine the next day, being a holiday, and Marthy, with the slick way women has, sprung a favor on me just when she set the broiled steak on the table, extra thick and burnt brown. That's my favorite steak. And whenever I see it that way, my mouth waters, and I look out for a favor to be asked. Hiram, she says, quite as if she was opening up a usual bit of talk. Did you take notice of Mrs. Hemingway's silk dress last Sunday? Why, no, Marthy, I says. I didn't. Was it new? New, she laughed. The ID. That's just what it wasn't. I believe she has had that same silk ever since we have lived in this end of town and no one knows how much longer. It's a shame. She puts every cent she can dig up on those children of hers and has hardly a decent thing of her own. I feel right sorry for her. I feel sorry for Hemingway, says I. The old boy is working himself to death. He never gets home until supper's all over, and he told me just now that he felt it his bounden duty to work tomorrow. I tell you, Marthy, children is an expensive luxury, that's just what they are, she agreed. If it wasn't for their children, the Hemingways could live every bit as good as we do, and he wouldn't have to work nights, poor fellow. But Hiram, she says, as if the idea had just hit her, 
do you recall to mind when this end of town has seen a new silk dress why no no i said when was it years ago says the little woman i was figuring it up today and it was a full two years ago ain't it awful downright scandalous i says and just on account of those children too Marthy looked down at her plate, innocent as you please. I'm glad we ain't got any children, Hiram, she says, full of mischief. That tickled me. I was tickled to see how she was tickled to think she had trapped me. I guess it's our bounden duty to hold up the honor of our end of town by showing it a new silk dress, I says, and the next thing I knew I was fighting to keep her from choking me to death. All that evening, Marthy was unusual quiet and right happy, too. As she sat on the porch, her eyes would wander off over the hills and far away, and I knew she was lost in joyous tanglements of bias and gores and plates, where a man can't follow her if he wants to. But when we went inside and had the blinds pulled down, she put her arms around my neck again and gave me another choke. "'Dear, dear old Hiram,' she says, and her eyes was tear-wet. Just think, a new silk dress. And just then there came into the room the noise of the Marx child, the one with the measles, whimpering. Ain't you glad, says the little woman, that we haven't any children to spoil all our fun and bother us? And when I looked down into that happy little face of hers, I was glad, and no mistake. The next day was a beauty. It came in like a glory and we was up almost as soon as the sun was, for we had figured on one of our regular old-time jolly days by ourselves on the hills, one of the kind that make our end of town call us the bride and groom. It was our plan to take a good lunch and just wander. Marthy was to take a book, and I was to take my fish and tackle, and beyond that was whatever happy thing that turned up. If we had children, she said, we couldn't go off on these long tramps by ourselves. We got away while the neighbors in our end of town were still at breakfast, and as we passed the Wallace's place, we ran up to holler goodbye through the window at them, and there was the youngest Wallace fooling on the floor with her stockings not on yet, and breakfast half over. Marthy stopped long enough to have a good long look at the child. If all the children was like Daisy Wallace, she says, they wouldn't be so bad. She is the dearest thing I ever did see. She's got the cutest way of kissing a person on the eyelids. She looks to be just as lazy in the dress and act as the rest, I remarked. And I was surprised the way Marthy turned on me. Why, Hiram Smith, she cried, didn't you ever dawdle over your dressing? When I was a girl, I got lots of fun out of being late to breakfast. What difference does it make anyway when she is perfectly lovely all the rest of the time? I simply love that child. I wonder, she said, sort of wistful, if they would let us take her with us today. She would enjoy it so. Foolishness, I said. We don't want to pull a kid along with us all day, and anyhow, they are going to take her to the photographers today to have their picture took. We went out around town and up the hill road. The morning air was great, and nobody on the road at all, so far as we could see and we stepped out briskly and lively. "'Seems good to get away from the baby district, don't it?' I says as we was walking up the road. "'We're like Mr. and Mrs. Robinson Crusoe.' And at the very next turn we almost fell over Bobby Jones and his everlasting chum Rex, which is the most no-account dog on earth. "'Where are you going?' he asks. "'Nowhere's particular,' says Marthy. "'Just walking out to get the air.' "'So am I.' he says, and then he says, sort of bluffin', I ain't lost. Yes, you are, Bobby, I says, severe as I could, and if you know what's good for a kid about your size, you'd better turn right around and scoot for home. He looked at me as if he would like to know who I was to be bossin' him. Oh, he says, you ain't my pa. I don't have to do what you say. I won't go home for you. Marthy was bending over him in a second. Bobby, she says, coaxing-like. Do you know what your folks is going to have for dinner? No'm, he says, as polite as you please. I do, says the little woman. Ice cream, 
and if you get lost, you won't get home in time to get any. Bobby looked up the road where he hadn't explored yet, and then looked back the way he'd come, and then he smiled at Marthy and took off his cap to her. Thank you, Mrs. Smith, he says. Marthy laughed as happy as a girl and kissed him right on his dusty face. She put her arms around him even and acted like she had never seen a freckled boy before. Nice boy, I remarked, when Bobby had gone down the road toward town. Nice, says the little woman. Nice? Is that all you can scrape up to say? Why, there ain't a dear child in our end of town than what Bobby is. He's my sweetheart when you ain't home, Hiram, she says, looking back at him as he padded along, kicking up the dusk with his bare toes. I wonder if we dare take him with us. What about his ice cream, I says. And what about a kid dragging after us all day? So we went on. But I seen she felt a little mite lonely-like, as you might say, which was queer. By ten o'clock we had got far enough from town, and we pushed through a field that was all covered with flowers, and over to where the brook was, with the tangle of trees and brush hiding it, and when I pushed apart the brush to go through, I stopped and motioned for Marthy to come quiet and look. There, sitting on a tree trunk as quiet as you please, was Teddy Lawrence, with his eyes glued to his bobber, and thinking of nothing in the world but fish. I'm a right hearty fisher myself, and it done my heart good to see the strictly business way the kid had. Marthy moved a little, and I put my hand on her to make her keep still. The boy lifted up his pole and looked at the bait like a regular old hand. He dug a fresh, fat worm out of his can and fixed it, and then I fairly held my breath. Would he do it? No, but hold on. Yes. He leaned over and spit on the bait to bring luck, just as natural as life. Say, wasn't that a real boy for you? I let the brush come together real quiet, and me and Marthy slipped away. Well, sir, my five-dollar pole and my two-dollar reel made me feel sick. What did I know about fishing anyhow? I felt right there what was the truth, that all my fishing amounted to was that I was trying to bring back the joys I used to have when I was a kid, setting on a log, happy and lonesome, watching my bottle cork joggle on the ripples. What was the use? A feller can't go back to them days. There ain't nothing to do about it. Unless, of course, he can sort of go forward to them in, well, a feller could sort of live them days over again in a boy of his own. Wallace don't deserve that boy, I says, sort of mad about I don't know what. What sort of a dad is that old bookworm of Wallace for a boy that likes to fish like Ted does? I'll bet Wallace never had a fish pole in his hand since the day he was born. Now if I had a boy like that, I would show him a thing or two about fishing. If I had a boy like that, look there, says Marthy sudden. Did you ever see anything sweeter than what that is? Over on the other end of the field, Ted's sister was straying around in the flowers, her face all rosy with the fresh air. She was like a butterfly in amongst the butterflies, a mighty pretty girl, and just the age when a mother loves a girl best, and when a mother takes the most care of them. I like pretty things as well as the next man does, and I'll say right here that there was something about that girl that made me feel like I'd like to own her, just like I feel about a real pretty rose, sort of covet to keep it just as it is forever, and take care that it don't get spoiled anyway. I guess Mrs. Wallace don't rightly appreciate me, says Marthy, thoughtful-like. I thinks she makes her study too much. When I was May's age, I had plenty of chances to get fresh air, and you'd never seen me taking up music lessons in the summer. I spent my time feeding the chickens and running about the farm and enjoying life. It ain't right, the way girls is forced in their studies nowadays. If I had a girl like that, if you had, what'd you do? I asks, kindly enough, but the little woman only laughed. Maybe your laugh was a bit reckless, as you might say. What's the use thinking what I do? She says, turning round to go. There didn't seem to be nothing special for me to say right then, so I just put my arm around her and we went on. We was plumb tired out when we got home, and maybe that's why we was more than usual quiet at dinner. I sure wasn't cross, but somehow our day hadn't panned out as satisfactory as we thought it would, 
and maybe the crying of the Wilkins new baby got on my nerves, we being tired. I was glad when dinner was over and we could take our chairs and go out on the porch. It was a fine night, still and calm as you please. The only noise, not counting the crying of the Wilkins kid, was the sounds of the laughing and chatter of the children in our end of town. But I was lonesome. I can't speak for the little woman, how she felt. But I felt lonesome, and her right there beside me, too. Across the street we could see the two Hemingway children, who had coaxed an extra half hour to wait for their father to come home before they went to bed. They had their heads bent over a tumbler that they had caught two fireflies in, and on the porch Mrs. Hemingway was rocking the sleepy baby. Then we heard Hemingway's whistle. He can't whistle, but he likes to. And the two children dropped the tumbler and ran to the gate. And then there was a rush, and a mingling up of Hemingway kids and father, and the sleepy baby slid down from its ma's lap and stood, unsteady but trying to get in the kissing, with its arms held out, happy. I turned to the little woman and looked straight at her. Somehow I knew that now, if ever, was a time for me to do some cheering up. Well, little woman, I says, cheerful-like, we don't need a lot of kids to bolster up our love, do we? She gave my hand a soft squeeze in reply. And about that gown, that silk gown, I says gaily, have you decided what color it is to be yet? Won't you be fine? When I think how fine you look, I'm glad we haven't no children to. Just then the Hemingways went inside, and our whole end of town was quiet and lonesome. Marthy didn't answer, and when I lifted up her face to kiss her, what do you think? She was crying. End of section three. Confessions of a Daddy, part one. Section four of Ellis Parker Butler's short stories, volume one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Confessions of a Daddy, part two. When she came. Afore the kid came, me and Marthy used to sit up nights telling each other how much we liked it if she turned out to be a boy. I said everything I knowed that was nice about boys, and drawed on my imagination for what I didn't know, and Marthy spoke the same. So I convinced Marthy, though, that I would be terrible disappointed if it wasn't a boy, and she didn't leave me no doubts about her hankering for a baby of the male sect. Of course, we was both trying to square ourselves in case it should be a boy. Come to find out, we was both tickled to death that it was a girl. We talked over boys' names by the bushel without ever coming to a dead-set choice, but we most always squeezed in somewhere, sort of apologetic, a remark that if it should happen to be a girl, we'd have to call it Edith L. after its grandmother. Somehow, as I look back on it, it seems as if I never thought of that kid at any time except as Edith L. Curious how folks will try to fool themselves that way. When it came to the auspicious occasion, we had Doc Wolford in, because he was the only Doc in our end of town. He certainly was a quaint old bonesetter. Some said he took morphine on the sly, and some said it was just his natural manner, but he was the shiftiest-eyed medic you ever saw. No man living ever got him to say plain yes or no. He'd walk around them little words like he was afraid of stepping on them, and his gab was full of perhapses and possiblies, and similar slick side-trackers of knowledge. I had figured that when the aforesaid auspicious occasion turned up, I'd clean out to the woods until things got so I'd be useful as well as ornamental. But when it came to a showdown, I couldn't. Farthest away I could get was the front porch. I'd done my good twenty miles on the porch that day, I'll bet, and whenever I've had a trial and tribulation time since then, I can hear the sixth board from the south end of that porch squeak. I was walking on the level, but my spirits was climbing the walls and coasting into valleys. First minute I'd be sticking out my chest and thinking how all fired grand it would be to be a daddy, and the next minute I'd cave in like a frost-bitten squash and wonder how in creation I'd ever drag along as a widow man. One minute I'd see myself sky-hooting around with a fine kid on my arm, and the next I'd see myself alone with Marthy gone. I've got the reputation around here of being a humorous man, 
but I didn't say no funny things to myself that day that I can remember. I had fever and cold sweats and double contraction of the heart, and whenever I thought of Marthy, I couldn't think of a decent thing that I'd ever done to her. I felt I was an ornery, low-down critter, which I ain't, and I saw Marthy as a spotless angel, which she ain't either. She's a woman and earthly all through, and mighty good earth at that. Marthy never knew what a good chance she lost of being considered a perfectionated saint, but she missed the chance. Just about when I'd given up all hopes of ever seeing Marthy alive again, Mrs. Murphy, who we'd got in to sort of give the kid his first toilet, it not being expected to be far enough advanced to do much primping on its own account right at first, come to the door like a blessed ray of sunshine and percolated out a smile at me. Loony as I was, I had sense enough left to know that she wasn't smiling at me for flirtation, nor because she had a smile that she didn't know what to do with, and so was passing it out to me, like a handout, just to get rid of it. I connected that smile with other things, I knowed she was smiling back at me from a desolate widowhood or widow manhood or whatever the right word is. I know the right word, but it got mislaid. Thank the stars I ain't ever had no use for it, and I hope never to have. But I guess every man feels like I did when I was walking that porch. When they shut the door on him and turn him out and tell him they will call him when they want him, he is a widow man right from that moment and feels so. And when they call him in and says all's doing well as could be expected under the circumstances, right then he feels like his wife had rose from the dead, and he becomes a married man again. I felt so anyhow, and I don't know as I'm a specially fancy feeler. I don't look it. Right then I was boosted, like I tell you, from a deep black hole to a high and airy location, and by a plain-faced, baggy Irish lady that did washing by the day at fifty cents a day, and you furnished the soap. She's been my friend ever since, and always will be. As I passed in, feeling more like war hooping than like walking soft, she whispered three words at me that finished me up. It's a girl, says she. Walk light, and stay where you are, and when you can, come in and see the girl. I'll bring her out and show her to you. I was clean idiotic with satisfaction. I sat down on the edge of a chair and twirled my hat until I couldn't sit still, and then got up and edged round the room, looking at the pictures on the wall, for all the world like I was a visitor. I'd got halfway through looking at the things on the whatnot, and was casting my eye round for the photograph album, when Mrs. Murphy stuck her blessed face into the parlor. Shh, says she. Make no noise and control your feelings, and you can come in for a quarter of a second and see your daughter. I was so proud I had cold chills, and I walked like a close horse on casters. I looked for Marthy first, and I see she was asleep and beautiful, and then Mrs. Murphy pulled down the covers and showed me Edith L. I took her all in at a glance, and I formed my own opinion right there. I was like a rubber balloon when you stick a pin in it but I didn't collapse with a bang. I just caved in gradual. I went out of the room and out of the house and sat down on the porch step and blubbered. They never missed me. When I think back on that day, it makes me laugh, but I was sure a rank amateur in the baby business, and I didn't know no better then. Right now, I'd put up every cent I've got that you couldn't find a finer girl in the state than what Edith L. is. And I've learned since that she was what you might call an A-1 baby right from the start. But it didn't look that way to me. She was the first of that age I'd ever been introduced to, and she looked different than what I'd figured on. I'd seen plenty of brand new colts, and they run largely to legs. But you'd know them for horse critters right off. And I've seen brand new puppies, and their eyes ain't open. But you'd know them immediate for dogs. But that kid didn't look any more like what I'd calculated Edith L. would look like than a cucumber looks like a watermelon. My heart was plumb broke. I was scared when I thought what would happen to Marthy when she saw that wrinkled red little thing. I knew we'd have to keep it, but I didn't see how we could bear the shame. 
I made up my mind in a minute that we'd sell off the place and move up into the mountains, just me and Marthy and the girl. I didn't think of her as Edith L. anymore. It wouldn't do to insult my mother by giving her name to that baby. I figured it all out how I'd act better to Marthy than ever to make up for the trial that girl would be, and how I'd do all in man's power to keep the girl from knowing how handicapped she was by her looks. Just then, Brink to me passed by, and he says, "'How's things coming along?' The boys had all been mighty interested in this baby business, and I knew he'd trot off and tell them, so I says, sad enough, "'It's a girl.' Brink seen I wasn't very jubilant, so he says, "'You don't seem very stuck up about it, "'but girls ain't so bad when you get used to them. "'Lady all right?' "'Yes,' I says. "'She's okay.' Brink hung around a minute or two, waiting for further orders, and none coming, he says hesitant. "'So long.' I let him go and was glad he went. I looked out across the river and calculated how I could fix it so Mrs. Murphy wouldn't say nothing outside about that poor kid of mine and how to keep the kid hid until me and Marthy could take her and skin out for the mountains. Mrs. Murphy was a terrible chatty lady, sort of perpetual phonograph and wholesale and retail news agency. I guess the best I could do was to lock her in the cellar and then herd all comers away from the house. Doc Wolford didn't bother me any. I knowed he wouldn't give me away. If anybody could so much as get him to admit that there was a baby born at my house, they would be lucky. Just as a sample of what Doc was like, take the case of Sandy Sam, who fell down the mine shaft and was brought up in the bucket, as dead as Adam. Doc was on the ground as soon as they brought Sandy up, and one of the boys that come late asked Doc what caused the crowd to congregate. Well says Doc, looking off at an angle into the air. It looks like Sandy Sam or some other feller fell down the mine shaft. Poor old Sam, says the feller. Killed him, didn't it? Doc looked at the sky and considered. It's a remarkable deep shaft, he says at last. Remarkable deep. Thunder, says the feller. I know it's a deep shaft. What I ask you is if Sam is dead. Is he? Doc went off into a dream, and then he come to. He looks at the feller. Oh, he says absent-like. Is Sam dead? Perhaps, perhaps he is. I shouldn't like to say, but... He ended up sort of pulling himself together at the finish. I wouldn't like to express an opinion, but I guess the boys think he is. They're going to bury him. I wasn't so afraid of Doc Wolfert blabbing. I knowed the worst, and like everybody else, I wanted somebody to tell me it wasn't so bad as I thought. I nailed Doc as he come out. I backed him up against a porch pillar and conversed with him right there. I wanted to know just how bad it was. I wanted to know what hope there was, if any. Doc, I said, and I was blessed glad I had a beard so he couldn't see the quivers in my chin. She's terrible undersized, ain't she? Hmm, says Doc. You might be calling her small, or you mightn't. I've seen him bigger, and I've seen him smaller. I've seen em all sizes. I couldn't see much help in that. Doc, I said, trembling. She won't always be so dwarf-like, will she? She'll grow some. Probably, says Doc. I'd hate to say she wouldn't. I groaned. I had to. Ain't her head a little off shape, Doc? I stammered out. I guess the shape of the head had worried me most of all. It wasn't just what I'd known good heads to be. "'You think so?' asked Doc, absent-like. "'Don't you?' I went back at him. "'Tell me straight. I can stand the worst.' "'Hmm,' he says. "'It's differ. I've got to go.' "'No, you don't,' I says, backing him up against the post. "'Not till you tell me. "'Her legs now. Think they'll ever straighten out? "'Think she'll ever get over that red, scalded look? "'Think she'll ever be able to talk, Doc?' Doc looked anxious toward the road. Don't worry, he says. Don't fret. Keep cool and calm. Yes, I says, scornful-like. Me, keep cool. Don't you know that I'm that poor little bent-up kid's daddy? Don't you know I look forward to calling her Edith L? Don't you know? Doc, I says, strong and forcible. Money ain't no object in a case like this. 
Tell me this. Shall I get a specialist? Would it do any good to send to Denver and get a specialist, or Chicago, or New York? Doc looked interested at the horizon. Why, no, he says. No, I don't see that it would. I'll bet that was the first time Doc ever said no straight out. It settled me. I let go of his arm and sat right down. If Doc Wolfert spoke up and said no, I knew there wasn't nothing to be done. I sat there probably about a thousand years, if you could count by feelings. I had a wish to go in and see the kid, and then again I hated to. I hated for Mrs. Murphy to look at me. I felt I'd blubber, and I was ashamed. But I knew I ought to be there to take Marthy's hand when she woke up, and to lie to her about it not being so bad as she would think. That made me pull myself together. I made up my mind that I'd be a man anyway. I had Marthy to think of, and a man ain't made to be blubbering around when his women need help. I swallowed down the chunk of my neck that had got stuck in my throat and wiped my eyes, and stood on my legs. When I turned, Mrs. Murphy was in the door. Well, she says, you don't take much interest, I must say. Here you sit enjoying the landscape, and your daughter's asking where her father has gone to, and is she an orphan or what? Come in, she says, or she'll be coming out. I walked in. I stopped a bit by the bedroom door to get up my courage, and then I walked into the room. Marthy had her eyes open, and they looked up at me with a smile in them, and then looked down again at the bunch on her arm under the quilt. "'Come and see her,' she says, feeble but proud. "'Come and see your daughter, Edith L.' She slid down the cover so I could see her, and I looked at that kid with a sick grin. "'Ain't she lovely?' she says. "'Sure.' I says, lying bravely. Don't talk, says Mrs. Murphy, speaking to Marthy, or the session is ended. Just one word, I says. Marthy, are you satisfied with her, with the kid? She's perfect, she says, perfect and lovely. All right, I says. Then I don't mind. Marthy smiled, sort of weak. You will joke, she says. Joke, says Mrs. Murphy, indignant. Insult, I call it. Did you ever see a finer baby? I looked to see if she winked. She didn't. How so? I asked, my voice all of a tremble. How so? She speaks. Not how so at all. She weighs ten pounds, and she's sound in wind and limb, she says. And look at the grand shape of her head. She'll be a college professoress at least, or maybe in Congress before her pa. It's a grand baby she is. Ten pounds, I says. Ain't that somewhat dwarfish? Hear the man, she says. I don't believe he knows a fine baby when he sees one. Do you mean that, Mrs. Murphy? I asked, every bit of blood in me going on the jump. Mean it, she says. I've had six of my own, and not one of them could hold a candle to this one. Marthy, I says, is it so? Mrs. Murphy has fine children, she says. But my little girl, I think, is finer. How's her head, I asked. Perfect, she says. And her color? So healthy, she says. And her legs? So straight and strong, she says. I took hold of her hand and squeezed it good, and then I went to the window and looked out, and I saw all the boys lined up along the fence, waiting for me to come out and let them know what I'd told Brink to me was so. Proud? I was so proud I felt like giving Mrs. Murphy a million dollars. Dang it, I yelped. Let her dad have another good look at Edith L. Day of the Spank Now you just take a good look, this here right fist of mine. Looks like a ham, don't it? And see all them calluses on the palm. Ain't that a tool fit to break rock with? And what'd you say if I told you I used that once to hit that little tender kid of mine? Actually hit her. What do you say to that? I won't forget that night soon, I tell you. Just figure to yourself that it's sundown, and the blinds pulled down in the room where Dee Dee's cot was standing, like a little iron-barred cage. We got into the way of calling the kid Dee Dee, that being what she called herself. There was all the signs that Dee Dee was going to sleep, and the plainest sign was Dee Dee herself, standing up in her crib, wide awake, 
holding on to the foot of the crib, tramping the sheets into a tangle of white underbrush, as you might say, and no more asleep than you are. The way Dee Dee went to sleep was like the death of an alligator. It was a long and strenuous affair. Marthy stood looking at Dee Dee with reproaches in her eyes. We had a sort of tradition in the family that Dee Dee had to go to sleep quick and quiet, without any nonsense. Every night when Marthy put the little white rascal in the crib, she had hopes that the tradition would come true, and every night it didn't. The go-to-sleep hour was the time Dee Dee seemed to pick out to have an hour of especially lively fun, and for weeks she'd been breaking the laws and walking all over the rules with her pink feet. She did not see, coming up over the horizon and getting nearer every day, the stern and horrid spank. We had got together in a sort of family conclave and decided that Dee Dee was about old enough to be punished by laying on of hands. We decided it one time when Dee Dee was out of the room, and we had been right stern about it. We could be stern about Dee Dee when she wasn't in sight. When she comes smiling and singing along, we generally had to quit being stern and kiss her. Dee Dee was about twenty-two months old, and she was ninety-eight percent pure sweetness. Some of the women in our end of town said her short, curly hair was toe-colored, but it wasn't so. They was just envious of us. And one and all said her eyes was like round little bits of blue sky. It was clear enough that she had inherited her sweetness from Marthy, and some said it was equal clear that the two percent of undulterated stubbornness come from me. I said so myself, but I didn't believe it. Dee Dee was getting to be a regular person. She could tell what she wanted, and once in a while we could understand what it was. It was full time, everybody said, that her education had ought to begin. If she was going to grow up into a fine, sincere woman like Marthy, she must have the right kind of start. Just the night before the day of the spank, Marthy had begun to teach her religious education. Standing up at Marthy's knee, for Dee Dee would not kneel to God or man, she had repeated, Now he lie me, down he see, potty o see tea. Anybody had thought to know what it was. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It was a fine success for a first start. Only she didn't do what she said she was going to do and lay me down to sleep. Instead of that, she stood up in her crib for about an hour, calling for Mammy, the meaning of which was that she wanted to be rocked and have Marthy sing Mary had a little lamb to her. The day of the spank had a bad opening. When Dee Dee woke up along about five o'clock a.m., it was raining pitchforks, and that meant a day indoors, and to start off, she stood up in her crib and called for Liam. Marthy woke up, sort of realizing that Dee Dee was repeating that word slow, but regular, and she sat up and thought. Liam was a new word, and the meaning of it was unknown, but whatever it was, Dee Dee wanted it. She wanted it bad. Nothing but Liam would satisfy her. Marthy studied that word good and hard. It did not seem to suggest anything to eat or drink, and as near as Marthy could make out, it didn't rightly apply to any toy, game, song, person, or anything else. Marthy woke me up, and I sat up with a sigh. Dee Dee looked at me as if she thought she would get what she wanted now, sure. Lam, Dee Dee? I asked, and she smiled as sweet as you please. Papa, lime, she said again. Lime, I says, thoughtful, looking around the room and up at the ceiling. I screwed my forehead and studied and twisted my neck to look into the next room. Lime? What is a lime, anyhow? I give it up, I says, after I'd thought of everything in the world pretty near. Maybe your grandpa would know. Maybe it's something he taught her. We lifted Dee Dee out of her crib and set her down on the floor, and she pattered down the hall. We could hear her telling him to give her lime, and the puzzled way he answered her back. Lime, Bertie? What is it? Say it again, Dee Dee. Lime? Granddaddy don't know what you want, Dee Dee. Neither did Uncle Ed, who was staying with us about then. Nobody knew what lime was but Dee Dee, and she wanted it the worst way. She come back and stood by Marthy's bed and just begged for it. 
It was a hard day for Marthy. It was Monday and wash day, so Dee Dee couldn't bother Katie in the kitchen, and it was raining too. Dee Dee just wandered through the house, like she'd lost her last friend, and then she would come back to Marthy and ask for a lime. She wouldn't have anything to do with her toys, and she wouldn't sew with a pen. She wouldn't sit at the table and write. She wouldn't look at the photographed book. And the worst of it was that she wouldn't keep still a minute. By noontime, Marthy had a headache. By sundown, she had nerves. And about then, she began to look at Dee Dee with sort of a reproachful look. Dee Dee had said that unknown word about 10,000 times. Marthy put Dee Dee to bed in her crib, and I read once how Wellington at Waterloo, in the big fight they had there, prayed for Knight or Blucher, and that was about how Marthy longed for the Sandman or me to come. I was the one that come at last. I come in the house wet to the skin and plumb disgusted, my pants sticking to my legs and all over mud, and I chucked my soaken hat and turned my umbrella into a corner, the way a tired-out man will and just dropped into a chair tuckered out. I let out one good long sigh of thanks that I was at the end of a hard day. Hiram, comes Marthy's voice. Come in here and see if you can't do anything with Edith. I have worked with her all day, and I am played out. I'm utter tired. Oh, plague, I says. I sat a minute drumming on the arm of my chair, and then I got up on my feet and walked into the bedroom. What's the matter? I says, as near cross as I calculate I ever get, and Marthy's eyes filled up. I can't do anything with her, she says. She won't go to sleep. She has been dreadful all day. I don't feel like I could stand it another minute. Marthy threw herself on the bed and covered up her face with her hands. She was crying. I guess I frowned. Dee looked up at me as sweet as a little angel. Papa, lame she says. No, says I. No lime, Dee Dee. You lie down and go to sleep like a good girl. Papa'll fix your pillow nice. I pounded up her pillow and turned it over and pulled the sheets out straight. Then I took the baby and laid her down gentle. She smiled and cuddled into the pillow. Oh, what a nice bed, I says. Ain't it a nice bed, Dee Dee? Nice bed, she allowed. Will I cover your feet, I says. Feet cov, she says eager, so I spread the sheet over her feet. Shut little eyes, I says in warning, but as gentle as you please, and she shut her eyes so tight her eyelids wrinkled. Now good night, Dee Dee, I says. Night, pa, pa, she coos. I stole out of the room as quiet as I knowed how, and dropped cautious into my chair. I leaned back and smiled, sort of grim. That shows, I thinks, that women ain't got the right kind of tack to handle a kid, or else they've got catching nerves. It shows how easy a man can. Papa, lime! Dee Dee's clear little voice just cut what I was thinking into two pieces. I was into that bedroom in about two steps. Dee Dee was standing up in her crib. Papa, lime, she says, sort of anxious. No, I says, stern in earnest. No, lime! Papa Lime, she demands. No, I says, in a way that froze her smile right where it was. She looked up at me doubtful-like, her little pink and white chin puckered up all ready to cry. Papa, Lime, Lime, she pleaded. I reached over and forced her right back onto her pillow. Dee Dee, I says, in a voice that was new and that she wasn't acquainted with. Go to sleep. Be quiet. Stop this instant, or I will spank you. I guess maybe the angels kept on singing as joyful as ever up in heaven. I guess maybe, somewhere out west further, the sun was shining down gay on nodding, careless flowers. Maybe even in the next block, some good baby was being snuggled up in its ma's arms. But to Dee Dee, lying in the corner of her crib, the world had got a million years older in about a minute. Her world that had been all smiles and pleasant things had turned into a world of hard words and cruel faces. Her mama dear had on a mask of unfeeling coldness. Her papa dear stood there towering above her, a sort of giant of wrath, flourishing an awful mysterious weapon, the word spank. 
It looked like everybody had gone back on her. Her friends, which was me and Marthy. Her playmates, which was me and Marthy. Her lovers, which was me and Marthy. The providers of her joy, which was me and Marthy, had turned into adventures. She was all alone in a world of clubs. Just one wee kid and everybody against her. She lay there a minute palpitating, with her chin trembling piteous. What was to be did when her parents vanished, and these strange, harsh people took their places? She crept to the foot of the bed where I was still standing, and she got up and took hold of my arm and hugged it. Papa, she said loving. I pushed her back on the pillow again, gentle but firm. Edith, I says, in the hard voice she wasn't acquainted with. Lie down and go to sleep. I don't want to have no more of this. Go to sleep. I heard the dinner bell tinkle from the dining room, and I helped Marthy to get up, and we went out and left Dee Dee alone in the dark. I ate the first part of my dinner without saying anything. It wasn't exactly easy to be lively under them circumstances. Even Uncle Ned didn't say nothing, and Granddaddy didn't feel called on to start a conversation. It got so he was so quiet it hurt. Uncle Ed made bold to speak. When I was a kid, he says lightly, I used to get spanked with a six-inch plank. Edward, says Marthy, how can you say such a thing? It done me good, he says. You can't begin too young. We've all got the devil in us, and the only way to get it out is to pound it out. Marthy laid down her fork, and her lips trembled. Cut that out, Ed, I says. Marthy has the nerves tonight. The subject ain't popular. Well, I think she's going to be good now, says Granddaddy, who always stuck up for the kid being the best that ever lived. She seems quiet enough. She must have gone off to sleep. I sure do hope so, says Marthy. I never had such a day with her. Mama, lie him, came the little voice from the bedroom of a sudden. I met Tuami today, I says, and he... Mama, lime, mama, lime, called Dee Dee. He asked to be remembered to you, I says. He was with May Wilson. From the bedroom come a low, maddened wail. Mama, lime, papa, lime. It kept getting louder. It got to be a regular cry, punctuated off here and there with calls for lime. Marthy looked at me hopeless. I seen the look and looked down at my plate. I'll spank her when I'm done my dinner, I says. There's no other way. We didn't say much during the rest of that meal. It was a very solemn feast. We was all thinking of Dee Dee. There wasn't no doubt that the time had come we had been afraid of. The punishment and the crime was properly fitted to each other. Now or never was the time to spank. But we was a ridiculous, tender-hearted family, and as the dinner went on, the spanking of Dee Dee loomed up bigger than Pike's Peak. It piled up huge and record-breaking above the teapots and the puddings, and looked about as important as the end of the world or a big war. When we got up, it was like the condemned going to the execution, and we marched into the front room like a jury, bringing in the death verdict, files into the courtroom. Dee Dee still cried for lime. We four sat down and looked at the carpet, as gloomy as a funeral. I opened my mouth, swallowed hard two times, and shut it again. Uncle Edward tapped on the carpet with his toe. Granddaddy looked at one of the spots on the same carpet like it was a personal insult to him, and Marthy smoothed out one of the roses on it with her heel. We wasn't half so interested in that carpet when we bought it as we looked to be at that very minute. Well says Marthy at last. I kept my eye away from hers. I looked out of the window. Next, I got up and stood by the window and stuck my hands deep down into my pants pockets. If you're going to, says Marthy, if you ain't. Dee Dee was getting too bad to stand. It looked as if the neighbors would be coming in to complain next thing. I turned around and walked slow toward the bedroom. The three other grown-ups sat like stone statues. As I pushed aside the curtains, Marthy jumped across the room and grabbed my arm. Hiram, she cried eager, you won't be too severe. 
You won't get mad and hurt her. Marthy, I says. If you want to spank her, do so. If you want me to spank her, don't you mix in. I shook her hand off me, and she went back to her chair, crying. Well, I went into that bedroom. Dee Dee left off crying when she see me, and in the dim light I could see her standing in the crib. I stuck my hand out to take her, and she hung on to it. Papa, lime, she begged. Edith, I says, hoarse in my throat, you've been naughty. Papa told you to go to sleep, and Mama told you to go to sleep. When we tell you to go to sleep... You've got to go to sleep. Now this is the last time I'm going to tell you. Will you lie down and go to sleep? Papa, lie him, she says impatient. I set my mouth and lifted her up and laid her on the bed on her face and held her there. She struggled and yelled. Be quiet, I says. Be quiet or I will spank you. She gave one long lingering cry for lie I took a long breath and lifted up my hand, and, and, I ain't a-going to tell about that. Let's go into the other room. There sat the three other grown-ups, holding their hands over their ears with pained-looking faces. Even at that, they heard the sound of a dozen short, sharp claps, and the sound of the quick cries, and then there was a silent spell, only broke by the great big sobs of the little kid in the next room. Sobs of that sort of exploded their way out, shaking the little body till the crib rattled. The sobbing got weaker and weaker and come further apart, and I stole out of the bedroom, wiping my face with my handkerchief. I think she'll be a good girlie now, says Granddaddy, gentle-like. That baby, shocked and surprised, laid on the pillow thinking as much as a baby could think. Something cruel and unexpected had happened to her. Me and Marthy had turned cruel. She didn't have no one to love up to. She had been hurt. Her papa dear had hurt her, because she had cried for lime. I hope she will, says Marthy in reply to Granddaddy. And that minute from the bedroom come Dee Dee's voice. Papa, it pleaded. I jumped up from my chair. Evidently that child needed. Papa, kiss, says Dee Dee, soft and pleading. Well, I rather guess we all kissed her. We hugged her until she was gasping for breath, and she smiled at us and forgave us all, even while the sobs come once in a while to interfere with her smiling. Ain't she a dear, dear baby? cried Marthy. Poor little thing. When we had loved her enough to spoil any good the spanking had done, Marthy drove us out. Come, dearie, she says to Dee Dee. Say your little prayers. Mama forgot. Dee Dee pressed up against her ma's knee, joyous. Now, Marthy prompts her. Nowie, says Dee Dee. Lay me, says Marthy. Lie him, says Dee Dee, tickled as you please, and then wondering why the whole lot of us shouts out, Lie him, of a sudden, and why we laugh and crowd round her and kiss her and kiss her. Poor baby, says Marthy, to be spanked for wanting to say her prayers. "'By George,' says Uncle Edward. "'Talk about your martyrs. "'She beats the whole bunch.' "'And to think there was once a time "'when me and Marthy thought a kid "'was more bother than it was worth. "'There ain't no child nowhere "'that ain't worth more than everything else "'in the world all put together. "'No, sir. "'A baby has got more human nature in it "'than a man has even. "'You take your big, rough hand to it, "'and you chastise it so that it screams out. And the next minute it takes time in between sobs to hug its soft little arms around your neck and kiss you. Ain't that the realest kind of human nature? Why, that's the kind that makes the world worth living in at all. I don't seem to recollect ever hearing that heaven was set aside as a sort of place where married folks could hang about by twos. Them that has had experience knows that that would be a mighty poor kind of heaven, one without children in it. It is the child kind of human nature that sweetens up the world, the give-and-take kind. Take your spanking when it comes, and give back love in return for it. End of Section 4 Confessions of a Daddy
Section 5 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Great American Pie Company. If you take a pie and cut it in two, the track of your knife will represent the course of Mud River through the town of Gloning, and that part of the pie to the left of your knife will be the east side, while the part to the right will be the west side. Away out on the edge of the pie, where the town fitters away into the fields and shanties on the east side, dwells Mrs. Deacon, and a fatter, better-natured creature never trod the crust of the earth, or made the crust of a pie. Being in reduced circumstances, owing to the inability of Mr. Deacon to appreciate the beneficial effects of work, Mrs. Deacon turned her famous baking ability to account, and in a small way began selling her excellent homemade pies to those who liked a superior article. In time, Mrs. Deacon established a considerable trade among the people of Gloning, and Mr. Deacon was rested from his customary seat on the back steps to make daily delivery trips with the Deacon homemade pies. Ephraim Deacon was a deep thinker and philosopher. He was above his environment, or at least he felt so, and while waiting for opportunity to approach and give his talents full vent, he scorned labor. So he sat around a good deal, and jawed a good deal, and smoked. But if you will return to your plate of gloaning, you will see on the pie, far over on the west side, where the scallops lap over the edge of the plate, a little spot that is burnt a bit too brown. This is the home of Mrs. Phineas Doolittle, as base and servile an imitator as ever infringed on another person's monopoly. For seeing and hearing of the success of Mrs. Deacon's pies, Mrs. Doolittle put a few extra pieces of hickory in her stove, got out her rolling pin, and became a competitor, even to making Mr. Doolittle deliver her pies. The Deacon pies had sold readily at ten cents, three for a quarter. The Doolittle pie entered the field at eight cents, three for twenty cents. Mrs. Deacon stood this as long as possible, and then she decided to stand it no longer, unless she had to. "'If you good-for-nothing lazy animal,' she remarked to her husband one morning as she started him on his rounds. "'If you was a man, I'd send you over to talk to that doolittle woman, but you ain't, so it ain't no use in sending you. But if you meet up with that lazy, good-for-nothing husband of hers, you give him a piece of my mind, and let him know what I think of them, what comes stealing away my business, and breaking down prices, which I don't wonder at, her pie's not being in the same class as mine, as everybody knows. If you was any good, you'd mash his head in for him, just to show her what I think of them. But there, like as not, if you do catch up with him, you two will sit and gossip like two old grannies, which is all you are good for, either of you. Being thus admonished, F. Deacon set forward to deliver his pies. As he reached the bridge over Mud River, Finney Doolittle, with a basket of pies on each arm, started to cross the bridge from the opposite side, and the two men, if Mrs. Deacon will allow me, met in the middle of the bridge, and with a common impulse put down their baskets and wiped their brows. "'Howdy, Finn. Blame hot today, eh?' remarked F. "'Howdy. Howdy, F.' replied Phineas. "'Tis so. Some smattering of warmth in the air, ain't it?' "'Don't know if I ever knew one much hotter,' said F. "'How's the pie business over your way?' "'Well, now,' said Finn, "'tain't what you'd call good, nor it ain't what you'd call bad. I don't know what I would call it, unless I'd call it about fair to middlin'. How's it over your way?' "'Well,' F. said, "'I don't know. I ain't got no real cause to complain, I reckon.' but it does seem as if prices on pies was getting too low to make it worth while for a man to keep his woman over a hot stove a day like this. It don't seem right for folks to break into business and cut the liver out of prices. Oh, now, F., Finn expostulated. You ain't got no just cause for to say that. A man's got to do something to get started, ain't he? If we're going to fight this out, said F. calmly, I move we adjourn over yon into the shade and set down to it. This ain't no question for to settle in no two shakes of a ram's tail, Phineas. 
and we might as well settle it right now and get shed of it. I dare say you're right in that, F, Phineas agreed, and we'll just kite over yonder and sit down and figure the whole blame business out, so's we won't have to bother about it no more. When the two men were comfortably settled in the shade and had lighted their pipes, F, as the senior in the trade and the party with the complaint, opened his mouth to speak. But before the words came forth, Phineas outflanked him and let fly a thunderbolt. F, he said, you got to lower down your pie prices to even up with what mine are. F looked at his companion in astonishment. Lower down my prices, he ejaculated. You be crazy, Finn, plumb crazy. Don't I give a bigger pie and a better pie than what you do? Well then, remarked Phineas with a sly twinkle in his eye. How do you reckon I can hist my prices up any? Maybe you think I can get ten cents for a small, mean pie, whilst you ask ten cents for a big, good one. My idea is that if we want to run along nice and smooth and not have no trouble, what we want to do is get together and go in cahoots, and then it don't make no difference what we sell at. I'm again trusts, F said coldly. So am I, said Phineas. Who said anything about trusts? All we want to do is even things up a bit. First thing you know, you'll get mad and cut your prices down to eight cents, and I'll have to drop to six, and you'll come to six, and I'll go to four, and you'll go to four, and I'll sell pies at two, and you'll put your pies down to two cents, and blame my hide if I don't give pies away. Dog me if I don't. F looked worried. Oh, come on, Finn, he said anxiously. You won't up and do that, will you? Dog me if I don't, Finn repeated stubbornly. F arose and shook his fist at Phineas. You old idiot, he yelled. I'll teach ye. And bending over, he seized a large, soft pie and slapped it down over the head of the seated Phineas. In a moment, the two men were standing face to face, fists clenched and breath coming short and fast, each waiting for the other to strike the first blow. But neither struck. F's eyes fell to Phineas's shoulder, where a large fragment of pie had lodged. Phineas moved slightly, and the pie fragment wavered, tottered, and F reached out his hand quickly to catch it. And Phineas dodged, and, closing in, grasped him around the waist and pulled down. F sank upon his knees, and Phineas followed, and the two men, nose to nose, eye to eye, looked at each other and grinned. "'If we're going to fight this thing out,' said F, Let's go over in the shade and set down. It's too blame hot for wrestling. I reckon you see how your plan would work out, said Phineas. We'd give away nigh on to a thousand pies, and all because we don't use hoss sense. I'm again trust, same as you. I'd vote any day to down any of them big fellers, but a little private agreement between gentlemen don't hurt nobody. What I say is... "'Get together and fix on a fair price and stick to it.' "'Just what I say,' said F. "'You lift your price up to ten cents.' "'Never in this green world,' said Phineas. "'Contrary-wise, you drop your grade of pie down to equal mine "'and put your price down to eight cents.' "'Not so long as I live,' said F. "'Well, then,' said Phineas, "'it stands this way.' If we leave our prices as they be, it means fight and loss to us both, and we won't change em. so what's to be done? F. looked out over the river gloomily. Dog me if I know, he sighed. There's just one thing, said Phineas. We got to form a stock company, you and me, and put all our earnings together, and then every so often divide up even. Then if I sell more pies because mine are eight cents, you'll get your half of all I sell. And if you sell more because your pies are bigger and better, I'll get my share of what you sell. And when things get going all right, we'll raise up the price all round. Say, my pie's to ten cents and yours to twelve. And being in cahoots, there won't be anybody to say we shan't do it. And we'll lay aside that extra profit to build up the business. Phineas, said F. solemnly, it's a wonder I didn't think of that myself. Ain't it now? asked Phineas. But I've give this thing some thought, and I ain't begun to tell you where it ends. 
I wanted to see how you took it before I let it all out on you. F leaned forward eagerly. Go on, he said. Let it out on me now. When the only two homemade pie makers get together like we'll be, said Phineas triumphantly, I'd like to know who'll stop us from lifting up the price. Huh, them that don't like to pay our prices, they can eat baker's pies and, and welcome. I know some folks in this town, F said, that wouldn't eat baker's pies if they had to pay 25 cents apiece for homemade. He paused to consider this pregnant statement and then added, but I reckon the bakers would get away with a heap of our trade if we begun lifting our prices much. Phineas's eyes snapped. They would. Hey, he said laughing. Maybe they would, and maybe they wouldn't. What do you suppose we'd be doing with a surplus we'd accumulate? Come strawberry season, we'd up and buy every strawberry that come to gloaning. We'd pay more than anybody could afford to, and add the difference to our strawberry pie price, because we'd have the only strawberry pies in town. And what strawberries we couldn't use right off, we'd can for the winter pies. And as other fruits come in, we'd buy them up the same way. But we wouldn't be mean. We'd open a fruit store and sell folks fruit at a good high price if they sign an agreement not to use any for pie. And in a little while, the bakers would get sick and sell out their shops to us for almost nothing. And then we'd go into the bacon business big. We'd bake cakes and bread then, said F. eagerly. Cakes and bread and donuts and buns and everything, said Phineas with enthusiasm. We'll get one big bake shop and save on expenses and shove up the price of stuff a little and just coin money. We'd ought to get at it quick, said F. We oughtn't waste no time. What do you reckon would be a good name for the company? I've fixed all that up, said Phineas. We'll call it the American Pie Company Incorporated. And being as only you and me will be in it, we'll each have to be officers. I'm going to be president, exclaimed F, with all the eagerness of a boy. All right, F, said Phineas. We don't want to have no more fights, and I want to do what's right, so you can be president. I'll be treasurer. F thought for a minute. He knew Phineas well. I want to do what's right, too, he said at last. You can be president. I'll be treasurer. I guess maybe we'd better take turns being treasurer, suggested Phineas. All right, said F. I want my turn first. When the two men had settled the treasurer question, they smoked a while in silence, each lost in thought, and as they thought, their brows clouded. "'Say, F,' said Phineas at length. "'What be you thinking that makes you look so glum?' F shook his head sadly. "'I've been looking ahead, Finn,' he said. "'Way ahead. And I see a snag. "'I don't hold it again, you Finn, but the thing won't pan out.' "'What? What you run up again, F?' asked Phineas solicitously. "'Fruit,' said F dolefully. "'Loads of it. Finn?' What if we do gather all the fruit that comes to town? Ain't there just dead loads and loads of fruit in these here United States? And the minute we get to putting up the price, it'll get nosed about, and dagos and guineas will pile in here with fruit and cut under us. He sighed. Twas a good business while it lasted, Finn, but it didn't last long. Phineas lay back on the grass and laughed long and squeakily. "'Is that all the further ahead you looked, F. Deacon?' he asked when he had recovered his breath. "'Any old fool ought to know that the second year we was in business, we'd buy up all the fruit in the United States.' F.'s face cleared and he smiled again, but Phineas's face clouded. "'What worries me, F.' he said, "'was about paying such high prices for fruit as them blamed farmers would likely ask.' Now I won't stand for it, neither will you. Not by a blame sight, Finn, said F. I won't let nobody downtrod me. But, he asked anxiously, how are you going to stop it? Phineas dug his heel in the soft turf. We got to go out and buy farms, he announced decisively, and hire the farmers to run em. Think we can afford it, Finn? asked F. We don't want to go putting our money into nothing losing. We got to afford it, said Finn. We're in this thing so deep now, we can't go back. 
and we'll need part of the farms anyhow for our wheat. Our wheat? said F, puzzled. Be we going to sell wheat, Finn? Sell wheat? said Finn with disgust. No such fools. Won't we need all the wheat this country can grow and keep our big flour mills rhyming? When we own all the flour mills in the country, it stands to reason we'll have to own all the wheat, don't it? F. looked at his companion with open mouth. Mills, he ejaculated. What for do we want to own all the mills? Phineas waved his hand in the air. Tain't want to, he said decisively. It's have to. I didn't say we'd buy all the mills, because I thought you'd surely see for yourself that we'd have to buy them. Now, I ain't kicking, Finn, said F. in a conciliating tone. If you say buy the mills, we'll buy em. I'm ready and willing any time you are. All I ask is why. That's all I ask, why. Well, sir, explained Phineas, if our bakery here puts up the price of bread and our outside bakeries will ship bread, if we don't buy the outside bakeries, and once we start, we've got to buy out every bakery in the country. And when we do that, we've got to own all the mills so no one else can get any flour to start bacon. And to keep anybody else from starting mills, we've got to own all the wheat belt. It's only right to be on the safe side, F. F crossed his knees and smoked silently, nodding his head slowly the while. I dare say you're right, Finn, he admitted at length, but you ain't far-seeing enough. Suppose, just suppose, for instance, it come time to ship a lot of flour from our mills to our bakeries, and them lumber fellers up north wouldn't furnish timber to supply our barrel factories. Phineas laughed. We'd use sacks, he said shortly. Well, said F. Suppose, just suppose, for instance, that about the time we needed cotton to run our cloth mills to make sacks for our flour, he paused. We would run down our own cloth mills, wouldn't we, Finn? he asked. Surely, surely, replied Phineas. All right, continued F. Suppose them cotton growers down south and them timber growers up north wouldn't let us have no cotton or no timber. What then? Phineas nodded that he comprehended the wisdom of the deduction. You're right, F., he said. American pie has got to buy out the timber belt and the cotton belt. I'm glad you thought of it. It shows you take an interest in the business, even if you did interrupt me when I was thinking on a mighty important point. What's that? asked F. We got to buy out the railroads, said Phineas. Once we own them, we can get proper freight rates. Ain't you afraid maybe some of them foreign countries will ship our flour or fruit or crackers? asked F. How can they, when we put the tariff up like we will? asked Phineas. Course, we're buying up these other things. We've got to buy up Congress. Finn, exclaimed F suddenly, we'll have a dickens of a tax bill to pay. We'll swear off our taxes, said Phineas shortly. F relapsed into meditation. Why, Finn, he said at length, we'll be as good as bosses of these United States, won't we? Surely we will, Finn replied. Do you suppose I'm doing all this work and taking all this worry just for the money? What do I care for a few millions more or less, F, when I've got millions and millions? What I want is power. I want to have this here nation so that when I say, come, it'll come, and when I say go, it will go, and when I say dance, it will dance. He stood up and inflated his thin breast and tapped it with his forefinger. F, he said, with this here American Pie Company going, you and me can go and say to them big trust men, eat dirt, and they'll eat it, and be glad to get off so easy. We can, he paused and glanced up the road unsteadily. He shaded his eyes and looked closely at the distant figure of a stout woman who was waddling in their direction. Skip! he exclaimed. Here comes your wife. F. rolled over and made a dash on his hands and knees for his basket of pies. Phineas was already walking rapidly up the road. The stout woman was not Mrs. Deacon. She turned off the street before the truant pie men had gone many steps, 
and they returned to the grass beside the bridge. For some reason, they were not so jubilantly hopeful. Dog it, said F., as they seated themselves in the shade. I wish to goodness I hadn't mashed that pie on you, Finn. I don't know what on earth I'm going to say to her about it. She's pesky stingy with her pies these days. Same way up at my house, said Phineas. But that'll all be different when we get the American Pie Company going. I guess we'll likely have pie every day then, hey? And not have nobody's nails in our hair, neither. Speaking of nails, said F., but not enthusiastically, think we better make our own nails. We'll need a lot of them to crate up pies and bread to ship. Yes, said Phineas, and we'll just take over the steel business while we're about. We'll have a department to do building, and there ain't any use paying other folks a big profit to build our mills, and we might as well do building for other folks, and we'll need steel rails for our railroads. F began to grow enthusiastic again. We ought to build our own mines, too, he suggested. And run our own stores to sell our bread and pies in every town, said Finn. And our own cannon factories to can our fruit, said F. "'and our own can factories to make the cans,' added Finn. "'We'll have our own tin and iron mines, of course,' said F. "'And our own printing shops for labels and advertising and show bills. "'Better buy out the magazines and newspapers. "'We can use them, said Finn. "'Yes,' agreed F. "'And have our own paper mills.' "'Certainly,' said Phineas. "'There's good money in all them. "'We'll make more than them that's running of them now.' We'll economize on help. That's right, said F. By consolidating, we can do away with one-third of the help. We'll have a whoopin' big payroll as it is. Well, said Phineas, you've got to pay fair wages where you have to depend on your help. Fair wages is all right, said F. But nowadays, they want the whole hog. You don't hear of nothing but labor unions and strikes. If you and me put our money into a big thing like American Pie, we take all the risk, and then the laborin' men want all the profits. It ain't square. No, it ain't, said Phineas. And if you don't pay them more than you can afford, they strike right at your busiest time. They could put us out of business in one year. The first farmers would strike at harvest, and all our fruit and wheat would go to rot. Then the flour mill hands would strike, and the wheat get wormy and no good. Then the bakers would strike, and no bread in the country. We'd most likely be lynched by the mobs. F. thought deeply for a while, and the more he thought, the more doleful he became. Phineas, he said at length, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think this American pie business is most too risky to put our money into. Phineas had also been thinking and his face offered no encouragement. F, he said, you're right there. If our farmers and millers and bakers did strike, and folks starved to death, we'd like as not be impeached and tried for treason or something, and put in jail for life, if our necks wasn't broke by rope. I like money, but not so much as to have that happen. Neither do I, said F, and I've been thinking of another thing. Could we get our old women to go into this thing? My wife ain't so far-sighted as I be, and just at first, until we make a million or two, we'd have to sort of depend on them to do the bacon. Well, now that you put it right at me, said Phineas, I don't know as my wife would take right up with it either. She seems bound to do just the contrary to what I want her to do. But I don't know as I'd care to put money into anything while these here labor unions keep acting up. I don't know as I would either, said F. I guess maybe we'd better let this thing lay over till the labor unions sort of play out. What say? I reckon you're right, agreed Phineas. I guess we'd better mosey along with these here pies, too. The two men arose from their shady seats, and Phineas swung his baskets upon his arms. But F seemed to be considering a delicate question. That there pie I mashed, he said at length. I don't know what to say to my wife about it. She'll like to take my scalp off when she finds out I'm ten cents shy. Dog me if I ain't glad it wasn't my pie, said Finn heartily. F coughed. You don't reckon as maybe you could give me the loan of a dime till tomorrow, could you, Finn? He asked. 
Phineas grinned. Well, now, F, he said, I'd give it to you in a minute, if so be I had it, but I swan to gracious I ain't got a cent to my name. End of Section 5 Great American Pie Company Section 6 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Pup, Part 1 The Education of Fluff Murchison, who lives next door to me, wants to get rid of a dog, and if you know of anyone who wants a dog, I wish you would let Murchison know. Murchison doesn't need it. He's tired of dogs anyway. That's just like Murchison, way up in enthusiasm one day and sick of it the next. Brownlee, Brownlee lives on the other side of Murchison, remembers when Murchison got the dog. It was the queerest thing, so Murchison says, you ever heard of. Here came the express wagon, Adams Express Company's wagon, and delivered the dog. The name was all right, C.P. Murchison, Gallatin, Iowa, and the charges were paid. The charges were $2.80 and paid, and the dog had been shipped from New York. Think of that, 1,200 miles in a box, with a can of condensed milk tied to the box and please feed written on it. When Murchison came home to dinner, there was the dog. At first, Murchison was pleased. Then he was surprised. Then he was worried. He hadn't ordered a dog. The more he thought about it, the more he worried. If I could just think who sent it, he said to Brownlee, then I would know who sent it. But I can't think. It is evidently a valuable dog. I can see that. People don't send cheap, inferior dogs 1,200 miles but I can't think who sent it. What worries me, he said to Brownlee another time, is who sent it. I can't imagine who would send me a dog from New York. I know so many people, and like as not, some influential friend of mine has meant to make me a nice present, and now he is probably mad because I haven't acknowledged it. I'd like to know what he thinks of me about now. It almost worried him sick. Murchison never did care for dogs, but when a man is presented with a valuable dog, all the way from New York, with $2.80 charges paid, he simply has to admire that dog. So Murchison got into the habit of admiring the dog, and so did Mrs. Murchison. From what they tell me, it was rather a nice dog in its infancy, for it was only a pup then. Infant dogs have a habit of becoming pups. As near as I could gather from what Murchison and Mrs. Murchison told me, it was a little fluffy yellow ball, with bright eyes and ever-moving tail. It was the kind of a dog that bounces around like a rubber ball, and eats the evening newspaper, and rolls down the porch steps with short, little squawks of surprise, and lies down on its back with its forelegs in the air whenever a bigger dog comes nearer. In color, it was something like a camel, but a little redder where the hair was long and its hair was like beaver fur, soft and woolly inside, with a few long hairs that were not so soft. It was so little and fluffy that Mrs. Murchison called it Fluff. Pretty name for a soft little dog is Fluff. If I only knew who sent that dog, Murchison used to say to Brownlee, I would like to make some return. I'd send him a barrel of my best melons, express paid, if it cost me five dollars. Murchison was in the produce business, and he knew all about melons, but not so much about dogs. Of course, he could tell a dog from a cat, and a few things of that sort. But Brownlee was the real dog man. Brownlee had two Irish pointers, or setters, I forget which they were, the black dogs with the long floppy ears. I don't know much about dogs myself. I hate dogs. Brownlee knows a great deal about dogs. He isn't one of the book-taught sort. He knows dogs by instinct. As soon as he sees a dog, he can make a guess at its breed. And out our way, that is a pretty good test. For Gallatin dogs are rather cosmopolitan. That is what makes good stock in men. Scotch grandmother, German grandfather on one side, and English grandmother and Swedish grandfather on the other. And I don't see why the same isn't true for dogs. 
there are a number of dogs in Gallatin that can trace their ancestry through nearly every breed of dog that ever lived, and Brownlee can look at any one of them and immediately guess at its formula. One part spitz, three parts greyhound, two parts collie, and so on. I have heard him guess more kinds of dogs than I ever knew existed. As soon as he saw Murchison's dog, he guessed it was a purebred shepherd with a trace of Eskimo. Massett, who thinks he knows as much about dogs as Brownlee does, didn't believe it. The moment he saw the pup, he said it was a pedigree dog, half St. Bernard and half Spitz. Brownlee and Massett used to sit on Murchison's steps after supper and point out the proofs to each other. They would argue for hours. All right, Massett, Brownlee would say, but you can't fool me. I'll look at that nose. If that isn't a shepherd nose, I'll eat it. And see that tail? Did you ever see a tail like that on a spitz? That is an Eskimo tail as sure as I am a foot high. Tail fiddlesticks, Masset would reply. You can't tell anything by a pup's tail. Look at his ears. There is St. Bernard for you. And see his lower jaw? Isn't that spitz? I'll leave it to Murchison. Isn't that lower jaw spitz Murchison? Then all three would tackle the puppy and open its mouth and feel its jaw, and the pup would wiggle and squeak and back away, opening and shutting its mouth to see if its works had been damaged. All right, Brownlee would say, but you wait a year or two and you'll see. About three months later, the pup was as big as an ordinary full-grown dog, and his coat looked like a compromise between a calfskin and one of these hairbrush doormats you used to wipe your feet on in muddy weather. He did not look like the same pup. He was long-limbed and awkward and useless, and homely as a shop-worn fifty-cent yellow plush manicure set. Murchison began to feel that he really didn't need a dog, but Brownlee was as enthusiastic as ever. He would go over to Murchison's fairly oozing dog knowledge. I tell you what that dog is, he would say. That dog is a cross between a Great Dane and an English deerhound. You've got a very valuable dog there, Murchison. A very valuable dog. He comes from fine stock on both sides, and it is a cross you don't often see. I never saw it, and I've seen all kinds of cross dogs. Then Massett would drop in and walk around the dog admiringly for a few minutes and absorb his beauties. Murchison he would say. Do you know what that dog is? That dog is a pure cross between a Siberian wolfhound and a Newfoundland. You treat that dog right, and you'll have a fortune in him. Why, a pure Siberian wolfhound is worth a thousand dollars, and a good, a really good Newfoundland, mind you, is worth two thousand, and you've got both in one dog. That's three thousand dollars worth of dog. The next few months, Fluff grew. He broadened out and lengthened and heightened, and every day or two Brownlee or Masset would discover a new strain of dog in him. They pointed out to Murchison all the marks by which he could tell the different kinds of dogs that were combined in fluff, and every time they discovered a new one they held a sort of jubilee and bragged and swelled their chests. They seemed to spend all their time thinking up odd and strange kinds of dog that fluff had in him. Brownlee discovered the traces of Cuban bloodhound, Camp Chotka hound, Beagle, Brig de Bengal, and Tibet Mastiff. But Masset first traced the stagehound, Turkoman watchdog, Dachshund, and Harrier in him. Murchison, not being a doggish man, never claimed to have noticed any of these family resemblances, and never said what he thought the dog really was, until a month or two later when he gave it as his opinion that the dog was a cross between a wolf, a Shetland pony, and hyena. It was about that time that Fluff had to be chained. He had begun to eat other dogs, and children, and chickens. The first night Murchison chained him to his kennel, Fluff walked a half a mile, taking the kennel along, and then only stopped because the kennel got tangled with a lamp post. The man who brought him home claimed that Fluff was nearly asphyxiated when he found him, said he gnawed half through the lamp post, and that the gas had got in his lungs, but this was not true. Murchison learned afterwards that it was only a gasoline lamp post and a wooden one. If there were only some stags around this part of the country, said Massette, 
The staghound strain in that dog would be mighty valuable. You could rent him out to everybody who wanted to go stag hunting, and you'd have a regular monopoly, because he is the only staghound in this part of the country, and stag hunting would be popular, too, out here, because there are no game laws that interfere with stag hunting in this state. There's no closed season. People could hunt stags all the year round, and you'd have that dog busy every day of the year. Yes, sneered Brownlee. Only there are no stags, and he hasn't any staghound blood in him. Pity there are no docks in this state, too, isn't it? Then Murchison could hire his dog at night, too. They hunt dogs at night, don't they, Massette? Only there is no docks and blood in him, either. If there was, and if there were a few docks, Massette was mad. Yes, he cried, and you with your Cuban bloodhound strain. I suppose if it was the open season for Cubans, you'd go out with the dog and tree a few, or put on snowshoes and follow the camp chat to his icy lair. Brownlee doesn't get mad easily. Murchison, he said. Leaving out Massette's dreary nonsense about stagehounds, I can tell you that dog would make the finest duck dog in the state. He's got all the points for a good duck dog, and I ought to know, for I have two of the best duck dogs that ever lived. All he needs is training, and if you train him right, you'll have a mighty valuable dog. But I don't hunt ducks, said Murchison, and I don't know how to train even a lap dog. You let me attend to his education, said Brownlee. I just want to show Massett here that I know a dog when I see one. I'll show Massett the finest duck dog he ever saw when I get through with Fluff. So he went over and got his shotgun just to give Fluff his first lesson. The first thing a duck dog must learn is not to be afraid of a gun, and Brownlee said that if a dog first learned about guns right at his home, he was not so apt to be afraid of them. He said that if a dog heard a gun for the first time when he was away from home and in strange surroundings, he was quite right to be surprised and startled. But if he heard it in the bosom of his family, with all his friends calmly seated about, he would think it was a natural thing and accept it as such. So Brownlee put a shell in his gun, and Massette and Murchison sat on the porch steps and pretended to be uninterested and normal. And Brownlee stood up and aimed the gun in the air. Fluff was eating a bone, but Brownlee spoke to him and he looked up, and Brownlee pulled the trigger. It seemed about five minutes before Fluff struck the ground. He jumped so high when the gun was fired, and then he started north by northeast at about sixty miles an hour. He came back all right, three weeks later, but his tail was still between his legs. Brownlee didn't feel the least discouraged. He said he saw now that the whole principle of what he had done was wrong, that no dog with any brains whatever could be anything but frightened to hear a gun shot off right in the bosom of his family. That was no place to fire a gun. He said Fluff evidently thought the whole lot of us were crazy and ran in fear of his life, thinking we were insane and might shoot him next. He said the thing to do was to take the shotgun into its natural surroundings and let Fluff learn to love it there. He pictured Fluff enjoying the sound of the gun when he heard it at the edge of the lake. Murchison never hunted ducks, but as Fluff was his dog, he went with Brownlee, and of course Massette went. Massette wanted to see the failure. He said he wished stags were as plentiful as ducks, and he would show Brownlee. Fluff was a strong dog, he seemed to have a strain of ox in him, so far as strength went, and as long as he saw the gun, he insisted that he would stay at home. But when Brownlee wrapped the gun in brown paper so it looked like a big parcel from the meat shop, the horse that they had hitched to the buckboard was able to drag Fluff along without straining itself. Fluff was fastened to the rear axle with a chain. When they reached Duck Lake, Brownlee untied Fluff and patted him, and then unwrapped the gun. Fluff gave one pained glance and made a six-mile run home in seven minutes, without stopping. He was home before Brownlee could think of anything to say, and he went so far into his kennel that Murchison had to take the boards off at the back to find him that night. "'That's nothing,' was what Brownlee said when he did speak. "'Young dogs are often that way, gun fright. They have to be gun-broken.' 
You come out tomorrow, and I'll show you how a man who really knows how to handle a dog does the trick. The next day, when Fluff saw the buckboard, he went into his kennel, and they couldn't pry him out with the hoe handle. He connected buckboards and guns in his mind, so Brownlee borrowed the butcher's delivery wagon, and they drove to Wild Lake. It was seven miles, but Fluff seemed more willing to go in that direction than toward Duck Lake. He did not seem to care to go to Duck Lake at all. "'Now then,' said Brownlee, "'I'll show you the intelligent way to handle a dog. I'll prove to him that he has nothing to fear, and that I am his comrade and friend. And at the same time,' he said, "'I'll not have him running home and spoiling our day's sport.' So he took the chain and fastened it around his waist, and then he sat down and talked to Fluff like an old friend, and got him in a playful mood. Then he had Murchison get the gun out of the wagon and lay it on the ground about twenty feet off. It was wrapped in brown paper. Brownlee talked to Fluff and told him what a fine sport duck hunting was, and then, as if by chance, he got on his hands and knees and crawled toward the gun. Fluff hung back a little, but the chain just coaxed him a little too, and they edged up to the gun, and Brownlee pretended to discover it unexpectedly. "'Well, well,' he said. "'What's this?' Fluff nosed up to it and sniffed it, and then went at it as if it was Massette's cat. That Brownlee had wrapped a beefsteak around the gun, inside the paper, and Fluff tore off the paper and ate the steak, and Brownlee winked at Murchison. "'I declare,' he said, "'if here isn't a gun. Look at this, Fluff, a gun. Gosh, but we are in luck. Would you believe it?' That dog sniffed at the gun, and did not fear it in the least. You could have hit him on the head with it, and he would not have minded it. He never did mind being hit with small things like guns and axe handles. Brownlee got up and stood erect. You see, he said proudly, all a man needs with a dog like this is intelligence. A dog is like a horse. He wants his reason appealed to. Now, if I fire the gun, he may be a little startled but I have created a faith in me and him. He knows there's nothing dangerous in a gun as a gun. He knows I'm not afraid of it, so he's not afraid. He realizes that we are chained together, and that proves to him that he need not run unless I run. Now watch. Brownlee fired the shotgun. Instantly he started for home. He did not start lazily, like a boy starting to the woodpile, but went promptly and with a dash. His first jump was only ten feet, and we heard him grunt as he landed, but after that he got into his stride and made fourteen feet each jump. He was bent forward a good deal in the middle, where the chain was, and in many ways he was not as graceful as a professional cinder-path track runner. But in running, the main thing is to cover the ground rapidly. Brownlee did that. Massette said it was a bad start. He said it was all right to start a hundred-yard dash that way, but for a long-distance run, a run of seven miles across country, the start was too impetuous, that it showed a lack of generalship, and that when it came to the finish, the affair would be tame. But it wasn't. Brownlee said afterwards that there wasn't a tame moment in the entire seven miles. It was rather more wild than tame. He felt right from the start that the finish would be sensational, unless the chain cut him quite in two, and it didn't. He said that when the chain had cut as far as his spinal column, it could go no farther, and it stopped and clung there. But it was the only thing that did stop, except his breath. It was several years later that I first met Brownlee, and he was still breathing hard, like a man who has just been running rapidly. Brownlee says when he shuts his eyes, his legs still seem to be going. The first mile was through underbrush, and that was lucky, for the underbrush removed most of Brownlee's clothing and put him in better running weight, but at the mile and a quarter they struck the road. He said at two miles he thought he might be over-exercising the dog, and maybe he had better stop, but the dog seemed anxious to get home, so he didn't stop there. He said that at three miles he was sure the dog was overdoing, and that with his knowledge of dogs he was perfectly able to stop a running dog in its own length if he could speak to it. But he couldn't speak to this dog for two reasons. One was he couldn't overtake the dog, 
and the other was that all the speak was yanked out of him. When they reached five miles, the dog seemed to think they were taking too much time to get home, and let out a few more laps of speed, and it was right there that Brownlee decided that Fluff had some greyhound blood in him. He said that when they reached the town, he felt as if he would have been glad to stop at his own house and lie down for a while. But the dog didn't want to, and so they went on. But that he ought to be thankful that the dog was willing to stop at that town at all. The next town was twelve miles farther on, and the roads were bad. But the dog turned into Murchison's yard and went right into his kennel. When Murchison and Masset got home an hour or so later, after driving the horse all the way at a gallop, they found old Greg, the carpenter, prying the roof off the kennel. You see, Murchison had knocked the rear out of the kennel the day before, and so when the dog aimed for the front, he went straight through. And as Brownlee was built more perpendicular than the dog, Brownlee didn't quite go through. He went in something like doubling up a dollar bill to put it into a thimble. I don't suppose anybody would want to double up a dollar bill to put it into a thimble, but neither did Brownlee want to be doubled up and put into the kennel. It was the dog's thought. So they had taken the kennel roof off. When they got Brownlee out, they laid him on the grass and covered him up with a porch rug, and let him lie there a couple of hours to pant, for that seemed what he wanted to do just then. It was the longest period Brownlee had ever spent awake without talking about dog. Murchison and Massette and old Greg and twenty-six informal guests stood around and gazed at Brownlee panting. Presently, Brownlee was able to gasp out a few words. Murchison, he gasped. Murchison, if you just had that dog in Florence, or wherever it is they race dogs, you would have a fortune. He panted a while and then gasped out. He's a great runner, a phenomenal runner. He had to pant more, and then he gasped with pride. But I wasn't three feet behind him all the way. Getting rid of Fluff. So after that, Murchison decided to get rid of Fluff. He told me that he had never really wanted a dog, anyway. But when a dog is sent all the way from New York, anonymously, with $2.80 charges paid, it is hard to cast the dog out into the cold world without giving it a trial. So Murchison tried the dog for a few more years, and at last he decided he would have to get rid of him. He came over and spoke to me about it, because I had just moved in next door. "'Do you like dogs?' he asked. And that was the first conversation I ever had with Murchison. I told him frankly that I did not like dogs, and that my wife did not like them, and Murchison seemed more pleased than if I had offered him a thousand dollars. "'Now I'm glad of that,' he said. "'For Mrs. Murchison and I hate dogs. "'If you do not like dogs, I will get rid of Fluff. "'I made my mind up several years ago to get rid of Fluff, "'but when I heard you were going to move into this house, "'I decided not to get rid of him "'until I knew whether you liked dogs or not. "'I told Mrs. Murchison that if we got rid of Fluff before you came "'and then found out you loved dogs and owned one, you might take our getting rid of Fluff as a hint that your dog was distasteful to us, and it might hurt your feelings. And Mrs. Murchison said that if you had a dog, your dog might feel lonely in a strange place and might like to have Fluff to play with until your dog got used to the neighborhood. So we did not get rid of him. But if you do not like dogs, we will get rid of him right away. I told Murchison that I saw he was the kind of neighbor a man liked to have and that it was kind of him to offer to get rid of Fluff, but that he mustn't do so just on our account. I said that if he wanted to keep the dog, he had better do so. Now that is kind of you, said Murchison, but we would really rather get rid of him. I decided several years ago that I would get rid of him, but Brownlee likes dogs, and he took an interest in Fluff, and wanted to make a bird dog of him, so we kept Fluff for his sake. "'but now Brownlee is tired of making a bird dog of him. "'He says Fluff is too strong to make a good bird dog "'and not strong enough to rent out as a horse, "'and he is willing I should get rid of him. "'He says he is anxious for me to get rid of him as soon as I can. "'When I saw Fluff, I agreed with Brownlee. "'At first glance, I saw that Fluff was a failure as a dog, 
and that to make a good camel he needed a shorter neck and more hump. But he had the general appearance of an amateur camel. He looked as if someone who had never seen a dog, but had heard of one, had started out to make a dog, and got to thinking of a camel every once in a while, and had tried to show me Fluff that day worked in parts of what he thought a camel was like, with what he thought a dog was like, and then, when the job was about done, had decided it was a failure, and had just finished it up anyway, sticking on the meanest and cheapest hair he could find, and getting most of it on the wrong side, too. But the cheap hair did not matter much. Murchison and Brownlee showed me the place where Fluff had worn most of it off the ridge pole of his back crawling under the porch. He tried to show me Fluff that day, but it was so dark under the porch I could not tell which was Fluff and which was simply underneathness of porch. But from what Brownlee told me that day, I knew that Fluff had suffered a permanent dislocation of the spirits. He told me he had taken Fluff out to make a duck dog of him and that all the duck Fluff was interested in was to duck when he saw a gun, and that after he had heard the gun fired once or twice, he had become sad and dejected, and had acquired a permanently ingrown tail, and an expression of face like a coyote, but more mournful. He had acquired a habit of carrying his head down and forward, as if he was about to lay it on the headsman's block, and knew he deserved that and more, and the sooner it was over the better. He couldn't even scratch fleas correctly. Brownlee said that when he met a flea in the road, he would not even go around it, but would stoop down like a camel to let the flea get aboard. He was that kind of dog. He was the most discouraging dog I ever knew. The next day I was putting down the carpet in the back bedroom when in came Murchison. I came over to speak to you about Fluff, he said. I'm afraid he must have annoyed you last night. I suppose you heard him howl. Yes, Murchison, I said. I did hear him. I never knew a dog could howl so loud and long as that. He must have been very ill. Oh, no, said Murchison cheerfully. That is the way he always howls. That is one of the reasons I have decided to get rid of Fluff. But it is a great deal worse for us than it is for you. The air inlet of our furnace is at the side of the house just where Fluff puts his head when he howls and the register in our room is right at the head of our bed. So his howl goes in at the inlet and down through the furnace and up the furnace pipes, and it is delivered right in our room, just as clear and strong as if he was in the room. That is one reason I have fully decided to get rid of Fluff. It would not be so bad if we had only one register in our house, but we have ten. And when Fluff howls, his voice is delivered by all ten registers. So it is just as if we had ten fluffs in the house at one time, and ten howls like fluffs are too much. Even Brownlee says so. I told Murchison that I agreed with Brownlee perfectly. Fluff had a bad howl. It sounded as if cruel fate, with spikes on his shoes, had stepped on Fluff's inmost soul, and then jogged up and down on the tenderest spot, and Fluff was trying to reproduce his feelings in vocal exercises. It sounded like a cheap phonograph, giving a symphony in the key of woe minor, with a megaphone attachment and bad places in the record. Judging by his voice, the machine needed a new needle, but the megaphone attachment was all right. End of Section 6 That Pup, Part 1《セクション7 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories Volume 1 》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Pup, Part 2 《Getting Rid of Fluff Continued》Brownlee, who knows all about dogs, said that he knew what was the matter with Fluff. He said Fluff had a very high-grade musical temperament, and that he longed to be the Caruso of dogs. He said that he could see that all through his bright and hopeful puppyhood he had looked forward to being a great singer with a Wagner repertoire and tremolo stops in his song organ, and that he had early set his aim at perfection. He said Fluff was that kind of dog, and that when he saw what his voice had turned out to be he was dissatisfied and became morbid. He said that any dog that had a voice like Fluff's had a right to be dissatisfied with it, 
he would be dissatisfied himself with that voice. He said he did not wonder that Fluff slunk around all day, feeling he was no good on earth, and that he could understand that when night came and everything was still, so that Fluff could judge the purity of his tonal quality better, he would pull out his voice and tune it up and look over it and try it again, hoping it had improved since he tried it last. Brownlee said it never had improved, and that was what made Fluff's howl so mournful. It was full of tears. He said Fluff would go G-flat and B-flat and D-flat, and so on until he struck a note he felt he was pretty good at, and then he would cling to that note and weep it full of tears. He asked Murchison if he hadn't noticed that the howl was sort of damp and salty from the tears, but Murchison said he hadn't noticed the dampness. He said it probably got dried out of the howl before it readied him, coming through the furnace. Then Brownlee said that if there was only some way of regulating fluff so that he could be turned on and off, Murchison would have a fortune in him. He could turn his howl off when people wanted to be cheerful, and then, when a time of great national woe occurred, Murchison could turn Fluff on and set him going. He said he never heard anything in his life that came so near expressing in sound a great national woe as Fluff's howl did. He said Fluff might lack finish in tonal quality, but in that woe quality he was a master. He was stuffed so full of woe quality that it oozed out of his pores. He said he always thought what a pity it was for dogs like Fluff that people preferred cheerful songs like Annie Rooney and Waltz Me Around Again, Willie, to the nobler woe operas. He said he had tried to like good music himself, but it was no use. Whenever he heard Fluff sing, he felt that Murchison ought to get rid of Fluff. Then Murchison said that it was just what he was going to do. What he wanted to talk about was how to get rid of Fluff but I am getting too far ahead of my story. Whenever I get to talking about the howl of fluff, I find I wander on for hours at a time. It takes hours of talk to explain just what a mean howl fluff had. But as I was saying, Murchison came over while I was putting down the carpet in my back bedroom, and he told me he had fully decided to get rid of fluff. I have fully decided to get rid of him, he said. "'and the only thing that bothers me is how to get rid of him.' "'Give him away,' I suggested. "'That's a good idea,' said Murchison gratefully. "'That's the very idea that occurred to me "'when I first thought of getting rid of Fluff. "'It is an idea that just matches Fluff all over. "'That is just the kind of dog Fluff is. "'If ever a dog was made to give away, Fluff was made for it. "'The more I think about him and look at him and study him, the sure I am that the only thing he is good for is to give away. He shook his head and sighed. The only trouble, he said, is the fluff is the giveaway kind of dog. That is the only kind you can't give away. There is only one time of year that a person can make presents of things that are good for nothing but to give away, and that is at Christmas. Now I might. Murchison, I said, laying my tack hammer on the floor and standing up. You don't mean to keep that infernal howling beast until Christmas, do you? If you do, I shall stop putting down this carpet. I shall pull the tacks out that are already in and move elsewhere. Why, this is only the first of May, and if I have to sleep, if I have to keep awake every night and listen to that animated foghorn drag out his raw soul over the teeth of a rusty harrow, I shall go crazy. Can't you think of someone that is going to have a birthday sooner than that? I wish I could, said Murchison wistfully, but I can't. I want to get rid of Fluff, and so does Brownlee, and so does Massette. But I can't think of a way to get rid of him, and neither can they. Murchison, I said with some asperity, for I hate a man who trifles. If I really thought you and Brownlee and Massette were as stupid as all that, I would be sorry I moved into this neighborhood, but I don't believe it. I believe you do not mean to get rid of Fluff. I believe you and Brownlee and Massette want to keep him. If you wanted to get rid of him, you could do it the same way you got him. That's an excellent idea, exclaimed Murchison. That is one of the best ideas I ever heard, 
and I would go and do it if I hadn't done it so often already. As soon as Brownlee suggested that idea, I did it. I sent Fluff by express to a man, to John Smith, at Worcester, Massachusetts. And when Fluff came back, I had to pay eight dollars and fifty-five cent charges. But I didn't begrudge the money. The trip did Fluff a world of good. It strengthened his voice and made him broader-minded, I tell you, he said enthusiastically. There's nothing like travel for broadening the mind. Look at Fluff. Maybe he don't show it, but that dog's mind is so broadened by travel that if he was turned loose in Alaska, he could find his way home. When I found his mind was getting so tremendously broad, I stopped sending him to places. Brownlee, Brownlee knows all about dogs. He said it would not hurt Fluff a bit. He said a dog's mind could not get too broad, and as far as he was concerned, he would just like to see once how broad-minded a dog could become. He would like to have Fluff sent out by express every time he came back. He told me it was an interesting experiment. So far as he knew it, had never been tried before. And the thing I ought to do was to keep Fluff traveling all the time. He said that so far as he knew it, it was the only way to get rid of Fluff. That some time while he was traveling around in the express car, there might be a wreck, and we would be rid of Fluff. And if there wasn't a wreck, it would be interesting to see what effect constant travel would have on a coarse dog. He said, I might find after a year or two that I had the most cultured dog in the United States. Brownlee was willing to have me send Fluff anywhere. He suggested a lot of good places to send dogs, but he didn't care enough about dog culture to help pay the express charges. I see, Murchison, I said scornfully. I see. You're the kind of man who would let a little money stand between you and getting rid of a dog like Fluff. If I had a dog like Fluff, nothing in the world could prevent me from getting rid of him. I only wish he was my dog. Take him, said Murchison generously. I'll make you a full and free present of him. You can have that dog absolutely and wholly. He is yours. I will take the dog, I said haughtily. Not because I really want a dog, nor because I hanker for that particular dog, but because I can see that you and Brownlee and Massette have been trifling with him. Bring him over in my yard, and I will show you in very short measure how to get rid of Fluff. That afternoon both Brownlee and Massette called on me. They came and sat on my porch steps, and Murchison came and sat with them, and all three sat and looked at Fluff and talked him over. Every few minutes they would, Brownlee and Massette would, get up and shake hands with Murchison and congratulate him on having got rid of Fluff. And Murchison would blush modestly and say, Oh, that is nothing. I always knew I would get rid of him. And there was the dog, not five feet from them, tied to my hydrant. I watched and listened to them until I'd had enough of it. And then I went into the house and got my shotgun. I loaded it with good BB shell and went out. Fluff saw me first. I never saw a dog exhibit such intelligence as Fluff exhibited right then. I suppose travel had broadened him, and probably the hydrant was old and rusted out anyway. When a man moves into a house, he ought to have all the plumbing attended to first thing. Any ordinary, unbroadened dog would have lain down and pulled, but Fluff didn't. First, he jumped six feet straight into the air, and that pulled the four-feet hydrant pipe up by the roots. And then he went away. He took the hydrant and pipe with him. And that might have surprised me, but I saw that he did not know where he was going, nor how long he would stay there when he reached the place. A dog can never tell what will come in handy when he is away from home. A hydrant and a piece of iron pipe might be the very thing he would need, so he took them along. If I had wanted a fountain in my yard, I could not have got one half as quickly as Fluff furnished that one. I would never have thought of pulling out the hydrant to make me one. Fluff thought of that. At least Brownlee said he thought of it. But I think all Fluff wanted to do was get away. And he got away, and the fountain didn't happen to be attached to the hydrant. So he left it behind. If it had been attached to the hydrant, he would have taken it with him. 
He was a strong dog. There, said Brownlee, when we heard the pipe rattle across the 8th Street Bridge. There's intelligence for you. You ought to be grateful to that dog all your life. You didn't know it was against the law to discharge a gun in the city limits, but Fluff did, and it wouldn't wait to see you get into trouble. He has heard us talking about it, Murchison. I tell you, travel has broadened that dog. Look what he has saved you, he said to me, by going away just at the psychological moment. We should have told you about not firing a gun in the city limits. You can't get rid of Fluff that way. It's against the law. Yes, said Massette. And if you knew Fluff as well as we do, you would know that he is a dog you can't shoot. He is a wonderful dog. He knows all about guns. Brownlee tried to make a duck dog out of him, and took him out where the ducks were, showed him the ducks, shot a gun at the ducks. And what do you think that dog learned? To run, I said, for I had heard about Brownlee teaching Fluff to retrieve. Brownlee blushed. Yes, said Massette. But that wasn't all. It doesn't take intelligence to make a dog run when he sees a gun. But Fluff did not run like an ordinary dog. He saw the gun and he saw the ducks. And he saw that Brownlee only shot at ducks when they were on the wing. And he thought Brownlee meant to shoot him. So what does he do? Stand still? No, he tries to fly. Gets right up and tries to fly. He thought that was what Brownlee was trying to teach him. He couldn't fly, but he did his best. So whenever Fluff sees a gun, he is on the wing, so to speak. You noticed he was on the wing, didn't you? I told him I had noticed it. I said that as far as I could judge, Fluff had a good strong wing. I said I didn't mind losing a little thing like a hydrant and a length or two of pipe, but I was glad I hadn't fastened Fluff to the house. I always liked my house to have a cellar, and it would be just like Fluff to stop flying at some place where there wasn't any cellar. Oh, said Massette, he wouldn't have gone far with a house. A house is a great deal heavier than a hydrant. He would probably have moved the house off the foundation a little, but by judging by the direction Fluff took, the house would have wedged between those two trees, and you would have only lost a piece of the porch, or whatever he was tied to. But the lesson is that you must not try to shoot Fluff unless you are a good wing shot. Unless you can shoot like Davy Crockett, you would be apt to wound Fluff without killing him, and then there would be trouble. Yes, said Murchison, the prevention of cruelty to animal folks. There is only one way in which a dog can be killed according to the law in this place, and that is to have the prevention of cruelty to animal folks do it. You send them a letter telling them you have a dog you want killed and asking them to come and kill it. That is according to law. That, I said firmly, is what I will do. It won't do any good, said Murchison sadly. They never come. This addition to Gallatin is too far from their offices to be handy, and they never come. I have eighteen deaths for fluff on file at their offices already, and not one of them has killed him. When you have as much experience with dogs as I have had, you will know that the prevention of cruelty to them in this town does not include killing them when they live in the suburbs. The only way a dog can die in the suburbs of Gallatin is to die of old age. How old is Fluff? I asked. Fluff is a young dog, said Brownlee. If he had an ordinary dog constitution, he would have lived fifteen years yet, but he hasn't. He has an extra strong constitution, and I should say he was good for twenty years more. But that isn't what we came over for. We came over to learn how you mean to get rid of Fluff. Brownlee, I said, I shall think up some way to get rid of Fluff. Getting rid of a dog is no task for a mind like mine. But until he returns and gives me back my hydrant, I shall do nothing further. I am not going to bother about getting rid of a dog that is not here to be got rid of. By the time Fluff returned, I had thought out a plan. Murchison never paid the dog tax on Fluff, and that was the same as condemning him to death if he was ever caught outside of the yard. But when he was outside, he could not be caught. He was a hasty mover, 
and little things such as closed gates never prevented him from entering the yard when in haste. When he did not jump over, he could get right through a fence. But to a man of my ability, these things are trifles. I knew how to get rid of Fluff. I knew how to have him caught in the street without a license. I chained him there. Brownlee and Massette and Murchison came and watched me do it. Our street is not much used, and the big stake I drove in the street was not so much in the way of passing grocery delivery wagons. I fastened Fluff to the stake with a chain, and then I wrote to the city authorities and complained. I said there was a dog without a license that was continually in front of my house, and I wished it removed. And a week or so later the dog catcher came around and had a look at Fluff. He walked all around him, while Massette and Brownlee and Murchison and I leaned over our gates and looked on. He was not at all what I should have expected a dog catcher to be, being thin and rather gentlemanly in appearance. And after he had looked Fluff over well, he came over and spoke to me. He asked me if Fluff was my dog. I said he was. I see, said the dog catcher, and you want to get rid of him. If he was my dog, I would want to get rid of him, too. I have seen lots of dogs, but I never saw one that was like this, and I do not blame you for wanting to part with him. I have had my eye on him for several years, but this is the first opportunity I have had to approach him. Now, however, he seems to have broken all the dog laws. He has not secured a license, and he is in the public highway." It will be my duty to take him up and gently chloroform him as soon as I make sure of one thing. Tell me what it is, I said, and I will help you make sure of it. Thank you, he said, but I will attend to it. And with that he got on his wagon and drove off. He returned in about an hour. I came back, he said, not because my legal duty compels me, but because I knew you would be anxious. If I owned a dog like that, I would be anxious too. I can't take that dog. Why not? We all asked. Because, he said, I have been down to the city hall and I have looked up the records and I find that the streets of this addition to the city have not been accepted by the city. The titles to the property are so made out that until the city legally accepts the streets, each property owner owns to the middle of the street fronting his property. If you will step out and look, you will see that the dog is on your own property. If that is all, I said, I will move the stake. I will put him on the other side of the street. If you would like him any better there, said the dog catcher, you can move him, but it would make no difference to me. Then he would be on the private property of the man who owns the property across the street. But my good man, I said, how is a man to get rid of a dog he does not want? The dog catcher frowned. That, he said, seems to be one of the things our lawmakers have not thought of. But whatever you do, I advise you to be careful. Do not try any underhand methods, for now that my attention has been called to the dog, I shall have to watch his future and see that he is not badly used. I am an officer of the prevention of cruelty to animals as well as a dog catcher, and I warn you to be careful what you do with that dog. Then he got on his wagon again and drove away. The next morning I was a nervous wreck, for Fluff had howled all night, and Murchison came over soon after breakfast. He was accompanied by Brownlee and Massette. Now, I'm the last man in the world to do anything that my neighbors would take offense at, he said as soon as they were seated on my porch. And Brownlee and Massette love dogs as few men ever love them. But something has to be done about Fluff. The time has come when we must sleep with our windows open, and neither Massette nor Brownlee nor I got a minute of sleep last night. Neither did I, I said. That is different entirely, said Murchison. Fluff is your dog, and if you want to keep a howling dog, you would be inclined to put up with the howl. But we have no interest in the dog at all. We do not own him, and we consider him a nuisance. We have decided to ask you to get rid of him. It is unjust to your neighbors to keep a howling dog. You will have to get rid of Fluff. Exactly, said Massette. For ten nights I have not slept a wink, and neither has Murchison, nor has Brownlee. Nor I, 
I added. Exactly, said Massette. And four men going without sleep for ten nights is equal to one man going without sleep for forty nights, which would kill any man. Practically, Fluff has killed a man and is a murderer, and as you are responsible for him, it is the same as if you were a murderer yourself. And as you were one of the four who did not sleep, you may also be said to have committed suicide. But we do not mean to give you into the hands of the law until we have remonstrated with you. But we feel deeply, and the more so, because you could easily give us some night's sleep in which to recuperate. If you can tell me how, I said, I will gladly do it. I need sleep more at this minute than I ever needed it in my life. Very well, said Massette. Just get out your shotgun and show it to Fluff. When he sees the gun, he will run. He will take wings like a duck, and while he is away, we can get a few nights rest. That will be something. And if we are not in good condition by that time, you can show him the shotgun again. Why, he exclaimed, as he grew enthusiastic over his idea, you can keep Fluff eternally on the wing. I felt that I needed a vacation from Fluff. I unchained him and went to get my shotgun. Then I showed him the shotgun, and we had two good nights of sleep. After that, whenever we felt we needed a few nights in peace, I just showed Fluff the shotgun, and he went away on one of his flying trips. But it was Brownlee, Brownlee knew all about dogs, who first called my attention to what he called the curiosity of Fluff. Now, if you would have never noticed it, he said one day when Murchison and I were sitting on my porch with him. But I did. This is because I've studied dogs, and I know all about dogs, and I know Fluff can run. This is because he has greyhound blood in him, with a little wolf. That is why I studied Fluff, and how I came to notice that every time you show him the shotgun, he's gone just forty-eight hours. Now, you go and get your shotgun and try it. So I tried it and Fluff went away as he always did, and Brownlee sat there bragging about how Fluff could run, and about how wonderful he was himself to have thought of the curiosity of Fluff. Did you see how he went? he asked enthusiastically. That gate was a thirty-mile-an-hour gate. Why, that dog travels. He travels. He took out a piece of paper and pencil and figured it out. In forty-eight hours he travels fourteen hundred and forty miles. He gets seven hundred and twenty miles from home. That doesn't seem possible, said Murchison. No, said Brownlee, frankly, it doesn't. He went over his figures again. But that is figured correctly, he said. If, but maybe, I did not gauge his speed correctly. And I didn't allow for stopping to turn around at the end of the outsprint. What we ought to have on that dog is a pedometer. If I owned a dog like that, the first thing I would get would be a pedometer. I told Brownlee that if he wished, I would give him fluff, and he could put a pedometer or anything else on him. But Brownlee remembered he had some work to do and went home. But he was right about the curiosity of fluff. Almost on the minute at the end of forty-eight hours, fluff returned, and Brownlee and Murchison, who were there to receive him, were as pleased as if Fluff had been going away instead of returning. That dog, said Brownlee, is a wonderful animal. If Sir Isaac Newton had that dog, he would have proved something or other of universal value by him. That dog is plumb full of ratios and things. If we only knew how to get them out of him. I bet Sir Isaac Newton had had Fluff as long as you've had him, he would have had a formula all worked out. X divided by Y times the sum of 2XZ minus dog equals 2 times the sum of 4AB minus 3X, or something of that kind, so that anyone with a half a knowledge of algebra could figure out the square root of any dog any time of the day or night. I could get up a law of dog myself, if I had time, with a dog like Fluff to work on. If one dog travels 1,440 miles at the side of a gun, how far would two dogs travel? All that sort of thing. Stop, he ejaculated suddenly. If one dog travels 48 hours at the side of one gun, 
How far would he travel at the sight of two guns? Murchison, he cried enthusiastically, I've got it. I've got the fundamental law of curiosity in dogs. Go get your gun, he said to me, and I will get mine. He stopped at the gate long enough to say, I tell you, Murchison, we're on the verge of a mighty important discovery, a mighty important discovery. If this thing turns out right, we will be at the root of all dog nature. We will have the great underlying law of sacred dogs. He came back with his shotgun carefully hidden behind him, and then he and I showed Fluff the two guns simultaneously. For one minute Fluff was startled. Then he vanished. All we saw of him as he went was the dust he left in his wake. Massette had come over when Brownlee brought over his gun, and Murchison and I sat and smoked while Massette and Brownlee fought out the curiosity of Fluff. Brownlee said that for two guns, Fluff would traverse the same distance as for one, but twice as quickly. But Massette said Brownlee was foolish, and that any one who knew anything about dogs would know that no dog could go faster than Fluff had gone at the sight of one gun. Massette said Fluff would travel at his regular one-gun speed, but would travel a two-gun distance. He said Fluff would not be back for ninety-six hours. Brownlee said he would be back in forty-eight hours, but both agreed that he would travel twenty-eight hundred and eighty miles. Then Murchison went home and got a map, and showed Brownlee and Massette that if Fluff traveled fourteen hundred miles in the direction he had started, he would have to do the last two hundred miles as a swim, because he would strike the Atlantic Ocean at the twelve hundredth mile. But Brownlee just turned up his nose and sneered. He said Fluff was no fool, and that when he reached the coast, he would veer to the north and travel along the beach for two hundred miles or so. Then Massette said that he had been thinking about Brownlee's theory, and he knew no dog could do what Brownlee said Fluff would do, sixty miles an hour. He said he agreed that a dog like Fluff could do thirty miles an hour if he did not stop to howl, because his howl represented about sixty horsepower, but that no dog could ever do sixty miles an hour. Then Brownlee got mad and said Massette was a born idiot, and that Fluff not only could do sixty miles, but he could keep on increasing his speed at the rate of thirty miles per gun indefinitely. Then they went home mad, but they agreed to be on hand when Fluff returned. But they were not. Fluff came home in twenty-four hours, almost to the minute. When I went over and told Brownlee, he wouldn't believe it at first, but when I showed him Fluff, he cheered up and clapped me on the back. I tell you, he exclaimed, we have made a great discovery. We have discovered the law of sacred dogs. A dog is sacred in inverse ratio to the number of guns. Now, it wouldn't be fair to try Fluff again without giving him a breathing spell. But tomorrow I will come over and we will try him with four guns. We will work this thing out thoroughly, he said, before we write to the Academy of Science or whatever a person would write to so that there will be no mistake. Before we give this secret to the world, we want to have it complete. We will try Fluff with any number of guns and with pistols and rifles, and if we can get one, we will try him with a cannon. We will keep at it for years and years. You and I will be famous. I told Brownlee that if he wanted to experiment for years with Fluff, he could have him, but that all I wanted was to get rid of him. But Brownlee wouldn't hear of that. He said he would buy Fluff of me if he was rich enough, but that Fluff was so valuable he couldn't think of buying him. He would let me keep him. He said he would be over the next day to try Fluff again. So the next day he and Murchison and Massette came over and held a consultation on my porch to decide how many guns they would try on Fluff. They could not agree. Massette wanted to try four guns and have Fluff absent only half a day. But Brownlee wanted to have me break my shotgun in two and try that on Fluff. He said that according to the law of sacred dogs, a half a gun working it out by inverse ratio would keep Fluff away for twice as long as one gun, which would be 96 hours. And while they were arguing it out, Fluff came around the house unsuspectingly and saw us on the porch. 
he gave us one startled glance and started north by northeast at what Brownlee said was the most marvelous rate of speed he ever saw. Then he and Massette got down off the porch and looked for guns, but there were none in sight. There wasn't anything that looked the least like a gun, not even a broomstick. Brownlee said he knew what was the matter. Fluff was having a little practice run to keep in good condition and would be back in a few hours. But judging by the look he gave us as he went, I thought he would be gone longer than that. I could see that Brownlee was worried, and as day followed day without any return of Fluff, Murchison and I tried to cheer him up, showing him how much better we all slept while Fluff was away. But it did not cheer up poor Brownlee. He had his faith set on that dog, and the dog had deceived him. We all became anxious about Brownlee's health. He moped around so. And just when we began to be afraid he was going to decline, he cheered up and came over bright and happy as a man could be. I told you so, he exclaimed joyfully as soon as he was inside my gate. And it makes me ashamed of myself that I didn't think of it the moment I saw Fluff start off. You will never see that dog again. I told Brownlee that that was good news anyway, even if it did upset his law of sacred dogs. But he smiled a superior smile. Disproved nothing, he said. It proves my law. Didn't I say in the first place that the time a dog would be gone was inverse ratio to the number of guns? Well, the inverse ratio to no guns is infinite time. That's how long Fluff will be gone. That's how long he will run. Why, that dog will never stop running while there's any dog left in him. He can't help it. It's the law of sacred dogs. Do you mean to say, I asked him, that that dog will run on forever? Exactly, said Brownlee proudly. As long as there's a particle of him left, he will keep on running. That's the law. Maybe Brownlee was right. I don't know. But what I would like to know is the name of someone who would like a dog that looks like Fluff and is his size and that howls like him and that answers to his name. A dog of that kind returned to Murchison's house a long time before infinity, and I would like to get rid of him. Brownlee says it isn't Fluff, that his law couldn't be wrong, and that this is merely a dog that resembles Fluff. Maybe Brownlee's right, but I would like to know someone that wants a dog with a richly melodious voice. End of Section 7 That Pup Section 8 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Goat Feathers No human being ever tells the whole truth about himself. We seem to be born liars in that particular, all of us, and I am no different. I'm starting out how to tell the bitter, agonizing truth about myself. But before I am through, I shall probably be lying at the rate of a mile a minute and cracking myself up something awful. A man can tell only so much truth, then he begins to wobble. The truth is, I ought to be making as much money as Robert W. Chambers and winning prizes of honor like Ernest Poole, and I'm not. I ought to be better known as a humorist than George Ade and Mark Twain rolled into one, and I'm not. The trouble with me is that I'm always too ready and eager to break away and go gathering goat feathers. If it had not been for that, I might be a millionaire or president of the United States or the leading American author bound in red Russian leather. I might have been a set of books like Sir Walter Scott or Dickens or Balzac. And when people passed my house, the natives would say, No, that isn't the city hall or the courthouse. That's where Butler lives. Of course, some strangers would say, Butler the grocer? But that would be the ignorant few. The real people would whisper, Butler the author, in a sort of subdued awe, and remove their hats. Some of them would pick a blade of grass from my lawn and take it home to hand down to their children's children as the most treasured family possession. As it is, I have gathered so many goat feathers that half the people introduce me as Ellis Butler Parker, and the other half as Butler Parker Ellis, 
and if there is a ton of hay growing on my lawn, nobody bothers to pick a pint. My father has to cut it and rake it away. Goat feathers, you understand, are the feathers a man picks and sticks all over his hide to make himself look like the village goat. It often takes six days, three hours, and eighteen minutes to gather one goat feather, and when a man has it and takes it home, it is about as useful and valuable to him as a stone bruise on the back of his neck. I have recently spent several days over a month gathering one goat feather, and as a reward, I was grabbed and chased after another that ate up two weeks and three days of my time. Goat feathers are the distractions, sidelines and deflections that take a man's attention from his own business and keep him from getting ahead. They are the greatest thing in the world, to make a man look like a goat. I think I can claim, without fear of dispute, to have gathered more goat feathers in a fifty-year career and to look more like a goat than any other man living and not excepting Poobah, who added such a pleasing, goat-like character to Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado, Poobah, poor amateur, could boast only that he was first Lord of the Treasury, Lord Chief Justice, Commander-in-Chief, Lord High Admiral, Master of the Buckhounds, Groom of the Back Stairs, Archbishop of Titipu, Lord Mayor, Lord Chamberlain, Attorney General, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Privy Purse, Private Secretary, Lord High Auditor, First Commissioner of Police, Paymaster General, Judge Ordinary, Master of the Rolls, Secretary of State for the Home Department, Groom of the Second Floor Front and Registrar. I can beat that all to pieces. When I wake in the morning as President of the Authors League Fund, I can give some attention to my work as Publicity Manager of the Liberty Loan Committee while preparing to devote an hour or two to the secretaryship of the American Relief and the treasurership of the Volunteer Committee for the Fatherless Children of France, before I consider my duties as Vice President of the Flushing Savings and Loan, and as Vice President, Director and Member of the Discount Committee of the Flushing National Bank. As a Counselor and Member of the Executive Committee of the Authors League, and one of the Membership Committee of the City Club, governor of the Tuscarora Club and publicity manager for the Flushing Red Cross, Flushing Red Cross Drive and Queensboro Red Cross Drive, I can put in a few hours of goat feather gathering. Night may come without my having to do any real work, but if not I can avoid it and accumulate a few more goat feathers as member of the book committee and executive committee of the Queensboro Public Library, member of the Queensboro Committee on Training Camp Activities, executive committee man on the vigilantes, author's committee man of the American Defense Society, and so on for hours and hours and hours. I am a member of everything but the Mother's Club of Public School 20, and everything takes time for my legitimate work. I estimate that in the last 20 years I have gathered 20,000 pounds of goat feathers at a cost of about $5 a pound, and the whole lot is worth about 20 cents. What I marvel at is that I make a living at all. My telephone rings 7,806 times a day, and only once in the last eight years has it been rung by anyone who wanted to buy a story from me. The other 82 million times it was rung by people who wanted me to gather a new crop of goat feathers. At one time I moved out of the barn to get away from the telephone. The result was that I had to come down out of the second story of the barn, walk across my property, enter the house, and go upstairs every time the telephone rang. I did this 82 times a day, and then moved back to the house, and had an extension phone put in my workroom, so close to my desk that every time I flexed a muscle, I knocked the phone off its table. This made it much handier for the goat feather distributors, so they called me up oftener. They call me before I'm out of bed, when I'm in the bathtub, and after I go to bed. Usually, they call me to the phone and then tell me to wait a minute until Mr. Jonesky comes. The favorite times for calling me are when I'm in the bathtub, when I'm at meals, and when I'm trying to concentrate on my writing. I'm not blaming anyone for this. I did not have to rent a telephone. I could have let people come to the house. A great many do come to the house. 
On the average, it takes the person who comes to the house just one hour to state a proposition that could be put in a six-word telegram or phoned in one minute. The visitor always begins with a few neat remarks about pigs and pigs, which is not the name of the story. Tells how his grandmother laughed over it until she swallowed her false teeth. Explains that his grandmother was one of the Tootlecombs of Worcester, but married into the Blah Blah family. About half an hour later, the visitor remarks, I know you are very busy and I hate to ask you, but... Then he asks me to do some little trifle, like raising $80 million in flushing for the war fund of the One-Legged Gardener's League, which has a plan for planting sweet peas in the trenches of Mesopotamia. We know you can do it, he says pleasantly. I know I can do it, too. I feel the great urge of ability rise within me. I don't care a hang for Mesopotamia or for sweet peas in the trenches there, but it is something I can do, and I go ahead and do it. I gather two quarts of red, white, and blue goat feathers, give 18 magazine editors a chance to forget I am alive, and find at the end of the month that I am $340 deeper in debt than I was before. It has come about that people are actually offended if I don't jump into every mad goat feather quest that is proposed. I am firmly convinced that this is now extant an association to prevent Butler from doing a full day's work. I don't want to seem egotistical, but I am now of the opinion that the Kaiser started the war in order to make it seem necessary for me to make four-minute speeches on food conservation, give your binoculars, and buy a thrift stamp. Of course, all our patriotic, liberty loan, Red Cross, thrift stamp sidelining isn't goat feathering. The genuine variety is eagle feather gathering, and I am as proud of my eagle feathers as I am sour on my goat feathers. Now it is a fine thing to be treasurer of the Flushing Hospital, and it is a fine thing to be president of the Flushing Country Club. But the goat feathers pall when you know that the reason you were given those glories was because nobody else would take them. It is a grand and glorious feeling to know you can take some affair and make it a success, or a near success, but it is not business. A man may make a success of a flushing public playground and not be making a success of himself. He may be making a goat of himself. The chances are ten to one that he is making a goat of himself. I'll never get the Pulitzer Prize for the best novel or for the best play. But if there was a Pulitzer Prize for the greatest human goat, nobody else would be in the running. I have not got goat feathers by the dozen or by the pound. I have them by the bale. I estimate that if all my goat feathers were placed end to end, they would reach from the bread line to the poorhouse. It is just possible that by this time you may gather that I have a grouch on myself. If so, you are right. Today I am forty-nine years and six months old and as a bright and shining literary light, I am exactly where I was twelve years ago. I am twelve years older, and have that much less time which to complete the joy of making good as one of the great American authors. Presently the infirmities of age will begin to gnaw at me. The moths will ruin my flossy collection of goat feathers. All those who now pat me on the back because they can make use of me free of charge will forget that I am alive and my executors will shake their heads and say, Ain't it too bad he left so little? Distraction isn't really good for a man if he wants to reach a goal. No salesman ever got very far by carrying too many sidelines. The poorest sort of monopoly for any man to undertake is a monopoly of goat feathers. No man in the world had a better chance to make himself the great American humorist than I had when I wrote Pigs as Pigs. I had a good, solid foundation of fairly good humorous work under it, and the little story had a wonderful success. The thing for me to have done then was to stick to humor, regardless of anything. I have written dainty stories, sympathetic stories, serious stories, all kinds of stories, but not many humorous stories. It is surprising how often editors have had to announce a story that shows this famous humorist in an entirely new vein. Taking literature as a business, I can say that a humorist should have no new vein. Neither does a plumber succeed as a plumber by spending a large share of his working hours making violins. 
No one ever succeeds by allowing himself to be deflected from the most important business of life, which is making the most of the best that is in him. Even a cow does better if she sticks close to the business of eating grass and chewing the cud. When she starts to learn to whistle like a catbird and to flit from field to field like a butterfly, it is safe to say she is no longer a success in life. When a cow strays from plain milk-producing methods and begins climbing trees and turning somersaults, she may be more picturesque, but she is gathering nothing but goat feathers. Seven farmers, a schoolteacher, and a tin peddler may line up along the fence and applaud her all afternoon until she is swelled with pride, but when she gets back to the barn at sundown, she will not give much milk. She will not be known as a milk cow long. She will be a low-grade corned beef, a couple of flank steaks, and a few pairs of three-dollar shoes. I can sit down to write a story about a man who fell off a bridge and landed in a kettle of tar on a canal boat, and, before I have completed a full paragraph, I can have stopped to clean the small o, small e, and small a of my typewriter with a toothpick, stopped to think about the pearl buttons on a vest I owned in 1894, the Spanish-American War, what the French word for illumination is, and whether I paid my last Liberty Loan installment. Before I have finished that first paragraph, I may have stopped to fill my fountain pen, gone downtown to attend a meeting of the Red Cross Committee, started to recatalog my published stories, and taken a trip to Chicago. Before I have got to the first period in the first sentence, I may have decided that I would not have a man fall off the bridge, but have a woman fall off it, that I would not have her fall off a bridge, but off the Woolworth Building that I would not have her fall into a kettle of tar, but into a wagon load of feather beds, that I would not have her fall at all, that I would not write a humorous story at all, that I would not write at all, and that I would instead get an empty cigar box and make a toy circus wagon for my young son. I once made an entire doll's house, two stories, four rooms, kitchen and bath, with hand-carved stairways and electric lighting throughout the walls entirely weatherboarded, put in the carpets, papered the walls, hung lace curtains at the windows, and painted the exterior, and all between two paragraphs of a story. I spent three months on that little trip after goat feathers, and in the meantime Arnold Bennett probably wrote three novels of several hundred thousand words each, gained an international reputation, and passed me on the road to fame like an airplane passing a snail. George Ade kept pegging away at his fables with the regularity of a day laborer, and Peter Finley Doon ground out his Mr. Dooley like an unwearied sausage grinder. On my wall alongside my desk I have a calendar, and the sheet that faces me is that for the first week in March, 1916. It says, Concentration. Concentrate all your thoughts upon the work in hand. The sun's rays do not burn until brought to a focus. Alexander G. Bell. That is the whole matter in a nutshell, but the only use the motto has been to me has been to permit me to look at it and think about it when I ought to be thinking of the story I was trying to write. So far as I am concerned, the most important person in the world is myself. The most important success in the world is my success. The most important money in the world is my money. A whole lot of the most important debts in the world are my debts. The same is true of you and your success and your money and your debts. I hope you are not near fifty years old. I hope you are nearer twenty. But whatever your age, I can tell you that chasing after goat feathers is mighty poor business. The time to investigate interesting bypaths is when you are on a vacation. But the New York Chicago Express gets there by staying on the track. The minute it starts climbing some interesting country lane after daisies and buttercups, the coroners begin together, and the claim agents flock together, and some slow but sure old freight train, plugging along on the next track but sticking to it, toots a couple of times and passes by. If I am ever the boss of a school board, I shall insist that no child graduate until he can foot correctly a pile of numbers four deep and forty high, and do it the first time. I have been a bookkeeper in my day, and I have footed a column of figures twenty times and got ten different results. 
I can go up a column of figures, starting like a racehorse. Seven and six are thirteen, and five are eighteen, and two are twenty. And, and I wonder if I put a stamp on the letter I mailed this morning. I wonder if Bacon wrote Shakespeare's plays. I wonder if a bomb from an airplane would go through from the roof of my house to the cellar. 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 Well, I'm glad I've got eight tons of coal in, but I'll have to get more soon as I can. And six. Then I have to begin at the beginning again. With seven and six are thirteen, and five are eighteen. The reason children don't get their examples right in school is because they don't concentrate on the matter in hand. And the reason men don't get their lives right is because they don't concentrate on the matter of making good at what they know is the business of their lives, success. If you stop a moment and think of the men you know who are not successes, but who might be successes, you will find that they are goat feather gatherers. Anything that leads a man aside from the straight path to his goal is a goat feather. Every useless sideline is a goat feather. Every unnecessary distraction is a goat feather. Nine-tenths of the things I do are goat feathers. I don't mind telling you that I consider myself a very, very wonderful man. Nobody but a most remarkable man could spend so much time in the goat feather grooves gathering goat feathers and still keep his family from starvation. I actually gasp when I think what a great man I should have been if I had stuck to business instead of being drawn aside by every sweet odor and pleasant sound. Then I actually swear when I think how many hours and days and weeks I have given to making myself look like a cross between a llama and a stuffed owl, when I might have been writing things the editors never have enough of and buy as soon as they read the first paragraph. It's all right. I'm not jealous. I sit in the front row every time Aid or Tarkington or Chambers pulls his success, and I'll applaud as wholeheartedly as anyone, but I reserve the right to kick myself when I get outside. This article is one of the kicks, and I hope it will have a good effect on me. I hope it will teach me a lesson. I doubt it. I'm too old. I'm too accustomed to chasing goat feathers to give it up now. So there you have the story of what is the matter with me. You know now why. When you think of me, you think of a story I wrote twelve years ago. I had a main goal, but I liked too well to investigate all the crossroads instead of keeping straight on. That's bad. That's gathering goat feathers. It has been bad for me and bad for my success as an author and bad for my success in the only life I have to live but it is apt to be much worse for you to gather goat feathers than for me to gather them, because I can occasionally weave some of them into a story, while you can't do anything at all with those you acquire. The time we waste in excursions off the main line of our road to our goal is the difference between success and half-success. Often, it is the difference between success and failure. End of Section 8. Goat Feathers Section 9 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mike Flannery on Duty and Off, Part 1. Just Like a Cat. They were doing good work out back of the Westcote Express office. The Westcote Land and Improvement Company was ripping the whole top off Sealers Hill and dumping it into the swampy meadow. And Mike Flannery liked to sit at the back door of the express office when there was nothing to do, and watch the endless string of wagons dump the soft clay and sand there. Already the swamp was a vast landscape of small hills and valleys of new soft soil, and soon it would burst into streets and dwellings. That would mean more work, but Flannery did not care. The company had allowed him a helper already, and Flannery had hopes that by the time the swamp was populated, Timmy would be of some use. He doubted it, but he had hopes. The 432 train had just pulled in, and Timmy had gone across to meet it with his hand truck, and now he returned. He came lazily, pulling the cart behind him with one hand. He didn't seem to care whether he ever got back to the office. "'Is that all the faster you can go?' he shouted. "'Make haste! Make haste! Tis an express company ye're working for, not a cemetery!' 
to look at ye, you would think ye was nothing but a funeral. Sure I am, said Tommy. Tis as ye've said it, Flannery. I'm the funeral. Flannery stuck out his under jaw, and his eyes blazed. For nothing at all, he would have let Timmy have a fist in the side of the head. But what was the use? There are some folks you can't pound sense into, and Timmy was one of them. What have you got, then? asked Flannery. Nothing but the corpse, said Timmy impudently, and Flannery did do it. He swung his big right hand at the lad, and it would have taught him something, but Timmy wasn't there. He had dodged. Flannery ground his teeth and bent over the hand truck. The next moment he straightened up and motioned to Timmy, who had stepped back from him, nearly half a block back. Come back, he said peacefully. Come on back. This one time I'll do nothing to ye. Come on back and lift the box to the office. But the next time... Timmy came back, grinning. He took the box off the truck, carried it into the office, and set it on the floor. It was not a large box, nor heavy, just a small box with strips nailed across the top, and there was an Angora cat in it. It was a fine, large Angora cat, but it was dead. Flannery looked at the tag that was nailed on the side of the box. "'You better get the wagon, Timmy,' he said slowly, "'and proceed with the funeral up to Mrs. Warman's. "'This'll be no weather for perishable goods "'to be lying around the office. "'Quick speed is the motto of the Interurban Express Company "'when the weather is eighty-four in the shade. "'And Timmy,' he called as the boy moved toward the door, "'make no difficulty. "'Should she insist on a receipt for the goods as being damaged?' If necessary, take the receipt for one long-haired cat damaged. But make haste. Tis in me mind that should ye wait too long, Mrs. Warman will not be receiving the consignment at all. She's one of the particular kind, Timmy. In a half an hour, Timmy was back. He came into the office lugging the box and let it drop on the floor with a thud. She won't take no damaged cats, said Timmy shortly. Mike Flannery laid his pen on his desk with almost painful slowness and precision. Slowly he slid off his chair, and slowly he picked up his cap and put it on his head. He did not say a word. His brow was drawn into deep wrinkles, and his eyes glittered as he walked up to the box with almost supernatural stately tread and picked it up. His lips were firmly set as he walked out of the office into the hot sun. Timmy watched him silently. In less than half an hour, Mike Flannery came into the office again, quietly, and set the box silently on the floor. Noiselessly, he hung up his cap on the nail above the big calendar back of the counter. He sank into his chair and looked for a long while at the blank wall opposite him. "'And to think,' he said at last, like one still wrapped in a great blanket of surprise, "'to think she didn't swear one cuss the whole time. Them ladies is wonderful folks.' I wonder, did she say the same to ye as she said to me, Timmy? Sure she did, said Timmy, grinning as usual. Will you think of that now, said Flannery with admiration. Tis a grand constitution she must be having, that lady. Twice in one afternoon, I wonder, could she say the same three times? Tis not possible. He ran his hand across his forehead and sighed, and his eyes fell on the box. It was still where he had put it but he seemed surprised to see it there. He had no recollection of anything after Mrs. Warman had begun to talk. He picked up his pen again. Interurban Express Company, New York, he wrote. Consignee, Mrs. Warman, won't receive cat by bill 23645. Hybrid and Jones, consigner, cat is. He grinned and ran the end of the pen through his stubble of red hair. What is the swell word for dead, Timmy? he asked. I'm writing a letter to the swell clerks in New York that be always guying me about me letters, and I'll hand them a swell letter for once. Deceased, Timmy said, grinning. There's not that one I was thinking of, said Flannery, but that one will do. Tis a high-sounding word, deceased. He dipped his pen in the ink again. Cat is deceased, he wrote. Please give disposal, Mike Flannery. When the New York office of the Interurban Express Company received Flannery's letter, they called up Hybrid and Jones on the telephone. Hybrid and Jones was the big department store, and it was among the Interurban's best customers. 
when the interurban could do it a favor it was policy to do so and the clerk knew that sending a cat back and forth by rail was not the best thing for the cat especially if the cat was deceased that cat said the manager of the live animal department of hybrid and jones was in good health when it left here absolutely so far as we know if it was not it is none of our business mrs warman came in and picked the cat out from a dozen or more and paid for it it is her cat it doesn't interest us any more and another thing you gave us a receipt for that cat in good order if it was damaged in transit it is none of our affair is it owner's risk said the interurban clerk you know we only accept live animals for transportation at owner's risk that lets us out then said hybert and jones clerk mrs warman is the owner ring off please westcote was merely a suburb of new york and mails are frequent and mike flannery found a letter waiting for him when he opened the office the next morning it was brief it said regarding cat wb two three six four five this was sent at owner's risk and mrs warman seems to be the owner cat should be delivered to her we are writing her from this office but in case she does not call for it immediately you will keep it carefully in your office you had better have a veterinary look at the cat feed it regularly mike flannery folded the letter slowly and looked down at the cat feed it he exclaimed i wonder now was that a misprint for fumigated for that is what it will be wanting mighty soon if i know anything about deceased cats i wonder do them dudes in new york be thinkin the long-haired cat is only fainted maybe do they think they see mike flannery sittin be the side of the cat finin it and bring it back to consciousness feed it never in me life have i made a specialty of cats long-haired or short-haired and i don't be pretendin to be a professor of cats but tis me settled belief that when a cat is as dead as that one it stops eatin he looked respectfully at the cat in the box i wonder should i have put the late lamented out on the back porch till the veterinary comes to take its pulse i wonder what the express company wants a veterinary to butt into the thing for anyhow is it the custom nowadays to require a certificate of health for every cat that is as dead as that one before the funeral comes off sure i do believe the express company has doubts of mike flannery's ability to tell is a cat dead or no maybe tis true maybe so but one thing i dang sure have and that is that should the weather not turn off to a cold wave by tomorrow morning twill take no coroner to know the cat is dead he opened the letter again and reread it as he did so the scowl on his face increased he held up the letter and slapped it with the back of his hand keep it carefully in your office he read with scorn sure and what about flannery does the man think i'm to sit beside with the dead pussycat and thry to work up me imagination and to thinkin i'm sittin in a garden of tuberoses tis well enough to say cape it but cats like them do not cape very well the less said about the way they capes the better timmy entered the office and as he passed the box he sniffed the air in a manner that at once roused flannery's temper slop that he shouted i'll have none of your foolin today and what fur you puckerin up your nose at that there cat for there's nothin the matter with the cat tis as sound as a shillin and there's no call for you to be sniffin around to me me lad go about your work and lave that cat alone twill cape twill cape a long time yet don't be so previous me lad if you want to sniff there'll be plenty of time by and by plenty of it ye ain't goin to keep the cat are ye asked timmy with surprise let be said flannery softly with a gentle downward motion of his hands let be if tis me opinion to would be best to keep that cat for some time i will cape it mike flannery is the express agent of this office tim me by and should they be thinkin to would be best for the interests of the company to cape that cat is no longer livin he will there may be many things for you to learn timmy before you know the ole of the express business and dead cats is one of them go on said timmy with a long-drawn vowel i know a dead cat when i see one 
Maybe, said Flannery shortly. Maybe, and maybe not. But do you know where Doc Pomeroy hangs out? Go and fetch him. As Timmy passed the box on the way out, he looked at the cat with renewed interest. He began to have a slight doubt that he might know a dead cat when he saw one, after all, if Flannery was going to have a veterinary come look at it. But the cat certainly looked dead, extremely dead. Doc Pomeroy was a tall, lank man with a slouch in his shoulders and a sad, hollow-chested voice. His voice was the deepest and mournfulest bass. The boys say you want me to look at the cat, he said in his hopeless tone. Where's the cat? Flannery walked into the box and stood over it, and Doc Pomeroy stood at the other side. He did not even bend down to look at the cat. The cat's dead, he said without emotion. Of course it is, said Flannery. Twas dead the first time I seen it. The boy said you wanted me to look at a cat, said Doc Pomeroy. Sure, said Flannery. Sure I did. That's the cat. I wanted you to see the cat. What might be your opinion of it? What do you want me to do with the cat? asked Doc Pomeroy. Look at it, said Flannery pleasantly. Nothing but look at it. Them is me orders. Have the veterinary look at the cat, is what they says. And I can see, be the look on ye, that tis your opinion, tis a mighty dead cat. The cat, said the veterinary slowly, is as dead as it can be. A cat can't be any deader than that one is. It cannot, said Flannery positively. But it can be longer dead. If I had a cat that had been dead longer than that cat has been dead, said Doc Pomeroy as he moved away. I wouldn't have to see it to know that it was dead. A cat that has been dead longer than that cat has been dead lets you know it. That cat will let you know it pretty quick now. Thank ye, said Flannery. And ye have had a good look at it? You wouldn't like to look at it again, maybe? Them's me orders, to allow examination be the veterinary, and if would be any comfort to ye, I will drop a chair so you can look all you want to. The veterinary raised his sad eyes to Flannery's face and let them rest there a moment. Much obliged, he said, but he did not look at the cat again. He went back to his headquarters. That afternoon Flannery and Timmy began walking quickly when they passed the box, and toward evening, when Flannery had to make out his reports, he went out on the back porch and wrote them, using a chair seat for a desk. One of his tasks was to write a letter to the New York office. W.B. 23645, he wrote. The veterinary has seen the cat, and it is deceased all right. He says so. No sign of Mrs. Warman yet. But I'll keep the cat in the office, if you say so, as long as I can stand it. But how can I feed a deceased cat? I never fed a deceased cat yet. What do you feed cats like that? The next morning, when Flannery reached the office, he opened the front door, and immediately closed it with a bang and locked it. Timmy was late, as usual. Flannery stood a minute looking at the door, and then he sat down on the edge of the curb to wait for Timmy. The boy came along after a while, indolently as usual. But when he saw Flannery, he quickened his pace a little. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'Locked out?' Flannery stood up. He did not even say good morning. He ran his hand into his pocket and pulled out the key. "'Timmy?' he said gently, almost lovingly. I have business that takes me to the other side of town. I have the confidence in ye, Timmy, to let ye open up the office. Twill be good experience for ye. He cast his eye down the street, where the car line made a turn around the corner. The trolley wire was shaking. To the way ye open up, he said slowly, is to push the key into the keyhole. Push the key in, Timmy, and then turn at the lift. Wait, he called as Timmy turned. Tis important to turn to the lift, not the right. And when ye have the door open, the car was rounding the corner, and Flannery stepped into the street. When ye have the door open, the door open. The car was where he could touch it. Take the cat out behind the office and bury it. And if you don't, I'll fire ye out of your job. Mind that. The car sped by, and Flannery swung aboard. Timmy watched until it went out of sight around the next corner, and then he turned to the office door. He pushed the key in and turned it to the left. When Flannery returned, the cat was gone, and so was Timmy. 
The grocer next door handed Flannery the key, and Flannery's face grew red with rage. He opened the door of the office, and for a moment he was sure the cat was not gone, but it was. Flannery could not see the box. It was gone. He threw open the back door and let the wind sweep through the office, and it blew a paper off the desk. Flannery picked it up and read it. It was from Timmy. Mike Flannery, Esquire, it said. Take your old job. I'm tired of the express business. Too much cats and Mrs. Warman's in it. I'm going to New York to look for a decent job. I buried the cat for you, but no more for me. Yours truly. Flannery smiled. The loss of Timmy did not bother him. So long as the cat had gone also. He turned to the tasks of the day with a light heart. The afternoon mail brought him a letter from the New York office. Regarding W.B. 23645, it said, and in answer to yours of yesterday's date, in our previous communication we clearly requested you to have a veterinary look at the cat. We judge from your letter that you neglected to do this, as the veterinary would certainly have told you what to feed the cat. See the veterinary at once and ask him what to feed the cat. Then feed the cat what he tells you to feed it. We presume it is not necessary for us to tell you to water the cat. Flannery grinned. And ain't them the jokers now, he exclaimed. Tis some smart boy must have his fun with old Flannery. Go and see the veterinary and ask him what to feed the cat. Good morning, Mr. Pomeroy. Do ye remember the dead cat that ye looked at yesterday? Tis in a bad way this morning, sir. "'Tis far and away deader than it was yesterday. "'We had the funeral this morning. "'What would you be advising me to feed it for a regular diet now? "'Oh, yes, I'll go to the veterinary, not.' "'He stared at the letter frowningly. "'And tis not necessary to tell me to water the cat,' he said. "'Oh, no, they be trusting Flannery to water the cat. "'Flannery has loads of time. "'Tis no need for him to spend his time doing the express business.' Get the sprinkling can, Flannery, and water the cat. Be like if you water it well, you'll be having a fine flower bed of long-haired cats out behind the office. Water the cat well and plant it on the sunny side of the house, and when it sprouts, transplant it to the shady side where it can run up the trellis. Twill bloom hardy until cold weather, if watered plenty. Be tune them and me, tis me opinion the cat was kept too long to grow well any more. Mrs. Warman was very much surprised that afternoon to receive a letter from the express company. As soon as she saw the name of the company in the corner of the envelope, her face hardened. She had an intuition that this was to be another case where the suffering public was imposed upon by an overbearing corporation, and she did not mean to be the victim. She had refused the cat. Fond as she was of cats, she had never liked them dead. She was through with that cat. She tore open the envelope. A woman never leaves an envelope unopened. The next moment she was more surprised than before. Dear Madam, said the letter, regarding a certain cat sent to your address through our company by Hybrid and Jones of this city, while advising you of our entire freedom from responsibility in the matter, all animals being accepted by us at owner's risk only, we beg to make the following communication. The cat is now in storage at our express office in Westcote and is sick. A letter from our agent there leads us to believe that the cat may not receive the best attention at his hands. In order that it may be properly fed and cared for, we would suggest that you accept the cat from our hands, under protest if you wish, until you can arrange with Misters Hebert and Jones as to the ownership. In asking you to take the cat in this way, we have no other object in view than to stop the charges for storage and care, which are accumulating, and to make sure that the cat is receiving good attention. We might say, however, that Hybrid and Jones assure us that the cat is your property, and therefore, until we have assurance to the contrary, we must look to you for all charges for transportation, storage, and care accruing while the cat is left with us, Yours very truly. When she had read the letter, Mrs. Warman's emotions were extremely mixed. She felt an underlying anger toward the express company. She felt an entirely different and more personal anger toward the firm of Hybert and Jones. But above all, 
she felt a great surprise regarding the cat. If ever she had seen a cat that she thought was a thoroughly dead cat, this was the cat. She had had many cats in her day, and she had always thought she knew a dead cat when she saw one. And now this dead cat was alive, ailing, perhaps, but alive. The more she considered it, the less likely it seemed to her that she could have been mistaken about the deadness of that cat. It had been offered to her twice. The first time she saw it, she knew it was dead, and the second time she saw it, she knew it was, if anything, more dead than it had been the first time. The conclusion was obvious. A cat had been sent to her in a box. She had refused to receive a dead cat, and the expressman had taken the box away again. Now there was a live but sick cat in the box. She had her opinion of express men, express companies, and especially the firm of Hybrid and Jones. This full opinion she sent to Hybrid and Jones in the next mail. The next morning, Flannery was feeling fine. He whistled as he went to the 920 train, and whistled as he came back to the office with his hand truck full of packages and the large express envelope with the red seals on the back, snugly tucked in his inside pocket, but when he opened the envelope and read the first paper that fell out, he stopped whistling. Agent Westcote, said the letter, regarding WB 23645, Hybert and Jones, consignor of the cat you are holding in storage, advises us that the consignee claims cat you have is not the cat ship by consignor. Return cat by first train to this office. If cat is not strong enough to travel alone, have veterinary accompany it. Yours truly, Interurban Express Company, per J. At first, a grin spread over the face of Flannery. Not strong enough to travel alone, he said with a chuckle. If ever there was a strong cat, tis that one be this time, and twould be a waste of expense to hire a... Suddenly, his face sobered. He glanced out of the back door at the square mile of hummocky sand and clay. Return cat be first train to the office. He repeated blankly. He left his seat and went to the door and looked out. Return the cat, he said, and stepped out upon the edge of the soft new soil. It was all alike in its recently dug appearance. The cat, return it, he repeated, taking steps this way and that way, with his eyes on the clay at his feet. He walked here and there, but one place looked like the others. There was room for ten thousand cats, and one cat might have been buried in any one of ten thousand places. Flannery sighed. Orders were orders, and he went back to the office and locked the doors. He borrowed a coal scoop from the grocer next door and went out and began to dig up the clay and sand. He dug steadily and grimly. Never perhaps in the history of the world had a man worked so hard to dig up a dead cat. Even in ancient Egypt, where the cat was a sacred animal, they did not dig them up when they had them planted. Quite the contrary, it was a crime to dig them up, and Flannery, as he dug, had a feeling that it would be almost a crime to dig up this one. Never, perhaps, did a man dig so hard to find a thing he really did not care to have. Flannery dug all that morning. At lunchtime he stopped digging, and went without his lunch, long enough to deliver the packages that had come on the early train. As he passed the station he saw a crowd of boys playing hockey with an old tomato can, and he stopped. When he reached the office he was followed by sixteen boys. Some of them had spades, some of them had small fire shovels, and some had only pointed sticks, but all were ready to dig. He showed them where he had already dug. Twenty-five cents apiece, anyhow, he said, and five dollars for the lucky one that finds it. All right, said one. Now what is it we are to dig for? Tis a cat, said Flannery, a dead one. Go on, cried the boy sarcastically. What is it we are to dig for? I can get you a dead cat, mister, said another. Our cat died. Twill not do, said Flannery. "'Tis a special cat I'm wantin. "'Tis a long-haired cat, and it was dead a long time. "'You can't mistake it when you come on to it. "'If ye dig up a cat ye know no one would want to have, that's it.' "'The sixteen boys dug, and Flannery in desperation dug. "'But a square mile is a large plot of ground to dig over. 
no one having observed that cat on the morning when timmy planted it would have believed it could be put in any place where it could not be instantly found again it had seemed like a cat that would advertise itself but that is just like a cat it is always around when it isn't needed and when it is needed it can't be found before the afternoon was half over the boys had tired of digging for a dead cat and had gone away but flannery kept at it until the sun went down then he looked to see how much of the plot was left to dig up it was nearly all left as he washed his hands before going to his boarding house a messenger boy handed him a telegram flannery tore it open with misgivings cat has not arrived must come on night train can accept no excuse it read flannery folded the telegram carefully and put it in his hip pocket he washed his hands with more deliberate care than he had ever spent on them he adjusted his coat most carefully on his back and then walked with dignity to his boarding house he knew what would happen there would be an inspector out from the head office in the morning flannery would probably have to look for a new job in the morning he was up early but he was still dignified he did not put on his uniform but wore his holiday clothes with the black tie with the red dots an inspector is a hard man to face but a man in his best clothes has more of a show against him flannery came to the office the back way there was a possibility of the inspectors being already at the front door as he crossed the filled-in meadow he poked unhopefully at the soil here and there but nothing came of it but suddenly his eyes lighted on a figure that he knew just turning out of the alley three buildings from the office it was timmy flannery had no chance at all he ran but how can a man run in his best clothes across soft new soil when he's getting a bit too stout and timmy had seen him first when flannery reached the corner of the alley timmy was gone and with a sigh that was partly regret and partly breathlessness from his run flannery turned into the main street there was the inspector sure enough standing on the curb flannery had lost some of his dignity but he made up for it in anger he more than made up for it in the heat he had run himself into he was red in the face he met the inspector with a glare of anger there be the key if tis that you're wantin and you may take it and welcome for no more will i be express agent for a company that sends long-haired cats dead in a box and orders me to cape em through the hot weather for a fireside companion and ready reference of perfumery how to feed and water dead cats of the long-haired kind i may not know and how to live with dead cats i may not know but when to bury dead cats i do know and there be plenty of other jobs where a man is not ordered to dig up forty-seven acres to find a cat that was buried none too soon at that what's that said the inspector is that cat dead and what have i been telling the dudes in the head office all the while asked flannery with asperity what but the late deceased dead cat was defunct and no more and them insulting an honest man with their have ye stolen the cat out of the box flannery and put in an inferior short-haired cat i want no more of them here's the key good day to ye hold on said the inspector putting his hand on flannery's arm you don't go yet i'll have a look at your cash and your accounts first what you say about that cat may be true enough but we have got to have proof of it that was a valuable cat that was it was an angora cat a real angora cat you've got to produce that cat before we are through with you produce the cat said flannery angrily the cat is safe and sound in the back lot i present ye with the lot if tis not enough for ye go on and do the dirty work ye have to do on me i'll dig no more for the cat the inspector unlocked the door and entered the office it was hot with the close heat of a room that had been locked up overnight just inside the door the inspector stopped and sniffed suspiciously no express office should have smelled like that one smelled one minute cried flannery pulling away from the inspector's grasp one a minute i have a hint there be a long-haired cat nearby once ye have been near one of them ye can never mistake them and go to cats i would know the symbol of them with me eyes shut tis a signal ye could tell in the dark 
He hurried to the back door. The cat was there, all right. A little deader than it had been, perhaps. But it was there on the step, long hair and all. Hurroo! shouted Flannery. And me thinking I would have never seen it again. Can ye smell the proof, Mr. Inspector? Tis a good strong proof for ye. And I should have knowed it all the while. Angora cats I know not to be the special species, and the long-haired breed of cats is not one I have associated with much, and cats so dang dead as this one I do not keep close to touch with generally, but all cats have a grand resemblance to cats. Look at this one. Now tis just like a cat. It came back. The Three Hundred there was a certain big sort of masterfulness about the president of the Interurban Express Company that came partly from his natural force of character and partly from the position he occupied as head of the company, and when he said a thing must be done, he meant it. In his own limited field, he was a bigger man than the president of the United States, for he was not only the chief executive of the Interurban Express Company, but he made its laws as well. He could issue general orders turning the whole operation of the road other end to as easily as a national executive could order the use of, let's say, a simplified form of spelling in a few departments of the government. He sat in the head office of the company at Franklin and said, let this be done. And in every suburban town where the interurban had offices, that thing was done, under pain of dismissal from the service of the company. Even Flannery, who was born rebellious, would scratch his red hair in the West Coat office and grumble and then follow orders. Old Simon Gratz came into the president's office one morning and sat himself into a vacant chair with a grunt of disapprobation, the same grunt of disapprobation that had been like saw filing to the nerves of the president for many years, and the president immediately prepared to contradict him regardless of what it might be that Simon Grotz disapproved of. It happened to be the simplified spelling. He waved the morning paper at the president and wanted to know what he thought of this outrageous thing of chopping off the tails of good old English words with an official carving knife, ruining a language that had been fought and bled for at Lexington and making it look like a dialect story or a woman with two front teeth out. It rather strained the president sometimes to think of a sound train of argument against Simon Gratz at a moment's notice. Sometimes he had to abandon the beliefs of a lifetime in order to take the other side of a proposition that Simon Gratz announced unexpectedly, and it was still harder to get up an enthusiasm for one side of a thing of which he had never heard, as he sometimes had to do but he was ready to meet Simon Gratz on either side of the simplified spelling matter, for he had already read about it himself in the morning paper. It had seemed a rather unimportant matter until Simon Gratz mentioned it, but now it immediately became a thing of the most intimate concern. What do you think? he asked. I think it's the grandest thing, the most sensible thing, the greatest step forward that has been taken for centuries. That is what I think. It's a revolution. That's what I think, Mr. Gratz. He swung around in his chair and struck his desk with his fist to emphasize his words. Mr. Gratz, whose opinions were the more obnoxious because he was a stockholder of the company, sniffed. He had a way of sniffing that was like a red rag to a bowl, and he meant it as such. The president accepted it in the spirit in which it was meant. He said, Bah! I will tell you what it is said Mr. Gratz, his chin up at the president. It is the most idiotic. Don't tell me, cried Mr. Smalley. I don't want you to tell me anything. What do you know about the English language anyhow? Gratz, that is a pretty name for a man who pretends to have a right to say how the English language shall be spelled. Don't I know your history, Mr. Gratz? Don't I know you and your name changed from Gratz and Steinberger? And you pretend to be worried because our president and the most talented men in the country want to drop a few useless letters out of a measly three hundred words. I tell you, these changes in spelling should have been made long ago. Long ago. This is the businessman's age, Mr. Grotz, and the rest of it. Yes, sir. And you, as a businessman, 
should be proud of this concession made by our most noted scholars to the needs of the businessman. Look at him, sneered Mr. Gratz, patting the list of three hundred revised words with his finger and shoving the newspaper under Mr. Smalley's nose. Poor bobtailed, one-eyed mongrels, progress. It is anarchy, impudence. Look at this, T-H-R-U. What kind of a word is that? T-H-O. What kind of a thing is that? What in the world is S-I-T-H-E? I would like to know. Mr. Smalley had not been sufficiently interested in the matter of new spelling to save his morning paper. He had not even read through the list of the three hundred words, but he was interested now. The spelling had become the thing most dear to his heart, and he pulled the paper from Mr. Gratz's hand and slapped the list of words warmly. Progress, yes, progress. That is the word. And economy, he cried. That is the true American spirit. That is what appeals to the man who is not a fossil. This was a delicate compliment to Mr. Gratz, but Mr. Gratz was so used to receiving compliments when Mr. Smalley was talking to him that he did not blush with pleasure. He merely got red in the face. Think of the advantage of saving one letter in every word that is written in every business office in America, continued Mr. Smalley excitedly. The ink saved by this company alone, by dropping those letters, will amount to a thousand dollars a year. And in the whole correspondence of the nation, it will amount to millions, millions of dollars in ink alone, to say nothing of the time saved. He got out of his chair and began to walk up and down the office, waving his arms. It helped him to get hot, and he liked to get hot when Mr. Gratz called. It was the only time he indulged himself, so he always got as hot as he could while he had the chance. "'Yes, sir!' he shouted while Mr. Gratz sat shrunken down into his chair and watched him with a teasing smile. "'And I will tell you something more. The policy of this company is to be economical. Yes, sir. And this company is going to adopt the simplified spelling.' going to adopt it right now, in spite of all the old fogeyism in the world. Miss Merrill. The office door opened, and a pompadour, followed by a demure young lady, entered the room. She slipped quietly into a chair beside the president's desk and laid her copy book on the side of the desk and waited while her employer arranged the words in his mind. Her pencil was delicately poised above the ruled page. While she waited, she hit the front of her pompadour a few improving slaps with her unengaged hand and pulled out the slack of her waist front. "'Take this,' said Mr. Smalley sharply. "'General order number—you can supply the number, Miss Merrill—to all employees of the Interurban Express Company. On and after this date, all employees of this company will use, in their correspondence and in all other official business— the following list of three hundred words, by order of the President. Read what you have there. Miss Merrill ran one hand around her belt. She was the kind of girl that can make her toilet and do business at the same time, and read. General order number 719. To all employees of the Interurban Express Company, on and after this date, all employees of this company will use, in their correspondence and in all other official business, the following list of three hundred words, by order of the President. Yes, said the President, tearing a strip from Mr. Gratz's newspaper that he held in his hand. Here is the list of words. I want the whole thing mimeographed, and I want you to see that a copy gets into the hands of every man and woman in our employ. All the offices, here and on the road, understand? Yes, sir, she answered. And then she arose, fixed her neck scarf, and went out. Mr. Smalley took his seat at his desk and began arranging his papers, humming cheerfully. Mr. Gratz rose and stalked silently out of the office. But when the door was closed behind him, he smiled. One of the members of the Simplified Spelling Board was his personal friend, Mr. Gratz had prevailed upon Mr. Smalley to adopt the new spelling, and he had done so by using the only means he could use with hope of success. The next day, Mike Flannery, the West Coast agent of the Express Company, was sitting at his desk in the Express office, carefully spelling out a letter to Mary O'Donnell, on whom his affections were firmly fixed. 
when he heard the train from Franklin whistle. He had time to read what he had written before he went to meet the train, and he glanced over the letter hastily. Dearest Mary O'Donnell, it said, reply in yours, I would say, I meant no harm when I kissed you last night. It did not mean you was no lady, but my feelings got much for me. I love you so, how was I to know you would not like it when I had never tried it on before? If you don't like it, I will let up on that after this, but it was the best kiss I ever had. He stopped to scratch out the part about its being the best kiss he had ever had, for that seemed, on second thought, not the best thing to say. And then, as lovers so often do, he tore the whole letter to bits and hurried to meet the train. End of Section 9 Mike Flannery On Duty and Off Part 1《Section 10 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mike Flannery, On Duty and Off, Part 2. The 300 Continued. Flannery came back with a few packages and a couple of the long official envelopes. He dumped the packages on his counter and tore open the first of the envelopes. It was a mimeograph circular and had that benzene odor that Flannery had come to associate with trouble, for it meant that a new rule that he must follow, or a change of rates that he must memorize, under penalty of dismissal. All orders were given under penalty of dismissal, and Flannery had so many rules and regulations under his red hair that each day he wondered whether he would still be the Westcote agent at the end of the next. As he read, his forehead wrinkled. General order number 719, he read slowly. And is it possible tis only the 719th of them I have been getting? I would have said it was the 47,000th general order I have had to learn and memorize. Whenever the president or the vice president or the manager or the janitor or the office boy at the head office has nothing else to do, they be thinking up a new general order to send to Flannery. What's the news of the day, says the president? Nothing doing, says the janitor. Then wake up and send Flannery a general order to learn and the Declaration of Independence by heart, says the president. Maybe he do be getting lazy. And shall I add on the Constitution of the United States, says the janitor? Sure, says the president. It'll do Flannery no harm to be busy. He held the paper out at arm's length and shook his head at it, and then slapped it down on the counter and gave it his attention. To all employees of the Interurban Express Company, he read, on and after this date all employees of this company will use in their correspondence and in all other official business and following list of 300 words by order of the president. Sure, he said under the penalty of dismissal from the service of the company, as you might be saying. He turned to the list of the three hundred words and began to read it. As he passed down the list, the frown on his brow deepened. At Anapest, it was a noticeable frown. At Apothem, it became very pronounced. And at Diuresis, his shaggy red brows nearly covered his eyes. He was frowning so hard. I wonder what the Interurban Express Company would like me to be writing them on the subject of ecumenical, he said. Maybe there be some of these here edile and eekish things coming by express, and twill be a fine thing to know how to spell them, when the consignee puts in a claim for damages. But if the company is going to carry many imponyms and esophaguses, Mike Flannery will be looking for another job. And would you look at this one? Paleography. Them be nice words to order the agents of the express company to be using. He pulled out a lock of his hair thoughtfully. I wonder now, he said. Do they want Mike Flannery to learn all them words by heart and use them all? Should I be using them all in one letter or distribute them throughout the correspondence? Or what? Tis a grand lot of words if I only knew what any of them meant. But twill be hard to find a subject to write on to run this word of homonym. 
There has not been one of them about the office since Mike Flannery has been here. But his duty was plain, and he took his varnish pot and pasted the list on the wall beside his desk where he could refer to it instantly, and then he slid onto his high stool to write the acknowledgment of the receipt of the list. Interurban Express Company, Franklin. Gentlemen, he wrote, I received General Order 719 and will obit, but I have to practice V and N a while first. Some of the words don't come natural to me offhand, like polyp and estivate. What is the rate on these if any come expressed? What's a antiology? Please advise me. Am I to use all these words or only some? Mike Flannery. He sealed this with the feeling that he had done well indeed for a first time. He had worked in practice VNN and expressed, and if the head office should complain that he had not used enough of the words on the list, he could point to polyp and estivate and etiology. It was slow work, for he had to look up each word he used before writing it to see whether it was on the list or not, but generally it was not and that gave him full liberty to spell it in any of the three or four simplified ways he was used to employing. Then he turned to his letter to Mary O'Donnell. His buoyancy was somewhat lessened in this second attempt by the necessity of looking up each word as he used it, and he was working his way slowly, and had just told her he was sorry he had kissed her. Kissed was in the three hundred, and that it had been because he had forgot himself. Forgot was in the list also. When a man entered the office and laid a package on the counter, Flannery slid from his stool and went to the counter. The man was Mr. Warold of Westcote Tag Company, and the package was a bundle of tags that he wished to send by express. They were properly done up, for Mr. Warold sent many packages by express. It was addressed to the Phoenix Sulphur Company, Amerville, P.A., it was marked collect and keep dry. It was a nice package, done up in a masterly manner, and the tags were to fill a rush order from the sulfur company. Flannery pulled the package across the counter and was about to drop it on the scales when the collect caught his eye, and he held out his hand to Mr. Warold. Have you brought the receipt book with you? he asked. Mr. Warold felt in his coat pocket. He had forgotten to bring the receipt book and Flannery drew a pad of blank receipts toward himself and dipped a pen into the ink. Then he looked at the address. P-H-O-E-N-I-X, he read slowly. That do be a queer sort of word, Mr. Warold. Phoenix. Is it a man's name? I don't know. Phoenix, pronounced Mr. Warold, grinning. Flannery was writing carefully with his tongue clasped firmly between his teeth, but he stopped and looked up. "'Tis an odd way to spell a word of that same pronunciation," he said, and then suddenly he laid down his pen and turned to the list of three hundred words that was pasted beside his desk. "'Oh, no!' he exclaimed when he had run his finger down the list, and then he ran it still farther and said it again, and more vigorously, and turned back to Mr. Worrell. He shook his head and pushed the package across to Mr. Worrell. "'Take it back home, Mr. Worrell.' he said, and change the spelling of the words on the address of it. Tis again the rules of the express company as it is. There be no O in the phoenix of the interurban express company. P-H-E-N-I-X is the approved and official spelling of the word, and the rules of the company is again letting any phoenixes with an O in them proceed into the official business of the company and the same of that sulfur word. It has been improved and fixed up according to general order number 719, and the way to spell it is S-U-L-F-U-R, and no other way goes across the counter of the express company whilst Mike Flannery runs it, and the express company will have none of your armorville, Mr. Worrell. There be no you in the word, as tis simplified by the order of the president of the interurban. Mr. Worrell looked at the package and then at Flannery and gasped. He was slow to anger and slow in all ways, and it took him fully two minutes to let Flannery's meaning trickle into his brain. Then he pushed the package across to Flannery again and laughed. 
"'That's all right,' he said. "'I read all about it in the simplified spelling in the papers, "'and if your company wants to adopt it, it is none of my business. "'But this has nothing to do with that. "'This is the name of a company, and the name of a town, "'and companies and towns have a right to spell their names as they choose. "'That, why, everybody knows that.' "'Sure, they have the right,' admitted Flannery pleasantly, "'but pushing the package slowly toward Mr. Worrell. "'Sure they have, but not in the express office of the inner urban. "'Tis again the rules to spell any phoenixes with an O in the express office, "'or any sulfurs with a PH, or any amours with a U. "'Them spellings and two hundred and ninety-seven more "'are again the rules and can't go.' Packages that has them on can't go. Nothing that has them in them or on them or about them can't go. General order number seven. Look here, said Mr. Worrell slowly. I tell you, Flannery, that those words are the names of a company. And I tell ye, said Flannery, holding the package away from him with a firm hand. That rules is rules. The general orders is worse than rules. And them spellings can't go. Mr. Worrell flushed. He put his hand opposite to Flannery's hand on the package and pushed with equal firmness. "'I offer this package for shipment,' he said, with a trace of anger beginning to show in his face. "'I offer it to you just as it is, spelled as it is, and without change or anything else. This express company is a common carrier, under the interstate commerce law, and it cannot refuse to take this package, spelling or no spelling.' that is the law i have no quarrel with the intercomra state law mr worrell sir said flannery with dignity and tis none of my business sir but the spelling of the english language is for tis my duty by general order number seven hundred and nineteen to spell three hundred words with the proper simplification and spell them i will and so will all that does business with mike flannery from seven a m till nine p m "'Words that is not in the three hundred ye may spell as ye please, Mr. Worrell, "'for there be no rule again it, "'and in conversation or correspondence with Mike Flannery, "'before the hour of seven and after the hour of nine, "'ye may spell as ye please, and I will do the same, "'for I then am off duty, but during the office hours "'the whole dang list from abridgment to warped "'must be spelled according to orders. "'Yes, sir. Polyp and dactyl, and the whole rest of them. So take the package and change the address like a good man. Mr. Worrell glared at Flannery, and then turned to the door. He took one or two stiff strides, and then turned back. Anger was well enough as a luxury, but the Phoenix Sulphur Company had telegraphed for the tags, and business was a necessity. The tags must go out by the first train. He leaned over the counter and smiled at Flannery. Flannery glared back. "'See here now, Flannery,' he said gently. "'You don't want to get in any trouble with the United States government, do you? And maybe get yourself and your president and every employee and officer of your company in jail for no one knows how long, do you? Well, then, just telegraph to your president and ask him whether he makes an exception in favor of the old spelling of names of companies.' "'Will you? That will do no harm. Tell him a package is offered, and tell him the address, and let him decide.' Flannery considered a moment, and then took his telegraph pad. "'President, Interurban Franklin,' he wrote. "'Shall I take package for Phoenix Sulphur Company, Almerdale? Answer quick, Westcote.' He ran across the street with it and came back. The head office had a direct wire— and the answer came a minute after Flannery reached the waiting Mr. Worrell. Westcote, give fuller particulars. Name consignor, contents, objection to receiving, signed Franklin. Flannery showed the message to Mr. Worrell, then took up his pen again. President, interurban Franklin, he wrote. Consignor Westcote Tag Company, tags in it. O is in Phoenix, and PH in Sulphur, and U in Armourdale, Westcote. The president, sitting in his private office, received the messages and wrinkled his brow as he read it. Telegraphing does not always improve the legibility of a message. 
As the message reached the president, it read, Consignor West Coat Tag Company, Tag Sis, in it, Ois in Phoenix, Finn Sulphur, Un Armordale. The president reached for his pile of various code books and looked up the strange words. He found Phoenix in one code book with its meaning given as extremely ill, death eminent. Oisin was not given, but the word oisinate was, and the meaning of that code stated to be five hundred head prime steers. It was enough. The interurban did not wish to accept the transportation of five hundred extremely ill steers, whose death was imminent. Westcote refused consignment absolutely. Write particulars, he wired. Flannery showed the telegram to Mr. Worrell, who would have sworn, if swearing had been his custom, but it was not. He took the package of tags and went back to his office and did the tags up in smaller bundles and sent them by mail with a special delivery stamp on each lot and charged the cost to Interurban. Then he wrote a long, fervid letter to the president of the Interurban, in which he gave his opinion of the simplified spelling and particularly of a man who would interpolate it into business by the power of his personal fiat. And Flannery wrote, too. President Interurban Franklin, he wrote. I sent Worrell away with his tags package as you say to. He is mad, I guess. He will try to make trouble. I told him we could not accept package, addressed to Phoenix Sulphur Company, Armordale, and it made him mad. No fault of mine. I asked him to leave out O out of Phoenix and to use F instead of PH in sulfur and to take that U out of Armordale, agreeable to General Order Number 719, and he won't do it. No fault of mine. I got to spell right when the rules say so. No fault of mine. I ain't making rules, I says to him. President of Interurban is responsible how we spell. I only spell as he says to. Flannery. The president received the two letters in the same mail. He read that of Mr. Worrell first, and when he came to a threat to sue the company, he frowned. This was all new to him. There was nothing in the letter about five hundred indisposed cattle of any kind. He looked up Flannery's telegrams, but they cast no light on it. Then he opened Flannery's letter and read it. He got up and began walking up and down his office, stopping now and then to shake the fist in which he had crumpled Flannery's letter. Then he called for Miss Merrill. She came carrying her notebook in one hand and fixing a comb in the back of her hair with the other. "'Take this,' said the president angrily. "'Flannery, Westcote.' He tramped back and forth, trying to condense all of the bitterness that had boiled into him into telling words. "'You are a fool.' he said at length, meaning Flannery and not Miss Merrill. Then he thought a while. Having said that, there was not much stronger that he could say. He had reached his climax too soon. Scratch that out, he said, and began walking again. He looked at Flannery's letter and scowled. Miss Merrill waited patiently. It gave her an opportunity to primp. Never mind, Miss Merrill, said the president finally. I will call you later. He was wondering whether he should discharge Flannery or issue Webster's unabridged as a general order number 720, or what he should do. And Flannery went on with his letter to Mary O'Donnell, for it was a work of several days with him. A love letter was alone enough to worry him, but when he had to think of things to say and still keep one eye on the list of 300 words, his thoughts got away from him before he could find whether they had to be put in simplified words or in the good, go-as-you-please English that he usually wrote. He was sitting at the desk when a messenger from the head office came in. The messenger had been sent down to Westcote by the president and had just been across to the tag company to fix things up with Mr. Worrell. He had fixed them, and the lever he had used was a paper he held in his hand. It had mollified Mr. Worrell. As the messenger entered, Flannery looked up from his letter, and he smiled with pleasure. He was glad to see someone from the head office. He wanted information about some of the words he was ordered to use. He was puzzled about S-T-R-I-P-T. Did it mean striped or stripped? 
And what was T-O-S-T, -T, the kind of toast you eat, or the kind you drink? And how about that funny combination of letters T-H-R-U and a dozen others? I'm glad to see the sight of ye, he said, holding out his hand, for I do be wantin' some help on these three hundred words the president has been simplifying down. Tis a terrible job they be, them three hundred. Some of them I've never will be after learnin'. Look at this now, he said, putting his finger on orthopedic. And this one, he said, touching esophagus. Them be tough ones. But it's thankful I am there be but three hundred of them. There would be no end to the day's work should the president take a notion to reform the whole dictionary. If he was to shorten all the words in the English language, I would have a long job of it, never knowing when the word was spelled right or wrong. They'd be a powerful increase of work, them three hundred words. Take this one now. T-H-O-R-O-L-Y. Tis a bird. That one is. But Flannery will stick to the list. The messenger laid the paper he had been holding upon Flannery's desk. I will be needin' an assistant should the president promulgate any more words like them, said Flannery. And I would recommend he be Corbett or Sullivan or one of the other sluggers, for the patrons of the company be not all easy goin' like Mr. Worrell. But progress is the word of the day, and I stand for shorter words, no matter how much extra work they make. The president has a great head on him. He opened the paper on his desk and read it. General Order Number 720. To all employees of the Interurban Express Company, cancel General Order Number 719 by order of the president. As I was saying, said Flannery, the president has a great head on him. Fleas will be fleas. Mike Flannery was the star boarder at Mrs. Muldoon's, and he deserved to be so considered, for he had boarded with Mrs. Muldoon for years, and was the agent of the Interurban Express Company at Westcote, while Mrs. Muldoon's other boarders were largely transient. Mike, said Mrs. Muldoon one noon, when Mike came for his lunch, I know the opinion ye have of Daggles, and never a one have I took into me house, and I think the same of them myself, dirty things and taking the bread away from the honest American laboring man, and I would not be thinking of taking one to board to that this day. But would you tell me this? Is a Frenchman a dago? Flannery raised his knife and laid down the law with it. Mrs. Muldoon, ma'am, he said, there be two kinds of Frenchmen. There be the respectable Frenchmen, and there be the unrespectable Frenchmen. They both be furriners, but they be class different. The respectable Frenchman is no worse than the Dutch, and is classed as Dutch, but the other kind is Dagos. There's no harm in the Dutch Frenchman, for them as such as Napoleon Bonaparte, and the like of him. But ye want to have nothing to do with the Dago French. They be a bad lot. There was a Frenchman asking, would I give him a room and board this morning? said Mrs. Muldoon. Flannery nodded knowingly. I knowed it, he cried. "'Twas apparent to me the minute ye spoke, ma'am. And again, the Dutch French have nothing to say. If he be a Dutch Frenchman, let him come. Was he that? Sure, I don't know, said Mrs. Muldoon, perplexed. He was a pleasant-spoken man enough. Tis a professor he is. There be many kinds of professors, said Mike. Sure, agreed Mrs. Muldoon. This one is a professor of fleas. Mike Flannery grinned silently at his plate. I have heard of him, too, he said, but tis of insects they be professors, and not of one kind of insects alone, Mrs. Muldoon, ma'am. Ye have mistook the understanding of what he was saying. I beg pardon to ye, Mr. Flannery, said Mrs. Muldoon with some spirit, but tis not mistook I am. Fleas, the professor said, and no mistake at all. Yes, required Flannery. Well, maybe tis so. He would be what you call one of them specialists. They do be doing that now, I hear. And tis probable the Frenchman has fleas for his specialty. Tis like this, ma'am. All professors is professors. Then a bunch of professors separate off from the rest and be professors of insects. 
and then the professors of insects separate up, and one is professor of flies, and another one is professor of pinch bugs, and another is professor of toads, and another is professor of lobsters, and so on until all the kinds of insects has each professor to itself, and then they call specialists, and each one knows more about his own kind of insect than any other man than the world knows, so maybe the Frenchman is professor of fleas, as ye say. I should think a grown man would want to be professor of something bigger than that, said Mrs. Muldoon, but there's no accounting for tastes. If ye understood, ma'am, said Mike Flannery, ye would not say that same for the flea professor. The flea is as big as a house. He studies them through a telescope, Mrs. Muldoon, that magnifies the flea a million times. The flea professor will take a dog with a flea on him, ma'am, and look at the same with his telescope, and the flea will be ten times the size of the dog. "'Tis wonderful!" exclaimed Mrs. Muldoon. "'Tis so," agreed Mike Flannery. "'But tis by magnifying the flea that the professor's able to study so small an insect for years and years, discovering new beauties every day. One day he will be studying the small toe of the flea's left hind foot, and the next day he will be making a map of it, and the next he will be taking a statue of it in plaster, and the next he'll be photographing it, and the next he'll be writing out all he has learned of it, and then he will be weeks and months corresponding with other flea professors in all parts of the world, seeing how what he has learned about the little toe of the flea's left hind foot agrees with what they have learned about it, and if they don't all agree, he goes at it again and does it all over again, and maybe he dies when he is ninety years old, and has only got one leg of the flea studied out, and then some other professor goes on where he left off, and takes up the next leg. And do they get paid for it? asked Mrs. Muldoon with surprise. Sure, they do, said Flannery. Good money, too. A good specialist professor gets more than an express agent, and is right they should he added generously. For tis by studying the feet of fleas and such, they learn about germs, and how to take out your appendix, and tis marriage a failure, and all that. Ye dumbfounder me, Mike Flannery, said Mrs. Muldoon. Ye should have been one of them professors yourself, with all that knowledge ye have, and ye think twould be a good thing to let the little Frenchman come and take a room? Twould be an honor to shake him by the hand, said Mike Flannery and so the professor was admitted to the board and lodging of Mrs. Muldoon. The name of the professor who, after a short and unfruitful season at Coney Island, took lodging with Mrs. Muldoon was Giacolino. He had shown his educated fleas in all the provinces of France and in Paris itself, but he made a mistake when he brought them to America. The professor was a small man and not talkative, he was, if anything, inclined to be silently moody, for luck was against him. He put his baggage in the small bedroom that Mrs. Muldoon allotted to him, and much of the time he spent in New York. He had fellow countrymen there, and he was trying to raise a loan, with which to buy a canvas booth in which to show his educated insects. He received the friendly advances of Flannery and the other boarders rather coldly. He refused to discuss his specialty, or show Mike the toe of the left hind foot of a flea through a telescope. When he remained at home after dinner, he did not sit with the other boarders on the porch, but walked up and down the sidewalk, smoking innumerable cigarettes and thinking, and waving his hands in mute conversations with himself. "'I don't know what ails the professor,' said Mrs. Muldoon one evening, when she and Flannery sat at the table after the rest had left it. Flannery hesitated. I would not like to say for sure, ma'am, he said slowly, but I'm a-thinkin' it's a loss he's had. Maybe that's preying on his mind. Ever since you told me, Mrs. Muldoon, that he was a professor of educated fleas, I have had doubts of the state of mind of the professor. The sense of studying the flea, ma'am, I can understand, that being the way of all professors does these days. But tis not human to spend time giving a flea a college education. 
the man that descends to be a tutor to a flea and teach it all the accomplishments from reading and writing to arithmetic and football maybe is peculiar i will say he's dang peculiar mrs muldoon begging your pardon is there any coffee left in the pot ma'am a bit mr flannery and you are welcome to it i understand the feeling that makes a man educate a horse like that dutchman i was reading about in the sunday paper the other day said mike and teaching it to read and figure and all that and i can see the sense of educating a pig as has been done as you well know ma'am for there be no doubt a man can love a horse or a pig as well as he can his own wife and why not a flea asked mrs muldoon tis natural for an irishman to love a pig if it is a pig worth lovin and tis natural i make no doubt for a dutchman to love a horse the same way and each to his own as the sayin is maybe the frenchman can learn to love the flea in the same way mr flannery i say the same mrs muldoon said flannery and i say the professor has done that same too i say he's educated the flea and maybe raised it from a baby and brung it from his native land ma'am and taught it and learnt to love it yes mrs muldoon but if the educated horse or the educated pig got loose would they be easy to find again or would they not ma'am and if the professor come to have a grand love for the flea he has raised by hand and taught like his own son and the flea run off from him would the educated flea be easy to find the horse and the pig is animals that is not easy to conceal themselves mrs muldoon but the flea is hard to find and when you have found him he is hard to put your thumb on i'm thinking the reason the professor is so down is that he has lost the flea of his heart poor man said mrs muldoon and the reason i'm thinking so said flannery slowly and leaning toward mrs muldoon across the table is that if i not be mistaken mrs muldoon the professor's educated flea spent last night with mike flannery mrs muldoon raised her hands with a gesture of wonderment and listen to that now she cried in astonishment mike flannery do you be thinking the professor has two of them sure he must have two of them for it was not meself thinking last night i had the same educated flea for a bedfellow i would have caught him she added sadly but he was too brisk for me there was forty-seven times i thought i had mine admitted flannery but every time when i took up me thumb you'd gone some other place but i will have him to-night but maybe he has gone by now said mrs muldoon never fear ma'am said flannery he's not gone ma'am for he has been close to me every minute of the day i could put me thumb on him this minute if he would but wait till i did it well as for that mike flannery said mrs muldoon mischievously as she rose from the table go along with ye and don't be bringing the blush to me face but i wouldn't want to find one i was speaking of i won't have to walk away from meself to find him this minute the train flea is one of nature's marvels everyone says so a bobby burns might well write a poem on this wee timorous cowering beastie except that the flea is not strictly speaking timorous or cowering a flea when it is in good health and spirits will not cower worth a cent it has ten times the bravery of a lion in fact one single little flea alone and unaided will step right up and attack the noisiest lion and never brag about it a lion is a rank coward in comparison with a flea for a lion will not attack anything that it has not a good chance of killing while the humble but daring flea will boldly attack animals it cannot kill and that it knows it cannot kill david had at least a chance to kill goliath but what chance has a flea to kill a camel none at all unless the camel commits suicide and dogs a flea will attack the most ferocious dog and think nothing of it at all i have seen it myself that is true bravery and not only that not only will one flea attack a dog but hundreds of fleas will attack the same dog at the same time i have seen that myself too and that multiplies the bravery of the flea just that much one flea attacking a dog is brave one hundred fleas attacking the same dog are therefore one hundred times as brave 
We really had to give the dog away. He was carrying so much bravery around with him all the time. Think of educating an animal with a brain about the size of the point of a fine needle. And that was what Professor Giacolino had done. The flea is really one of nature's wonders, like Niagara Falls, and Jojo the dog-faced man, and the canyon of the Colorado. Pole? For its size, the educated flea can pull ten times as much as the strongest horse. Jump? For its size, the flea can jump forty times as far as the most agile jackrabbit. Its hide is tougher than the hide of a rhinoceros, too. Imagine a rhinoceros standing in Madison Square in the city of New York, and suppose you have crept up to it and are going to pat it, and your hand is within one foot of the rhinoceros. And before you can bring your hand to touch the beast, suppose it makes a leap, and goes darting through the air so rapidly that you can't see it go, and that before your hand has fallen to where the rhinoceros was, the rhinoceros has alighted gently on top of the city hall at Philadelphia. That will give you some idea of the magnificent qualities of the flea. If we only knew more of these ordinary facts about things, we would love things more. At the breakfast table the next morning, Professor Giacolino sat silent and moody in his place, his head bent over his breakfast, but the nine other men at the table eyed him suspiciously. So did Mrs. Muldoon. There was no question now that Professor Giacolino had lost his educated flea. There was, in fact, ground for the belief that the professor had more than one educated flea, and that he had lost all of them. There was also a belief that, however well trained the lost might be in some ways, their manners had not been carefully attended to and that they had not been trained to be well-behaved when making visits to utter strangers, a beast or bird that will force itself upon the hospitality of an utter stranger unasked, and then bite its host, may be well-educated, but it is not polite. The boarders looked at Professor Giacolino and frowned. The professor looked stolidly at his plate, and ate hurriedly, and left the table before the others had finished. "'Tis in me mind,' said Flannery, when the professor had left. That the professor has a whole college of them educated insects, and that he do be letting them have a vacation. Or maybe the class of 1907 is graduated and turned loose from the university. I had the baseball team and the football gang spending the night with me. Ho, oh, said Hogan gruffly. T'was the fellies that does the high jumping and the long jump and the wide jump and having a meet on Hogan and I will be one of any ten of us to tell the professor to call the scholars back to the school again. I but be a plain uneducated man, Mrs. Muldoon, and I have no wish to speak disrespect of them as is educated, but the conversation of a gang of French-educated fleas is annoying to a man that wants to sleep. I will speak to the professor, gentlemen, said Mrs. Muldoon, and remonstrate with him. Marry me, girl, she added to the maid, who was passing her chair. Would ye mind giving me the least bit of a rub between me shoulders like? I will speak to the professor, for I have no doubt he has but to say the word to his scholars, and they'll all run back to where they belong. But the professor did not come back that day. He must have had urgent business in New York, for he remained there all night, and all the next day, too. And if he had not paid his bill in advance— Mrs. Muldoon would have suspected that he had run away, but his bill was paid and his luggage was still in the room, and the educated fleas, or their numerous offspring, explored the boarding house at will and romped through all the rooms as if they owned them. If Professor Giacolino had been there, he would have had to listen to some forcible remonstrances. It was Flannery who at length took the law into his own hands. It was late Sunday evening, the upper hall was dark, and Flannery stole softly down the hall in his socks and pushed open the professor's door. The room was quite dark, and Flannery stole into it and closed the door behind himself. He drew from his pocket an insect powder gun and fired it. It was an instrument something like a bellows, and it fired by a simple squeeze, sending a shower of powder that fell in all directions. It was a light yellow powder, and Flannery deluged the room with it. He stole stealthily about, shooting the curtains, shooting the bed, 
shooting the picture of the late Mr. Timothy Muldoon, shooting the floor. He bent down and shot under the bed and under the washstand until a film of yellow dust lay over the whole room, and then he turned to the closet and opened that. There hung Professor Giacolino's other clothes, and Flannery jerked them from the hooks and carried them at arm's length to the bed and shot them. As he was shooting into the pocket of a pair of striped trousers, the door opened, and Professor Giacolino stood on the threshold. There was no doubt in the professor's mind. He was being robbed. He drew a pistol from his pocket and fired. The bullet whizzed over the bending Flannery's head, and before the professor could fire a second time, Flannery rose and turned, and with a true aim shot the professor, shot him full in the face with the insect powder, and before the blinded man could recover his breath or spit out the bitter dose or wipe his eyes, Flannery had him by the collar and had jerked him to the head of the stairs. It is true, he kicked him down the stairs, not insultingly or with bad feeling, but in a moment of emotional insanity, as the defense would say. There was an extenuating circumstance, and excuses Flannery, but the professor, being a foreigner, could not see the fine point of the distinction and was angry. That night the professor did not sleep in Westcote, but the next afternoon he appeared at Mrs. Muldoon's, supported by Monsieur Jules, the well-known Seventh Avenue restaurateur, and Monsieur Renaud, who occupies an important post as garçon in Monsieur Jules' establishment. "'For the kick,' said the professor, "'I care not. I have been kicked before. The kick by one gentleman, him I resent him, I revenge. The kick by the base him I scorn. I let the kick go. Madame Muldoon, of the kick I say not at all, but the flea, ah, the poor flea, excuse the weep, Madame Muldoon. The professor wept into his handkerchief, and the two men looked seriously solemn and patted the professor on the back. Ah, my Alphonse, the flea, the poor little flea, they cried. For the flea I have the revenge, cried the professor fiercely. How you say it? I will be to have the revenge. I would be to the revenge having. The revenge to having will I be. Him I will have that revenge business. For why I bring the educate flea to those states united? Is it that they should be deathed? Is it that a flannery should make them dead with a with such a thing like a popgun? For it is these things I educate, I teach, I culture, I love. I cherish those flea. It is for these things I give up wife and patrie and immigrate myself out of dear France. No, my jewels, no, my Jacques, no, my madame. I am one heart busted. Ah, now, professor, said Mrs. Muldoon soothingly, don't bawl any more. There is sure no use in brawling over spilled milk. If they be dead, they be dead. I wouldn't cry over a million dead fleas. The American fleas, no said the professor haughtily. The Irish flea, no. The flea are natural, no. But the educate flea of la belle France. The flea I have love and teach and make like a sister and a sweetheart to me. The flea that have act up in front of the crowned heads of Spain. That have traveled on the ocean, that traveled on the land. Ah, Madame Muldoon, it is no common bunch of flea. Of my busted feelings, I will say, nothings. Of my banged-up heart, what will I say? Nothings. But for those dead fleas, those poor dead flea, so innocent, so harmless, so much money worth, for those must be Monsieur Flannery's compensate. As the professor's meaning dawned on Mrs. Muldoon, a look of amazement spread over her face. And would you be making poor Mike Flannery pay good money for them rascal fleas he killed? and him with his ankles so bit up they look like smallpox, to say nothing of the other folks which is the same, she cried. Tis a shame ye should be, Mr. Professor, bringing fleas into America and letting them run loose. Ye should muzzle them, Mr. Professor, if ye would turn them out to pasture in the boarding house of poor witty woman, and no end of trouble and worry, and every one saying, why did ye let the dago come for anyhow? The professor and his friend sat silent under this attack, and when it was finished they arose. "'Be so kind,' said the professor politely. 
to tell the flannery the ultimatum of monsieur the professor jacolino one hundred educate french flea i have bring to the states united the progeny i do not say one milliard two milliard how many is those progeny i do not know but of him i speak not let him go i make the flannery a present of those progeny for those one hundred fine educate french flea he must pay one dollar per each educate flea must be pay that flannery it is the ultimatum i come sunday at half past one on the clock that flannery will the money ready have or the law will be on him it is sufficient the three compatriots bowed low and went away for fully five minutes mrs muldoon sat in a sort of stupor and then she arose and went about her work after all it was flannery's business and none of hers but she wished the men had gone to flannery instead of delegating her to tell him thief of the world exclaimed flannery when she told him the demand the professor had made sure i have put me foot in this time mrs muldoon for kill them i did and pay for them i must but i dare say it will be no fun to do it one hundred dollars per flea ma'am did ever an irishman pay the like before one week ago mike flannery would not have give one dollar for all the fleas in the world but have to is a horse a man must ride whether he wants to or no but the more flannery thought about having to pay out one hundred dollars for one hundred dead insects the less he liked it and the more angry he became it could not be denied that one dollar was a reasonable price for a flea that had had a good education a man could hardly be expected to take a raw country flea as you might say and educate it and give it graces and teach it dancing and all the accomplishments for less than a dollar but one hundred dollars was a lot of money too if it had been a matter of one flea flannery would have not worried but to pay out one hundred dollars in a lump for a flea slaughter hurt his feelings he did not believe the fleas were worth the price and he inquired diligently seeking to learn the market value of educated fleas there did not seem to be any market value one thing only he learned and that was that the government of the united states in congress assembled had recognized that insects have a value he found in the list of customs duties this insects not crude one quarter cent per pound and ten per cent ad valorem as flannery leaned over his counter at the office of the interurban express company and spelt this out in the book of customs duties he frowned but as he looked at it his frown changed to a smile and from a smile to a grin and he shut the book and put it in his pocket he was ready to meet the professor good day to yous he said cheerfully when he went into the little parlor on sunday afternoon and found the professor sitting there flanked by his two fellow countrymen i have come to pay ye the hundred dollars mrs muldoon was telling me about the professor bowed and said nothing the two gentlemen from seventh avenue also bowed and they too said nothing i'm glad you spoke about it said flannery good-naturedly for it is always a pleasure to mike flannery to pay his honest debts and i might not have thought of it if he had not mentioned it i was thinking them was nothing but common ignorant fleas professor ah oh, no cried the professor they very educate flea the flea of wisdom very teached flea hear that now said flannery and did they really come all the way from france professor or is this a joke you're playing on me the truly french flea explained the professor from paris herself the genuine the import flea and to think you brought them all the way yourself professor for you did i believe certain cried all three and to think a flea being worth a dollar said flannery them can't be crude fleas at such a price professor no certain no cried the three men again not crude said flannery and imported by the professor tis odd i should have seen a reference to them things this very day professor tis in this book here he took the list of custom duties from his pocket and leaned his elbows on his knees and ran his hand down the pages cattle if less than one year old per head two dollars all other if valued less than fourteen dollars per head three dollars and seventy-five cents 
if valued more than fourteen dollars per head, twenty-seven and one-half percent, read Flannery. Sure, fleas does not count as cattle, Professor, nor does they come in as swine, the duty on which is one dollar and fifty cents per head. I know the pig, and I'm acquainted with the flea, and there is a difference between them that any one would recognize. Nor do they be horses and mules, nor yet sheep. Some might count them in, as all other live animals, not otherwise specified, twenty per cent. But was not here I saw the reference to them. Fish, he read. The flea is no more fish than I am. He turned the pages and continued down that wonderful list that embraces everything known to man. The three Frenchmen sat on the edges of their chairs, watching him eagerly. Ho, ho, Flannery sang out at length. Here it is. Insects, not crude. One quarter per cent per pound and ten per cent ad valorem. What is ad valorem? I don't know. But tis a wonderful thing. The tariff is... Who'd be thinking ten years ago that Professor Jacolino would be coming to America with one hundred fleas not crude in his dress suit portmanteau? But the Congress was the boy to think of everything. No free fleas, says they. Look at the poor American flea, crude and uneducated, and see the struggle it has, competing with the fleas of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Down with the fur and flea, says Congress. Protect the poor American insect. One quarter per cent per pound and ten per cent ad valorem for the flea of Europe. Mike Flannery brought his hand down on the book he held, and the three men who had been watching him with a fascinated stare jumped nervously. That's what Congress says, said Flannery, glaring at the professor. But up jumps the senator from California. Stop, he says, wait. "'Tis all right enough for the East to rule out the flea, "'but the Californian loves the flea like a brother. "'We want free fleas.' "'Then up jumps the senator from New York. "'I don't object to the plain or crude flea coming in free,' says he, "'for there be need of them. "'As me friend from the West says, "'What amusement would the dogs of the nation have but for the flea?' says he. "'But I'm thinking of the seventy-three theaters on and off Broadway,' says he. "'Shall the amusement industry of the metropolis suffer "'from the incoming of millions of educated and trained fleas of Europe? "'Shall Shakespeare and Belasco and Shaw be put out of business "'by the pauper flea theaters of Europe? "'No,' says he. "'I move to amend the tariff of the United States to read "'that the duty on insects, not crude, be one-fourth of a cent per pound, and ten per cent ad valorem, he says, which will give the dog all the crude fleas he wants, and yet shut out the educated flea from competition with Grand Opera and Barnum Circus. And so t'was voted, concluded Mike Flannery. Monsieur Jules fidgeted and looked at his watch. Be easy, said Flannery. There's no hurry. I'm waiting for a friend of mine. "'and tis fine to talk over the tariff "'with educated men once in a while. "'The friend I'm looking for any minute now "'is a fine expert on the subject of the tariff himself. "'O'Halloran is the name of him. "'He is as the second deputy assistant collector "'of evidence of fraud and smuggling "'in the revenue service of the United States. "'Twas a mere matter of doubt in me mind,' "'said Flannery easily.' Regarding the proper valuation of the professor's fleas, I was thinking maybe one dollars was not enough to pay for a flea, not crude, so I asks O'Halloran. "'Twill be easy to settle that,' says O'Halloran, for the value of them will be set down in the books of the United States, and the time with the professor paid the duty on him, I'll just be looking and see how much the duty was paid on,' says he. "'But maybe the professor paid no duty on them,' he says. "'Make no doubt of that,' says O'Halloran, "'for unless the professor was a fool, "'he would pay the duty like a man, "'for the penalty is a fine and imprisonment,' says O'Halloran. "'And I make no doubt he paid it. "'I will be out on Sunday at four, says O'Halloran, "'and give ye the facts, "'and I hope the duty is paid as it should be, "'for if it is not paid, "'twill be me duty to arrest the professor and—' Flannery stopped and listened. 
"'Is that the train from the city, I hear?' he said. "'O'Halloran will sure to be on it.' The professor arose, and so did the two friends who had come with him to help him carry home the one hundred dollars. The professor slapped himself on the pockets, looked in his hat, and slapped himself on the pockets again. "'Mon Dieu!' he exclaimed, and in an instant he and his friends were in an excited conversation that went at the rate of three hundred words a minute. Then the professor turned to Flannery. "'I return,' he said. "'I have lost the most valued thing, the picture of dear mamma. It is lost. It is picked of the pocket. Villains, I go to the police. I return.' He did not wait for permission, but went, and that was the last Mike Flannery or Mrs. Muldoon ever saw of him. "'And to think me a free trader every day of me born life,' said Mike Flannery that evening to Mrs. Muldoon. "'But I be so no more. I see the protection there is in the protective tariff, Mrs. Muldoon, ma'am.'" End of Section 10 Mike Flannery on and off duty Section 11 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Water Goats and Other Troubles, Part 1. The Water Goats. And then, said the landscape gardener, combing his silky pointed beard gently with his long artistic fingers, in the lake you might have a couple of gondolas. Two would be sufficient for a lake of this size. Amply sufficient, yes, he said firmly. I would certainly advise gondolas. They look well, and the children like to ride on them, and so do the adults. I would have two gondolas in the lake. Mayor Dugan and the city council, meeting as a committee of the whole to receive the report of the landscape gardener and his plan for the new public park, nodded their heads sagely. Sure, said Mayor Dugan. We want two of them. Two of them gone, them gone. Gondolas, said the landscape gardener. Sure, said Mayor Dugan. We want two of them. Remember the gondolas, Tooley. I have them fast in me mind, said Tooley. I will not let them get away, Dugan. The landscape gardener stood a minute in deep thought, looking at the ceiling. Yes, that is all, he said. My report and the plan, and what I have mentioned, will be all you need. Then he shook hands with the mayor and with all the city councilmen and left Jeffersonville forever, going back to New York, where landscape gardeners grow and the doors were opened and the committee of the whole became once more the regular meeting of the city council. The appropriation for the new park was rushed through in twenty minutes, passing the second and third readings by the reading of the title under a suspension of the bylaws and being unanimously adopted. It was a matter of life and death with Mayor Dugan and his ring. Jeffersonville was getting tired of the joyful grafters, and murmurs of discontent were concentrating into threats of a reform party to turn the cheerful rascals out. The new park was to be a sop thrown to the populace, something to make the city proud of itself and grateful to its mayor and council. It was more than a pet scheme of Mayor Dugan. It was a lifeboat for the ring. In half an hour the committees had been appointed, and the mayor turned to the regular business. Then from his seat at the left of the last row, little Alderman Tooley arose. "'Mr. Mayor,' he said, "'how about them, them, dom thing dongolas?' whispered Alderman Gravemeyer hoarsely. "'Gondolas!' "'How about them gondolas, Mr. Mayor?' asked Alderman Tooley. "'Sure,' said the mayor. Will anyone move that we get two dongolas to put in the lake for the kids to ride on? Will anyone move that Alderman Tooley be a committee of one to get two dongolas to put in the lake? I make dot motions, said Alderman Gravenmeyer, half rising his great bulk from his seat and sinking back with a grunt. Second the motion, said Alderman Tooley. Move seconded, said the mayor, that Alderman Tooley be a committee to buy two dongolas to put in the leg for the kids to ride on. Ye've heard the motion. The motion was unanimously carried. That was the kind of city council Mayor Dugan had chosen. When little Alderman Tooley dropped into Casey's saloon that night on his way home, 
he did not slip meekly to the far end of the bar as he usually did. For the first time in his aldermanic career, he had been put on a committee where he would really have something to do, and he felt the honor. He boldly took a place between the big mayor and Alderman Gravemeyer, and said, One of the same, Casey. With the air of a man who has matters of importance on his mind, he felt that things were coming his way. Even the big mayor seemed to appreciate it, for he put his hand affectionately on Tooley's shoulder. Mike, said the mayor, about them dongolas now. Have ye thought any about where ye begin em? I have not, said Tooley. I was a thinkin' twould be good to think it over a bit, Dugan. Maybe twould be best to get them at Chicago. He looked anxiously at the mayor's face, hoping for some sign of approval or disapproval. But the mayor's face was noncommittal. But maybe it wouldn't, concluded Tooley. As a feeler, he added, Would you be wantin' me to have them made here, Dugan? The big mayor patted Tooley on the shoulder indulgently. It's up to you, Mike, he said. You know the way Duggan does things and the way he likes em them done. I trust them that I can trust. And when I put a man on a committee, I'm done with the thing, of course, he added, putting his mouth close to Tooley's ear and winking at Gravemire. Ye will see that there's a rake-off for me in the buys. Sure, said Tooley. The big mayor turned back to the bar and took a drink from his glass. Gravemire took a drink from his glass also. So did Tooley, gravely. Dugan wiped his mouth on the back of his hand and turned to Tooley again. Mike, he said, what do you think? Maybe twould do as well to get a couple of second-hand dongolas and have them painted up. If they was in pretty good shape, no one would note the difference, and twould make a bit more of a rake-off for the buys, maybe. The same word was on the end of me tongue, Dugan, said Tooley, nodding his head slowly. I was considering this very minute where I could lay me hands on a couple of pretty good dongolas that has not been used much. Flanagan could paint them up fine. Or Stoltzenau could do such paintings, interposed Gravemeyer. Sure, agreed the big mayor. He toyed with his glass a moment. Mike, he said suddenly, what the devil's a dongola anyhow? Mike Tooley was just raising his glass to his lips with the movements of one accustomed to hold conversation with the mayor. His left hand rested on his hip with his arm akimbo, and his hat was tipped carelessly to the back of his head. The hand raising the glass stopped short where it was when he heard the mayor's question. He frowned at the glass, scowled at it angrily. A dongola, Dugan, he said slowly and stopped. A dongola, he repeated. A dongola. Did ye ask me what a dongola might be, Dugan? The big mayor nodded, and Grevemeyer leaned forward to catch the answer. Casey, too, leaned on his bar and listened. Alderman Tooley raised his glass to his lips and filled his mouth with the liquor. Instantly, he dashed the glass furiously to the floor. He jerked off his hat and cast it into a far corner and pulled off his coat, throwing it after his hat. He was climbing onto the bar when the big mayor and Grevemeyer laid their hands on the little man and held him tightly. The big mayor shook him once and set him on the floor. Mike, said the big mayor, what's the matter with ye? What are you going after Casey that way for? Is it crazy ye are? Or have ye gone insane? Knockout drops, shouted Tooley, shaking his fist at Casey, who looked down at him in astonishment. Knockout drops! I will have the law on ye, Casey! I will have the joint closed. I'll teach ye to be given knockout drops to the aldermen of the city. Mike, cried the big mayor, giving him another vigorous shake. Shut up, would ye? Casey wouldn't be giving you anything that wasn't good for ye. Casey wouldn't be giving you knockout drops. No, whispered Mike angrily. No, wouldn't he, Dugan? And what has he done to me memory, then, Dugan? What has he put into the drink to rob me of me memory? One minute ago I knew as well as any other man what a dongola was like, and now I have no memory of any dongolas at all. One minute ago I could have told you the whole history of dongolas, from the time of Adam up till now, and I have drawn a picture of one that any one could recognize, and now I wouldn't know one if he was to show it to me. I was about to tell you the whole history of dongolas, Dugan. T'was on the end of me tongue to give you a talk on dongolas when I took a drink. "'Ye saw me take a drink. Grevemeyer?' "'Yeah,' 
said Gravemire, holding his head solemnly. You took such a drink. Sure, said Tooley, arranging his vest. Gravemire saw me take the drink, and now I have no memory of Dongles at all. If he wasn't to show me a chromo of one, I wouldn't know it as a Dongla or what. I'm ashamed of ye, Casey. If ye done it, Casey, ye had not to have done it, said Dugan, reprovingly. The mind of him might be ruined entirely. Stop, Dugan, said Tooley hastily. I forgive him. Me mind will likely be all right by morning. Tis pretty good yet, except on the subject of Donglas. I'm temporarily out of remembrance what Donglas is. Tis odd how them knockout drops works, Gravemire. Yeah, said the alderman unsuspectingly. Giving such a forgetfulness on such easy things as Donglas. Sure. You tell Dugan what Donglas is, Gravemire, said Tooley quickly. Gravemire looked at his glass thoughtfully. His mind worked slowly always, but he saw that it would not do for him to have knockout drops so soon after Tooley. Ach! he exclaimed angrily. You are insulting me with such questions, Tooley. So much I will tell you. Never ask Germans what a Donglas. It is not for Germans to talk about such things. Ask Casey. Casey scratched his head thoughtfully. Donglas, he repeated. I've heard the word, Gravemire. Wait a bit. Tis something about shoes. Sure I remember now. Was Dongle a shoes. One of me kids had last winter, and no good they were, too. Dongle's is shoes, Gravemire. Laced shoes. Dongle's is laced shoes. The big mayor leaned his head far back and laughed long and loud. He pounded on the bar with his fist and slapped Tooley on the back. Lace shoes, he cried, wiping his eyes, and then he became suddenly serious. "'Twould not be shoes, Casey, he said gravely. Them dongolas was recommended by the landscape gardener from New York. "'Twould not be sensible to recommend us a pair of lace shoes in the park for the kids to ride on. "'Twould not seem so, said Tooley, shaking his head wisely. "'I wished me mind was like it always is. Tis a pity.' "'Stop,' cried Casey. "'I have it.' Them was kid shoes. Them donglas was kid shoes. So said Casey, said Dugan. For the kid. No, said Casey, of the kid. Sure, said Gravemire. So it is. The shoes of the child. Right free, exclaimed Casey. The shoes of the kid. Twas kid leather they were made out of, Dugan. The dongola is some fancy kind of goat. A box calf is the skin of the calf of the box cow. The dongola is some foreign kind of a goat, Dugan. Ho oh, hoo! cried Tooley suddenly, knocking his forehead with the knuckles of his fist. The three men turned their eyes upon him and stared. What ails you now, Mike? asked Dugan disgustedly. Ho! Oh, he cried again, slapping himself on top of his head. Me mind is coming back to me, Dugan. The effects of the knockout drops is wearing off. I recall now that the dongola is some fancy kind of goat. "'Twill all come back to me soon. "'Go along with ye,' exclaimed Dugan. "'Would you be putting a goat in the lake for the kids to ride on?' "'Sure,' said Tooley enthusiastically. "'Sure I would, Dugan. "'Though not the common goat, I wouldn't. "'But the dongola goats, I would. "'Have ye heard of dongola water goats, Casey? "'Was them dongola goatskin shoes warranted to be waterproof?' "'Casey wrinkled his brow. "'Tis like they was, Tooley.' he said doubtfully. "'Tis like they was warranted to be, but they wasn't.' "'Sure,' cried Tooley joyously. "'Tis the waterproof the skin of the dongla water goat is, like the skin of the duck. And swim? A duck isn't in it with a water goat. I remember seeing them in old Ireland when I was a boy, Dugan, swimming in the lake of Killarney. Ah, oh, twas a pretty picture.' "'I seem to remember them myself,' he said. Not clear, but a bit. Sure ye do, cried Tooley. Many's the time I've rode across the lake on the back of a dongola. Me own father, who was a big man in the old country, used to keep a pair of them for us children. Twas himself fetched them from Donegal, Dugan. Twas from Donegal they got the name of them. And twas the name ye give them that misled me. Donagoras is what we called them in the old country. Donagoras from Donegal. I remember the two of them I had when I was a kid, Dugan. One was a nanny and one was a billy, and... Go on home, Mike, said Dugan. 
go on home and sleep it off. And the little alderman from the fourth ward picked up his hat and coat and obeyed his orders. Instituting a new public park and seeing that in every purchase and every contract there is a rake-off for the ring is a big job, and between this and the fight against the rapidly increasing strength of the Reform Party, Mayor Dugan had his hands more than full. He had no time to think of Dongolas. He did not want to think of them. Tooley was the committee on Dongolas, and it was his duty to think of them, and to worry about them, if any worry was necessary. But Tooley did not worry. He sat down and wrote a letter to his cousin Dennis, official keeper of the zoo in Idlewild Park at Franklin, Iowa. Dear Dennis, he wrote, Have you any Dongola goats in your menagerie? For I want to right away. Good strong ones. Answer right away your affectionate cousin, Alderman Michael Tooley. P.S. Money no object. When Dennis Tooley received this letter, he walked through his zoo and considered his animals thoughtfully. The shop-worn brown bear would not do to fill Cousin Mike's order. Neither would the weather-worn red deer nor the family of variegated tame rabbits. The zoo of Idlewild Park at Franklin was woefully short of dongola goats. In fact, to any but the most imaginative and easily pleased child, it was lacking in nearly everything that makes a zoo a congress of the world's most rare and thrilling creatures. After all, the nearest thing to a goat was a goat, and goats were plenty in Franklin. Dennis felt an irresistible longing to aid Mike, the longing that comes to any healthy man when a request is accompanied by the legend, Money No Object. He wrote that evening to Mike. Dear Mike, he wrote, I've got two good strong dongola goats I can let you have cheap. I am overstocked with dongolas today. I want to get rid of two. Zoo is getting too crowded with all kinds of animals, and I don't need so many dongola goats. I will send you two for fifty dollars, a piece. What do you want them for? Your affectionate cousin, Dennis Tooley, zookeeper. P.S. Crates Extra. Casey! said Mike to his friend, the saloon keeper, when he received this communication. "'Tis just as I told ye. Dongolas is goats. I've been correspondin' with one of the celebrated animal men regarding the Dongola water goat, and I have me eye on two of them this very minute. But will be expensive, Casey. Mighty expensive. The Dongola water goat is a rare bird, Casey, and they have become extinct in the lakes of Ireland, and what few of them is left in the world is held at outrageous prices. In the letter I have from the animal man, Casey, he wants two hundred dollars apiece for each dongle a water goat, and twill be no easy thing for him to get them. Hasn't he them in his shop, Mike? asked Casey. He has not, Casey, said the little alderman. He has no place for them. Cages he has, and globes for goldfish, and bird cages but the size of the shop has no room for an aquarium, Casey. He has no tank for the preservation of water goats. Hippopotamuses and alligators and crocodiles and dongola water goats and sea lions he does not keep in stock, Casey, but sends out and catches them when ordered. He writes that his agents has their eyes on two fine dongolas, and he has telegraphed them to catch them. Are they nearby, Mike? asks Casey, much interested. Nah, said Tooley. "'Twill be some time till I get them. The last he heard of them, they were swimming in the lake of Geneva. Is that far, the lake? asked Casey. I disremember how far, said Tooley. "'Tis in Africa or Asia, or maybe tis Constantinople. One of them countries it is, anyhow. But to his cousin Dennis he wrote, "'Dear Dennis, I'll take them to Dongolas. Crate them good and solid. Do not send them till I tell you. Send the bill to me.' Your affectionate cousin alderman, Michael Tooley. P.S. Make bill for two hundred dollars apiece. Business is business. This is between us two. M.T. A keeper of water goats had been selected with the utmost care, combining in the choice practical politics with a sense of fitness. Timothy Fagan was used to animals. For years he had driven a dump cart. He was used to children. He had ten or eleven of his own and he controlled several votes in the fourth ward. His elevation from the dump cart of the street cleaning department to the high office of keeper of the water goats 
was one that Dugan believed would give general satisfaction. When the goats arrived in Jeffersonville, the two heavy crates were hauled to Alderman Tooley's backyard to await the opening of the park, and there Mayor Dugan and goatkeeper Fagan came to inspect them. Alderman Tooley led the way to them with pride, and Mayor Dugan's creased brow almost uncreased as he bent down and peered between the bars of the crates. They were fine goats. Perhaps they looked somewhat more dejected than a goat usually looks, more dirty and down at the heels than a goat often looks, but they were undoubtedly goats. As specimens of ordinary Irish goats, they might not have passed muster with a careful buyer, but no doubt they were excellent examples of the Dongola. "'Ye have done good, Mike,' said the mayor. "'Ye have done good. But ain't they a bit off their feed, or something?' "'Off their feed?' said Tooley. "'And who wouldn't be poor things? Mind ye, Dugan. Them is not common goats. Them is Dongolas, and used to be in the water continuous from morning till night. Tis suffering for a swim they be, poor animals.' Once them get in the lake, and ye will see the difference, Dugan. Twill make all the difference in the world to them. Tis dying for a swim they are. Sure, said the gatekeeper of the water goats. You've done good, Mike, said the mayor again. Them gondolas will be a big surprise for the people. They were. They surprised the keeper of the goats first of all. The day before the park was to be opened to the public, the goats were taken to the park and turned over to their official keeper. At eleven o'clock that morning, Alderman Tooley was leaning against Casey's bar, confidently pouring into his ear the story of how the Dongolas had given their captors a world of trouble, swimming violently to the far reaches of Lake Geneva and hiding among the bulrushes and reeds. When the swinging door of the saloon was banged open and Tim Fagan rushed in, he was mad, he was very mad, but he was a great deal wetter than mad. He looked as if he had been soaked in water overnight and not wrung out in the morning. Mike, he whispered hoarsely, grasping the little alderman by the arm. I want ye, I want ye down at the park. A chill of fear passed over Alderman Tooley. He turned his face to Fagin and laid his hand on his shoulder. Tim, he demanded, has anything happened to the Dongolas? Has anything happened to the Dongolas? exclaimed Fagin sarcastically. Is anything wrong with them water goats? Oh, no, Tooley. Nothing's gone wrong with them. Only they won't go in the water, Mike. Is anything gone wrong with them, do you say? Nothing. They be in good health, but they're not crazy to be swimming. The way they do not hanker to dash into the water is marvelous, Mike. No water for them. This said Tooley uneasily, glancing around to see that no one but Casey was in hearing. Maybe you've not started them right, Tim. Maybe not said Fagin angrily. Maybe I do not know how to start the water goat, Tooley. Maybe there's one way unbeknownst to me. If so, I have not tried it. But the four seven other ways I have tried, and the goats will not swim. I've started them backwards, and I've started them frontwards, and I've took them by the horns and give them lessons to swim, and they will not swim. I've done me duty by them, Mike, and I have wrestled with them, and rolled in the lake with them, "'Was it to be swimming teacher to water goats you got me this job for?' "'Hist,' said Tooley again. "'Not so loud, Tim. "'Ye haven't told Dugan, have ye? "'I have not,' said Tim with anger. "'I have not told anybody anything except them goats, "'and what I told them is not decent hearing. "'I have conversed with them in strong language, and it done no good. "'No swimming for them. "'Come on down and have a chat with them yourself, Tooley. "'Come on down and argue with them.' and persuade them with the soft sound of your voice to swim. Come on down and get them water goats used to the water. You don't understand the water goat, Tim, said Tooley in gentle reproof. I will show you how to handle them. And he went out, followed by the wet keeper of the water goats. The two water goats stood at the side of the lake, wet and mournful, tied to two strong stakes. They looked weary and meek, for they had a hard morning, but as soon as they saw Tim Fagan, they brightened up. They arose simultaneously on their hind legs, and their eyes glittered with deadly hatred. They strained at the ropes, and then suddenly, panic-stricken, they turned and ran, bringing up at the ends of their ropes with a shock that bent the stout stakes to which they were fastened. They stood still and cowered, trembling. "'Lay hold!' commanded Tooley. "'Lay hold of a horn of the brute till I show you how to make him swim.' 
Through the fresh gravel of the beach, the four feet of the reluctant goat plowed deep furrows. It shook its head from side to side, but Tully and Fagin held it fast, and into the water it went. Now, cried Alderman Tully, get behind and push, Tim. One, two, three, push! Alderman Tully released his hold, and keeper of the water goats Fagin pushed. Then they tried the other goat. It was easier to try the other goat than to waste time hunting up the one they had just tried, for it had gone away. As soon as Alderman Tooley let it go, it went. It seemed to want to get to the other end of the park as soon as possible. But it did not take a shortcut across the lake. It went around. But it did not mind travel. It went to the farthest part of the park, and it would have gone farther if it could. So Alderman Tooley and Keeper Fagin tried the other water goat. That one went straight to the other end of the park. It swerved from a straight line but once, and that was when it shied at a pail of water that was in the way. It did not seem to like water. In the Franklin Zoo, Dennis Tooley had just removed the lid of his tin lunch pail when the telegraph boy handed him the yellow envelope. He turned it over and over, studying its exterior, while the boy went to look at the shop-worn brown bear. The zookeeper decided that there was no way to find out what was inside of the envelope but to open it. He was ready for the worst. He wondered, unthinkingly, which one of his forty or more cousins was dead, and opened the envelope. Dennis Tooley, Franklin Zoo, he read. Dongolas don't swim. How do you make them swim? Telegraph at once. Michael Tooley. He laid the telegram across his knees and looked at it as if it was some strange communication from another sphere. He pushed his hat to one side of his head and scratched the tuft of red hair thus bared. Dongolas don't swim, he repeated slowly. And how do I make them swim? I wonder, does Cousin Mike take the goats to be fish or what? I wonder, does he take swimming to be one of the accomplishments of the goat? He shook his head in puzzlement and frowned at the telegram. Would he be having a goat regatta, I wonder, or was he expecting the goat to be a web-footed animal? Won't swim, he repeated angrily. Won't swim. And what's it to me if they won't swim? Neither would I swim if I was a goat. Tis none of me affair if they will not swim. There was nothing said about swimming goats. Goats I can give him, and dongle of goats I can give him, and jumping goats and climbing goats, and walking goats but tis not in me line to furnish submarine goats. No, nor goats to fly up in the air. Would anyone? He said with exasperation. Would anyone that got a plain order for goats expect to have to furnish goats that would hop up off the earth and make a balloon ascension? Tis no fault of Dennis Tooley's them goats won't swim. What will Mike be telegraphing me next, I wonder? Dear Dennis, the goats won't lay eggs. How do you make them? Bye. Have you a piece of paper to write an answer to me, Cousin Mike, on? The keeper of the water goats and Alderman Tooley were sitting on a rustic bench looking sadly at the water goats when the Jeffersonville telegraph messenger brought them Dennis Tooley's answer. Alderman Tooley grasped the envelope eagerly and tore it open, and Fagin leaned over his shoulder as he read it. Michael Tooley, Alderman, Jeffersonville, they read. Put them in the water and see if they will swim. Dennis Tooley. Put them in the water, exclaimed Alderman Tooley angrily. Why didn't you put them in the water, Fagin? Why did you not think to put them in the water? He looked down at his soaking clothes, and his anger increased. Why have you been trying to make them dongles swim on land, Fagin? he asked sarcastically. Or have you been throwing them up in the air to see them swim? Why don't you put them in the water? Why don't you follow the instructions the expert dongle water goat man? and put them in the water if you want them to swim. Fagin looked at the angry alderman. He looked at the dripping goats. So I did, Mike, he said seriously. We both of us did. And did we, cried Alderman Tooley in mock surprise. Is it possible we thought to put them in the water when we wanted them to swim? Twas in me mind that we tied them to a tree and played ring around the rosy with them to induce them to swim. Where's a pencil? Where's a piece of paper? he cried. He jerked them from the hand of the messenger boy. The afternoon was half worn away. Every minute was precious. He wrote hastily and handed the message to the messenger boy. Fagin, he said, as the boy disappeared down the path at a run. 
raise up your spirits and come and give the water goat some more instructions in the genteel art of swimming in the water fagin sighed and arose he walked toward the dejected water goats and taking the nearest one by the horns yanked it toward the lake the goat was too weak to do more than hold back feebly and bleat its disapproval of another bath the more lessons in swimming it received the less it seemed to like to swim it had developed a positive hatred of swimming Dennis Tooley received the second telegram with a savage grin. He had expected it. He opened it with malicious slowness. Dennis Tooley, Franklin Zoo, he read. Where do you think I put them to make them swim? They won't swim in the lake. It won't do no good for us for them to swim on dry land. No fooling now. How do you make them dongle us swim? Answer quick. Michael Tooley. He did not have to study out his reply, for he had been considering it ever since he had sent the other telegram. He took a blank from the boy and wrote the answer. The sun was setting when the Jeffersonville messenger delivered it to Alderman Tooley. Mike Tooley, Jeffersonville, it said. Quit fooling yourself. Don't you know young dongolas are always water shy at first? Tie them in the lake and let them soak, and they will learn to swim fast enough. If I didn't know any more about dongolas than you do, I would keep clear of them. Dennis Tooley. Listen to that now, said Alderman Tooley, the smile spreading over his face. And who ever said I knew anything about water goats, anyhow? The natural history of the water goat is not one of the things usually considered part of the education of the alderman from the fourth ward, Fagin. But tis surprised I am that ye did not know the goat is like a soup bean and has to be soaked before usin'. The keeper of the water goat should know the habits of the animal, Fagin. Why did ye not put him in to soak in the first place? I am surprised at ye. It escaped me mind, said Fagin. I was thinking these was broke to swimmin and did not need to be soaked. I wonder how long they should be soaked, Mike. Twill do no harm to soak them overnight, anyhow, said Tooley. Overnight is the usual soaking given to the soup bean and the salt mackerel to say nothing of the codfish and the others of the water goat family. Let the water goats soak overnight, Fagin, and by morning they will be ready to swim like trout. We will anchor them in the lake, Fagin, and we will say nothing to Dugan. Twould be a blow to Dugan was he to learn the dongolas provided for the park was young and water shy. They anchored the goats firmly in the lake and left them there to overcome their shyness, which seemed, as Fagin and Tuli left them, to be as great as ever. The goats gazed sadly and bleated longingly after the two men as they disappeared in the dusk, and when the men had passed entirely out of sight, the goats looked at each other and complained bitterly. Alderman Tooley thoughtfully changed his wet clothes for dry ones before he went to Casey's that evening, for he thought Dugan might be there, and he was. He was there when Tooley arrived, and his brow was black. He had had a bad day of it. Everything had gone wrong with him and his affairs. A large lump of his adherents had sloughed off from his party and had affiliated with his opponents, and the evening opposition paper had come out with a red-hot article condemning the administration for reckless extravagance. It had especially condemned Dugan for burdening the city with new bonds to create an unneeded park, and the whole thing had ended with a screech of ironic laughter over the so the editor called it, fitting capstone of the whole business, the purchase of two dongola goats at perfectly extravagant prices. Mike, said the big mayor severely, when the little alderman had offered his greetings, there is the devil in all to pay about them donglas. The news is full of them. Twill be the end of us if they all do not pan out well. Have you tried them in the water yet? Sure, exclaimed the little alderman with a heartiness he did not feel. What has me and Fagin been doing all day but trying them? Have no fear of the water goats, Dugan. Do they swim well, Mike? asked the big mayor kindly, but with a weary heaviness he did not try to conceal. Swim, exclaimed Tooley. Did ye say swim, Dugan? Swim is no name for the way they trip through the water. Twas marvelous to see them. And them donglas is wonderful animals. Do ye think we could persuade them to come out when we wanted them home? Not them, Dugan. Twas all me and Fagin could do to pull them out by main force. And the minute we let go of them, back they went into the water. 
"'Twas pitiful to hear the way they bleated to be back in the water again, Dugan. "'So we let them stay in for the night. "'You did not let them loose in the lake, Mike?' exclaimed the big mayor. "'No,' said Tooley. "'No, they'll not get away, Dugan. We anchored them fast.' "'Ye done good, Mike,' said the big mayor. The next morning, keeper of the water goats, Fagin, was down sufficiently early to drag the bodies of the goats out of the lake long before even the first citizen was admitted to the park. Alone and hastily, he hid them in the little tool house and locked the door on them. Then he went to find Alderman Tooley. He found him in the mayor's office and beckoned him to one side. In hot, quick accents, he told him the untimely fate of the Dongola water goats and the mayor, with an eye for everything on that important day, saw the red face of Alderman Tooley grow longer and redder, saw the look of pain and horror that overspread it. A chilling fear gripped his own heart. "'Mike,' he said, "'what's the matter with the Dongolas?' It was Fagin who spoke, while the little alderman from the fourth ward stood bereft of speech in this awful moment. "'Dugan,' he said, I've not had much experience with the Dongola water goat, and the ways and habits of them is strange to me. But if I was to say what I think, I would say they was over-soaked. Over-soaked, Fagin? said the mayor crossly. Talk sense, will ye? Sure, said Fagin. And over-soaked is what I say. Them water goats has all the looks of being soaked too long. I would not say positive, your honor, but that's the looks of them. If me own mother was to ask me, I would say the same, Dugan. Soaking too long done it. It's what I would say. You are a fool, Fagin, exclaimed the big mayor. Well, said Fagin mildly, I've not had much experience in soaking dongolas, if you mean that, Dugan. Do not set up to be an expert dongola soaker. I do not know the rules to go by. Some may like them soaked long, and some may like them soaked not so long. But if I was to say... I would say them two dongolas at the park had been soaked a dang sight too long. The swim has been soaked clean out of them. Are they sick? asked the big mayor. What is the matter with them? They do look sick, agreed Fagin, breaking the bad news gently. I should say they look mighty sick, Dugan. If they looked any sicker, I would be after looking for the place to bury them in. And I'm looking for the place now. As the truth dawned on the mind of the big mayor, he lost his firm look and sank into a chair. This was the last brick pulled from under his structure of hopes. His head sank upon his breast, and for many minutes he was silent, while his aides stood abashed and ill at ease. At last he raised his head and stared at Tooley, more in sorrow than in resentfulness. Mike, he said, Mike Tooley, what in the world made you soak them donglas? Dugan, pleaded Tooley, laying his hand on the big mayor's arm. Dugan, old man, don't look at me that way. There was nothing else to do but soak them dongolas. Many's the time I've seen me father soaking the young dongolas to limber them up for swimming. If ever ye have to do with dongolas, Mike, he used to say to me to soak them well first. So I soaked them, and tis none of me fault, nor Fagin's either, that they soak full of water. First class dongolas is waterproof, as every one knows, Dugan. And how was we to know that them two was not? How was me and Fagin to know their skins would soak in water like a pillowcase? Small blame to us, Dugan. The big mayor shook his head between his hands and stared moodily at the floor. Go on away, he said after a while. Ye have done for me and the boys, Tooley. Ye have soaked us out of office, one and all of us. I want to be alone. It's all over with us. Go on away. Tully and the keeper of the water goats stole silently from the room and out into the street. Fagin was the first to speak. How was we to know them donklas would soak in water that way, Tully? He said defensively. How was we to know they was not waterproof kind of donglas? The little alderman from the fourth ward walked silently by the keeper's side. His head was downcast and his hands were clasped beneath the tails of his coat. Suddenly he looked Fagin full in the face. "'Twas our fault, Fagin,' he said. "'Twas all our fault. If we didn't know them donglas was waterproof, we should have varnished them before we put them in the lake to soak. I don't blame you, Fagin, for you did not know any better. But I blame meself, for I call to mind that me father always varnished them donglas before he soaked them overnight. 
Take no chances, Mike, he used to say to me. Always furnish them first. Some of them is rubbery and will not soak up water, but some is spongy, and tis best to varnish one and all of them. Think of that now, exclaimed Fagin with admiration. Sure, but this natural history is a wonderful science, Tooley. To think that them animals were the spongy hided dongla water goats of foreign lambs, and used to be varnished before each and every bath. And to me they looked more different than from the goats of me boyhood. I was never cut out for a goatkeeper, Mike. And me job on the dump cart is gone, too. Twill be hard times for Fagin. Twill be hard times for Tooley, too, said the little alderman, and they walked on without speaking until Fagin reached his gate. Well, anyhow, he said with cheerful philosophy, "'Tis better to be us than to be them dongla water goats, dead or alive. "'Tis not too often I take a bath, Mike. "'But if I was one of them spongy hide donglas "'and had to be varnished each time I got in me bathtub, "'I would stop bathing for good and all.' "'He looked toward the house. "'I'll not worry,' he said. "'Maggie will be sad to hear the job is gone, "'but she would have took it harder "'to know her Tim was wasting his time "'varnishing the slab side of a spongy goat.' End of section 11. Goats and Other Troubles, Part 1. Section 12 of Ellis Parker Butler Short Stories, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Water Goats and Other Troubles, Part 2. Mr. Billings's Pockets. On the 16th of June, Mr. Roland Billings entered his home at Westcote, very much later than usual, and stealing upstairs like a thief in the night, he undressed and dropped into bed. In two minutes he was asleep, and it was no wonder, for by that time it was five minutes after three in the morning, and Mr. Billings's usual bedtime was ten o'clock. Even when he was delayed at his office, he made it an invariable rule to catch the nine o'clock train home. When Mrs. Billings awoke the next day, or rather, that same morning, she gazed a minute at the thin, innocent face of her husband, and was in the satisfied frame of mind that takes an unexpected train delay as a legitimate excuse, when she happened to cast her eyes upon Mr. Billings's coat, which was thrown carelessly over the foot of the bed. Protruding from one of the side pockets was a patent nursing bottle, half full of milk, Instantly, Mrs. Billings was out of bed and searching Mr. Billings's other pockets. To her horror, her search was fruitful. In a vest pocket, she found three false curls or puffs of hair, such as ladies are wearing today to increase the abundance of their own, and these curls were of a rich brownish red. Finally, when she dived into his trousers pocket, she found twelve acorns carefully wrapped in a lady's handkerchief, with the initials T.M.C. embroidered in one corner. All these Mrs. Billings hid carefully in her upper bureau drawer and proceeded to dress. When at length she awakened Mr. Billings, he yawned, stretched, and then realizing that getting up time had arrived, hopped briskly out of bed. "'You got in late last night,' said Mrs. Billings pleasantly. If she had expected Mr. Billings to cringe and cower, she was mistaken.' He continued to dress quite in his usual manner, as if he had a clear conscience. "'Indeed I did, Mary,' he said. "'It was three when I entered the house, for the clock was just striking.' "'Something must have delayed you,' suggested Mrs. Billings. "'Otherwise, dear,' said Mr. Billings, "'I should have been home much sooner.' "'Probably,' said Mrs. Billings, suddenly assuming her most sarcastic tone, as she reached into her bureau drawer and drew out the patent nursing bottle." "'This had something to do with your being delayed?' Mr. Billings looked at the nursing bottle, and then he drew out his watch and looked at that. "'My dear,' he said, "'you are right, it did. "'But I now have just time to gulp down my coffee and catch my train. "'Tonight, when I return from town, "'I will tell you the most remarkable story of that nursing bottle "'and how it happened to be in my pocket. "'And in the meantime, I beg you, I most sincerely beg you, "'to feel no uneasiness.' With this, he hurried out of the room, and a few moments later his wife saw him running for his train. All day Mrs. Billings was prey to the most disturbing thoughts. 
and as soon as dinner was finished that evening, she led the way into the library. Now, Roland, she said, without hesitation. Mr. Billings began. One, the patent nursing bottle. You have, he said, I know, met Lemuel, the colored elevator boy in our office building, and you know what a pleasant, accommodating lad he is. He is the sort of boy for whom one would gladly do a favor, for he is always so willing to do favors for others. But I was thinking nothing of this when I stepped from my office at exactly five o'clock yesterday evening. I was thinking of nothing but getting home to dinner as soon as possible, and was just stepping into the elevator when Lemuel laid his hand gently on my arm. I beg your pardon, Mr. Billings, he said politely, but would you do me a favor? Certainly, Lemuel. I said. How much can I lend you? Tain't that, sir, he said. I wish to have a word or two in private with you. Would you mind stepping back into your office until I get these folks out of the building so as I can speak to you? I knew I had still half an hour before my six-two train, and I was not unwilling to do Lemuel a favor. So I went back to my office as he desired, and waited there until he appeared which was not until he had taken all the tenants down in his elevator. Then he opened the door and came in. With him was the young man I had often seen in the office next to mine, as I passed, and a young woman on whom I had never set my eyes on before. No sooner had they opened the door than the young man began to speak, and Lemuel stood unobtrusively to one side. "'Mr. Billings,' said the young man, you may think it strange that I should come to you in this way when you and I are hardly acquaintances, but I have often observed you passing my door, and have noted your kind-looking face, and the moment I found this trouble upon me, I instantly thought of you as the one man who would be likely to help me out of my difficulty. While he said this, I had time to study his face, and also to glance at the young woman, and I saw that he must, indeed, be in great trouble." I also saw that the young woman was pretty and modest, and that she also was in great distress. I at once agreed to help him, provided I should not be made to miss the 6.30 train, for I saw I was already too late for the 6.2. Good, he cried. For several years, Madge, who is this young lady, and I have been in love, and we wish to be married this evening, but her father and my father are waiting at the foot of the elevator at this minute and they have been waiting there all day. There is no other way for us to leave the building, for the foot of the stairs is also the foot of the elevator, and in fact, when I last peeped, Madge's father was sitting on the bottom step. It is now exactly fifteen minutes of six, and at six o'clock they mean to come up and tear Madge and me away and have us married. Two, I began. Each other, said the young man with emotion. "'But I thought that was what you wanted,' I exclaimed. "'Not at all, not at all,' said the young man, "'and the young woman added her voice in protest, too. "'I am the head of the statistical department "'of the Society for Obtaining a Uniform National Divorce Law, "'and the work in that department has convinced me beyond a doubt "'that forced marriages always end unhappily. "'In 87,604 cases of forced marriages that I have tabulated, I have found that 87,603 have been unhappy. In the face of such statistics, Madge and I dare not allow ourselves to be married against our wills. We insist on being married voluntarily. That could easily be arranged, I venture to say, in view of the fact that both your fathers wish you to be married. Not at all, said Madge, with more independence than I thought her capable of. Because my father and Henry's father are gentlemen of the old school. I would not say anything against either father, for in ordinary affairs they are two most suave and charming old gentlemen, but in this they hold to the old school idea that children should allow their parents to select their life partners, and they insist that Henry and I allow ourselves to be forced to marry each other, and that, in spite of the statistics Henry has shown them, our whole happiness depends on our getting out of this building before they can come up and get us. That is why we appeal to you. If you still hesitate after what Madge has said, said Henry, pulling a large roll of paper out of his pocket, here are the statistics. Very well, I said. I will help you, if I can do so and not miss the 6.30 train. What is your plan? It's very simple. 
said Henry. Our fathers are both quite near-sighted, and as six o'clock draws near, they will naturally become greatly excited and nervous, therefore less observant of small things. I have brought with me some burnt cork with which I will blacken my face, and I will change clothes with Lemuel, and in the one moment necessary to escape, my father will not recognize me. Lemuel, on the other hand, will whiten his face with some powder that Madge has brought, and will wear my clothes, and in the excitement my father will seize him instead of me. Excellent, I said. But what part do I play in this? This part, said Henry. You will wear over your street clothes a gown that Madge has brought in her suitcase, and a hat that she has also brought, both of which your father will easily recognize, while Madge will redden her face with rouge, muss her hair, don a torn calico dress, and with a scrub rag and a mop in her hands, easily pass for a scrub woman. And then, I asked, then you and Lemuel will steal cautiously down the stairs, as if you were Madge and I seeking escape, while Madge and I, as Lemuel and a scrub woman, will go down by the elevator. My father and Madge's father will seize you and Lemuel, and I shall appear like a fool when they discover I'm a respectable businessman rigged up in women's clothes, I said. Not at all, said Madge, for Henry and I have thought of that. You must play your part until you see that Henry and I have escaped from the elevator and have left the building, and that is all. I have had the forethought to prepare an alibi for you. As soon as you see that Henry and I are safe outside the building, you must become very indignant and insist that you are a respectable married woman, and in proof you must hand my father the contents of this package. He will be convinced immediately and let you go, and then Lemuel can run up to your office and you can take off my dress and hat and catch the 6.30 train without trouble. She then handed me a small parcel, which I slipped into my coat pocket. When this had been agreed upon, she and Henry left the office, and I took the hat and dress from the suitcase and put them on, while Lemuel put on Henry's suit and whitened his face. This took but a few minutes, and we went into the hall and found Henry and Madge already waiting for us. Henry was blackened into a good likeness of Lemuel, and Madge was quite a musty scrubwoman. They immediately entered the elevator and began to descend slowly, while Lemuel and I crept down the stairs. Lemuel and I kept as nearly as possible opposite the elevator, so that we might arrive at the foot of the stairs, but a moment before Madge and Henry, and we could hear the two fathers shuffling on the street floor, when suddenly, as we reached the third floor, we heard a whisper from Henry in the elevator. The elevator had stuck fast between the third and fourth floors, as with one mind, Lemuel and I seated ourselves on a step and waited until Henry should get the elevator running again and could proceed to the street floor. For a while we could hear no noise but the grating of metal on metal as Henry worked with the starting lever of the elevator, and then we heard the two voices of the fathers. "'It's a ruse,' said one father. "'They're pretending the elevator is stuck, and when we grow impatient and start up the stairs,' They will come down with a rush and escape us. But we're not so silly as that, said the other father. We will stay right here and wait until they come down. At that, Lemuel and I settled ourselves more comfortably, for there was nothing else to do. I cursed inwardly as I felt the minutes slip by, and knew that at half past six had come and gone. But I was sure you would not like to have me desert those two poor lovers who were fighting to ward off the statistics. So I sat still and silent. So did Lemuel. I do not know how long I sat there, but it was already dark in the narrow stairway, but it must have been a long time. I drowsed off, and I was finally awakened by Lemuel tugging at my sleeve, and I knew that Henry had managed to start the elevator again. Lemuel and I hastened our steps, and just as the elevator was coming into sight below the second floor, we were seen by the two fathers. For an instant they hesitated, and then they seized us. At the same time the elevator door opened and Henry and Madge came out, and the two fathers hardly glanced at them as they went out the door into the street. As soon as I saw they were safe, I feigned great indignation, and so did Lemuel. "'Unhand me, sir,' I cried. "'Who do you think I am? I am a respectable married lady, leaving the building with her husband. Unhand me!' 
Instead of doing so, however, the father that had me by the arm drew me nearer to the hall light. As he did so, he stared closely at my face. Morgan, he said to the other father, this is not my daughter. My daughter did not have a mustache. Indeed, I am not your daughter, I said. I am a respectable married lady, and here is the proof. With that, I reached for the package Madge had given me, but it was in my coat pocket underneath the dress I had on, and it was only with great difficulty and by raising one side of the skirt that I was able to get it. I unwrapped it and showed it to the father that had me by the arm. It was the patent nursing bottle. When Mr. Billings had finished his relation, his wife sat for a moment in silence. Then she said, "'And he let you go?' "'Yes, of course,' said Mr. Billings. "'He could not hold me after such proof as that, and Lemuel ran me up to my office where I changed my hat and took off the dress. I knew it was late, and I did not know what train I could catch, but I made haste, and on the way down in the elevator I felt in my pocket to see if I had my commutation ticket.' When my hand struck the patent nursing bottle, my first impulse was to drop it in the car, but on second thought I decided to keep it, for I knew that when you saw it and heard the story, you would understand perfectly why I was detained last night. Yes, said Mrs. Billings questioningly, but my dear, all that does not account for these. As she said that, she drew from her work basket the three auburn red curls. "'Oh, those,' said Mr. Billings, after a momentary hesitation. "'I was about to tell you about those.' "'Do so,' said Mrs. Billings coldly. "'I am listening.' Two, THE THREE AUBURN RED CURLS "'When I went down in the elevator,' said Mr. Billings, "'with the nursing bottle in my pocket, "'I had no thought but to get to the train as soon as possible.' for I saw by the clock in my office that I had just time to catch the eleven nine if I should not be delayed. Therefore, as soon as I was outside the building, I started to run. But when I reached the corner and was about to step on a passing street car, a hand was laid upon my arm, and I turned to see who was seeking to detain me. It was a woman in the most pitiable rags, and on her arm she carried a baby so thin and pale that I could scarcely believe it lived. One glance at the child showed me that it was on the verge of death by starvation, and this was confirmed by the moans of the mother, who begged me for humanity's sake to give her money with which to provide food for the child, even though I let her herself starve. You know, my dear, you never allow me to give money to street beggars, and I remembered this, but at that same time I remembered the patent nursing bottle I still carried in my pocket. Without hesitation, I drew the patent nursing bottle from my pocket and told the mother to allow the infant to have a sufficient quantity of milk it contained to sustain the child's life until she could procure other alms or other aid. With a cry of joy, the mother took the nursing bottle and pressed it to the poor baby's lips, and it was with great pleasure I saw the rosy color return to the child's cheeks. The sadness of despair that had shadowed the mother's face also fled, and I could see that already she was looking on life with a more optimistic view. I verily believed the child could have absorbed the entire contents of the bottle, but I had impressed upon the mother that she was to give the child only sufficient to sustain life, not to suffice it until it was grown to manhood or womanhood, and when the bottle was half emptied, the mother returned it to me. How much time all this occupied I do not know, but the child took the milk with extreme slowness. I may say that it took the milk drop by drop. A great deal of time must have elapsed. But when the mother had returned the patent nursing bottle to me and saw how impatient I was to be gone, she retained her hold upon my arm. Sir, she said, you have undoubtedly saved the life of my child, and I only regret that I cannot repay you for all it means to me. But I cannot. Stay, she cried. When I was about to pull my arm away. Has your wife auburn red hair? No, I said, she has not. Her hair is a most beautiful black. No matter, said the poor woman, putting her hand to her head. Some day she may wish to change the color of her hair to auburn red, which is easily done with a little bleach and a little dye. And should she do so, these may come in handy. And with that, she slipped something soft and fluffy into my hand and fled into the night. When I looked, I saw in my hand the very curls you hold there. My first impulse was to drop them in the street, 
but I remembered that the poor woman had not given them to me, but to you, and that it was my duty to bring them home to you, so I slipped them into my pocket. When Mr. Billings had ended his recital of what had happened to him, his wife said, Huh? At the same time, she tossed the curls into the grate, where they shriveled up, burst into blue smoke, and shortly disappeared in ashes. That is a very likely story, she said, but it does not explain how this came to be in your pocket. Saying this, she drew from her basket the handkerchief and handed it to Mr. Billings. Ha! he exclaimed. For a moment, he turned the rolled-up handkerchief over and over, and then he cautiously opened it. At the sight of the twelve acorns, he seemed somewhat surprised, and when the initials TMC on the corner of the handkerchief caught his eye, he blushed. "'You are blushing. You are disturbed,' said Mrs. Billings severely. "'I am,' said Mr. Billings, suddenly recovering himself. "'And no wonder.' "'And no wonder indeed,' said Mrs. Billings. "'Perhaps then you can tell me how those acorns and that handkerchief came to be in your pocket.' "'I can,' said Mr. Billings, "'and I will.' "'You had better,' said Mrs. Billings. Three, THE TWELVE ACORNS AND THE LADY'S HANDKERCHIEF "'You may have noticed, my dear,' said Mr. Billings, "'that the initials on that handkerchief are TMC, "'and I wish you to keep that in mind, "'for it has a great deal to do with this story. "'Had they been anything else, "'that handkerchief would have not found its way into my pocket.' and when you see how those acorns and that handkerchief and the half-filled nursing bottle and the auburn red curls all combine to keep me out of my home until the unearthly hour of three a.m., you will forget the unjust suspicion which I too sadly fear you now hold against me, and you will admit that a half-filled patent nursing bottle, a trio of curls, a lady's handkerchief and twelve acorns were the most natural things in the world to find in my pockets." When I had left the poor woman with her no longer starving baby, I hurriedly glanced into a store window, and by the clock there saw that it was twenty minutes of one, and that I had exactly time to catch the one o'clock train, which is the last train that runs to Westcote. I glanced up and down the street, but not a car was in sight, and I knew I could not afford to wait long if I wished to catch that train. There was but one thing to do, and that was to take a cab and as luck would have it, at that moment an automobile cab came rapidly around the corner. I raised my voice and my arm, and the driver saw or heard me, for he made a quick turn in the street and drew up at the curb beside me. I hastily gave him the directions, jumped in, and slammed the door shut, and the auto cab immediately started forward at what seemed to me an unsafe speed. We had not gone far when something in the forepart of the automobile began to thump in an almost alarming manner, and the driver slackened his speed, drew up to the curb, and stopped. He opened the door and put his head in. "'Something's gone wrong,' he said. "'But don't you worry. I'll have it fixed in no time, and then I can put on more speed, and I'll get you there in just the same time as if nothing happened.' When he said this, I was perfectly satisfied for he was a nice-looking man, and I lay back, for I was quite tired out. It was so long past my usual bedtime, and the driver went to work doing things I could not understand to the forepart of the automobile, where the machinery is. I remember thinking that the cushions of this automobile were unusually soft, and then I must have dozed off, and when I opened my eyes, I did not know how much time had elapsed but the driver was still at work, and I could hear him swearing. He seemed to have been having a great deal of trouble, so I got out of the automobile, intending to tell him that perhaps I had better try to get a car after all. But his actions, when he saw me, were most unexpected. He waved the wrench he held in his hand, and ordered me to get back into the automobile, and I did. I supposed he was afraid he would lose his fare and tip, but in a few minutes he opened the door again and spoke to me. "'Now, sport,' he said, "'there ain't no use thinking about getting that train, because it's gone, "'and I may as well say now that you've got to come with me "'unless you want me to smash your head in. "'The fact is, this ain't no public automobile, "'and I hadn't no right to take you for a passenger. "'This automobile belongs to a lady, and I'm her hired chauffeur, "'and she's at a bridge with party in a house on Fifth Avenue.' 
and I'm supposed to be waiting outside at that house. One fifteen o'clock was the time she said she would be out, but I thought maybe I might make a dollar or two for myself instead of waiting there all that time, and she would never know it. And now it's nearly two o'clock, and if I go back alone, she will be raving mad, and I'll get my discharge and no references, and my poor wife and sick children will have to starve. So you will have to go with me and explain how it was I wasn't there at one fifteen o'clock. My friend, I said, I am sorry for you, but I do not see how it would help you, should I refuse to go, and you should, as you say, smash my head in. Don't you worry none about that, he said. If I smashed your head in, as I could do easily enough with this wrench, I'd take what was left of you up some dark street and lay you on the pavement and run the machine across you once or twice, and then take you to a hospital, and that would be excuse enough. You'd be another killed by an automobile, and I'd be the hero that picked you up and took you to the hospital. Well, I said, under the circumstances I shall go with you, but not because you threaten me but because your poor wife and six children are threatened with starvation. Good, he said, and now all you have to do is to think of what the excuse you will give my lady boss will be. With that, he lay back against the cushions and waited. He seemed to feel the matter did not concern him any more, and that the rest of it lay with me. Go ahead, I said to him. I have no idea what I shall tell your mistress. But since I have lost the last train, I must try to catch the two o'clock trolley car to Westcote, and I do not wish to spend any more time than necessary on this business. Make all the haste possible, and as we go, I shall think what I will say when we get there. The driver got out and took his seat and started the car. I was worried, indeed, my dear. I tried to think of something plausible to tell the young man's employer, something that would have an air of self-proof when suddenly I remembered the half-filled nursing bottle and the three auburn red curls. Why should I not tell the lady that a poor mother, while proceeding down Fifth Avenue from her scrubwoman job, had been taken suddenly ill, and that I, being near, had insisted that this automobile help me convey the woman to her home, which we found, alas, to be in the farthest districts of Brooklyn? then I would produce the three auburn red curls and the half-filled nursing bottle as having been left in the automobile by the woman, and this proof would suffice. I had fully decided on this when the automobile stopped in front of a large house in Fifth Avenue, and I had time to tell a driver that I had thought of the proper thing to say, but that was all, for the waiting lady came down the steps with great anger and was about to begin a good scolding when she noticed me sitting in her automobile. If she had been angry before, she was now furious, and she was the kind of young woman who can be extremely furious when she tries. I think nothing in the world could have calmed her had she not caught sight of my face by the light of two strong lamps on a passing automobile. She saw in my face what you see there now, my dear, the benevolent fatherly face of a settled-down, trustworthy married man of past middle age, and as if by magic her anger fled and she burst into tears. Oh, sir, she cried, I do not know who you are, nor how you happen to be in my car, but at this moment I am homeless and friendless. I am alone in the world, and I need advice. Let me get into the car beside you. Miss, I said, I do not like to disoblige you, but I can never allow myself to be in an automobile at this time of night with a strange woman, unchaperoned. These words seemed almost more than she could bear, and my heart was full of pity. But, just as I was about to spring from the automobile and rush away, I saw on the walk the poor woman whose baby I had given the half of the contents of the patent nursing bottle. I called her and made her get into the automobile, and then I let the young woman enter. Now, I said, where to? That, she said, is what I do not know. When I left my home this evening, I left it forever, and I left a note of farewell to my father, which he must have received and read by this time and if I went back, he would turn me from the door in anger, for he is a gentleman of the old school. When I heard these words, I was startled. Can it be, I asked, that you have a brother, Henry? I have, she admitted. Henry Corwin is his name. This was the name of the young man I had helped that very evening to marry Madge. I told her to proceed. My father, she said, 
had been insisting that I marry a man I do not love, and things have come to such a point that I must either accede or take things into my own hands. I agreed to elope this evening with the man I love, for he had long wished me to elope with him. I was to meet him outside his house at exactly one fifteen o'clock, and I told him that if I were not there promptly, he might know that I had changed my mind. When the time came for me to hasten to him in my automobile, which was then to hurry us to a waiting minister, my automobile was not here. Unfortunately, I did not know my lover's address, for I had left it in the card pocket in this automobile. I knew not what to do. As the time passed and my automobile did not appear, I knew that my lover had decided that I was not coming and had gone away into his house. Now I cannot go home, for I have no home. I cannot so lower my pride as to ring the bell of his house and say, I wish to be forgiven and married even yet. What shall I do? For answer, I felt in the card pocket of the automobile and drew out the address of her lover, and without hesitation I gave the address to the chauffeur. In a few minutes we were there, leaving the young woman in the car with the poor woman. I got out and surveyed the house. It was unpromising. Evidently, all the family but the young man were away for the summer, and the doors and windows were all boarded up. There was not a bell to ring. I pounded on the boards that covered the door, but it was unavailing. The young woman called to me that the young man lived in the front room of the topmost floor, and could not hear me, and I glanced up and saw that one window alone of all those in the house was not boarded up. Instantly I hopped upon the seat beside the driver and said, Central Park. We dashed up Fifth Avenue and into the park at full speed, and when we were what I considered far enough in, I ordered him to stop, and hurrying up a low bank, I began to grope among the leaves of last year under the trees. I was right. In a few minutes I had filled my pockets with acorns, was back in the car, and we were hurrying toward the house of the lover, when I saw, standing on a corner, a figure I instantly recognized as Lemuel, the elevator boy and at the same time I remembered that Lemuel spent his holidays pitching for a ball nine. He was just the man I needed, and I stopped and made him get into the car. In a minute more we were before the house again, and I handed Lemuel a fistful of acorns. He drew back and threw them with all his strength toward the upper window. My dear, will you believe it? Those acorns were wormy. They were light. They would not carry to the window but scattered like bits of chips when they traveled but halfway. I was upset, but Lemuel was not. He ordered the chauffeur to drive to Lower Sixth Avenue with all speed, in order that he might get a baseball. With this, he said he could hit any mark, and we had started in that direction when, passing a restaurant on Broadway, I saw emerge Henry and Madge. Far better, I said to myself. Put this young woman in charge of her brother, and his new wife, then leave her here to elope alone, and I made the chauffeur draw up beside them. Hastily I explained the situation, and where we were going at the moment, and Henry and Madge laughed in unison. Madge, said Henry, we had no trouble making wormy acorns travel through the air, had we? And both laughed again. At this I made them get into the automobile, and while we returned to the lover's house I made them explain. It was very simple, and I had just tied a dozen acorns tightly in my handkerchief, making a ball to throw at the window, when the poor woman with the baby noticed that the window was partly open. I asked Lemuel if he could throw straight enough to throw the handkerchief ball into the window, and he said he could, and took the handkerchief. But a brighter idea came to me, and I turned to the eloping young lady. Let me have your handkerchief, if it has your initials on it, I said for when he sees that fall into his room, he will know you are here. He will not think you are forward, coming to him alone, for he will know that you could never have thrown the handkerchief, even if loaded with acorns, to such a height. It will be your message to him. At this, which I do pride myself, was a suggestion worthy of myself. All were delighted, and while I modestly tied twelve acorns in the handkerchief on which were the initials TMC, all the others cheered. Even the woman from whom I had received the three auburn-red curls cheered. 
and the baby that was half filled out of the patent nursing bottle crowed with joy but the chauffeur honked his honker lemuel took the handkerchief full of acorns in his hand and drew back his famous left arm when suddenly theodora mitchell corwin for that was the eloping young lady's name shrieked and looking up we saw her lover at the window he gave an answering yell and disappeared and Lemuel let his left arm fall and handed me the handkerchief ball. In the excitement I dropped it into my pocket, and it was not until I was on the car for Westcote that I discovered it, and then, not wishing to be any later in getting home, I did not go back to give it to Theodore Mitchell Corwin. In fact, I did not know where she had eloped to, nor could I give it to Madge or Henry, for they had gone on their wedding journey as soon as they saw Theodora and her lover safely eloped. I had no right to give it to the poor woman with the baby, even if she had not immediately disappeared into her world of poverty, and it certainly did not belong to Lemuel, nor could I have given it to him, for he took the ten dollars the lover gave him and stayed out so late that he was late to work this morning and was discharged. He said he was going back to Texas." so I brought the handkerchief and the twelve acorns home, knowing you would be interested in hearing their story. When Mr. Billings had thus finished his relation of the happenings of his long evening, Mrs. Billings was thoughtful for a minute. Then she said, But, Roland, when I spoke to you of the handkerchief and the twelve acorns, you blushed. You said you had reason to blush. I see nothing in this kind of action you did to cause a blush. I blushed said Mr. Billings, to think of the lie I was going to tell Theodora Merrill Corwin. I thought you said her name was Theodora Mitchell Corwin, said Mrs. Billings. Mitchell or Merrill, said Mr. Billings. I cannot remember exactly which. For several minutes Mrs. Billings was silent. Occasionally she would open her mouth as if to ask a question, but each time she closed it again without speaking. Mr. Billings sat regarding his wife with what in a man of less clear conscience might be called anxiety. At length Mrs. Billings put her sewing into her sewing basket and arose. "'Roland,' she said, "'I have enjoyed hearing you tell your experiences greatly. I can say but one thing. Never in your life have you deceived me, and you have not deceived me now.' For half an hour after this Mr. Billings sat alone, thinking— our first burglar. When our new suburban home was completed, I took Sarah out to see it, and she liked it all but the stairs. Edgar, she said, when she had ascended to the second floor, I don't know whether it is imagination or not, but it seems to me that these stairs are funny, some way. I can't understand it. They are not a long flight, and they are not unusually steep, but they seem to be unusually wearying. I never knew a short flight to tire me so, and I have climbed many flights in the six years we have lived in the flats. Perhaps, Sarah, I said, with mild dissimulation, you are unusually tired today. The fact was that I had planned those stairs myself, and for a particular reason I had made the rise of each step three inches more than the customary height, and in this way I had saved two steps. I had also made the tread of the steps unusually narrow, and the reason was that I had found, from long experience, that stair carpet wears first on the tread of the steps where the foot falls. By making the steps tall enough to save two, and by making the tread narrow, I reduced the wear on the carpet to a minimum. I believe in economy where it is possible. For the same reason, I had the stair banisters made wide, with a saddle-like top to the newel post, to tempt my son and daughter to slide downstairs. The less they used the stairs, the longer the carpet would last. I need hardly say that Sarah has a fear of burglars. Most women have. As for myself, I prefer not to meet a burglar. It is all very well to get up in the night and prowl about with a pistol in one hand, seeking to eliminate the life of a burglar. And some men may like it, but I am of a very excitable nature. And I am sure that if I did find a burglar and succeeded in shooting him, I should be in such an excited state that I could not sleep again that night, and no man can afford to lose his night's rest. There are other objections to shooting a burglar in the house, 
and these objections apply with double force when the house and its furnishings are entirely new. Although some of the rugs in our house were red, not all of them were, and I had no guarantee that if I shot a burglar, he would lie down on a red rug to bleed to death. A burglar does not consider one's feelings, and would be quite as apt to bleed on a green rug, and spoil it as not. Until burglarizing is properly regulated, and burglars are educated, as they should be, in technical burglary schools, we cannot hope that a shot burglar will staunch his wound until he can find a red rug to lie down on. And there are still other objections to shooting a burglar. If all burglars were fat, one of these would be removed, but perhaps a thin burglar might get in front of my revolver, and in that case the bullet would likely go right through him and continue on its way, and perhaps break a mirror or a cut glass dish. I am a thin man myself, and if a burglar shot at me, he might damage things in the same way. I thought all these things over when we decided to build in the suburbs, for Sarah is very nervous about burglars, and makes me get up at the slightest noise to go poking about. Only the fact that no burglar has ever entered our flat at night had prevented what might have been a serious accident to a burglar, for I made it a rule, when Sarah awakened me on such occasions, to waste no time but to go through the room as hastily as possible and get back to bed, and at the speed I traveled I might have bumped into a burglar in the dark and knocked him over and his head might have struck some hard object, causing concussion of the brain, and as a burglar has a small brain, a small amount of concussion might have ruined it entirely. But as I am a slight man, it might have been my brain that got concussed. A father of a family has to think of these things. The nervousness of Sarah regarding burglars had led me in this way to study the subject carefully, and my adoption of jet-black pajamas as nightwear was not due to cowardice on my part. I properly reasoned that if a burglar tried to shoot me while I was rushing around the house after him in the darkness, a suit of black pajamas would somewhat spoil his aim, and not being able to see me, he would not shoot at all. In this way, I should save Sarah the nerve shock that would follow the explosion of a pistol in the house for Sarah was very much more afraid of pistols than of burglars. I am sure there were only two reasons why I never killed a burglar with a pistol. One was that no burglar had ever entered our flat, and the other was that I never had a pistol. But I knew that one is much less protected in a suburb than in town, and when I decided to build, I studied the burglar protection matter most carefully. I said nothing to Sarah about it for fear it would upset her nerves. But for months I considered every method that seemed to have any merit, and that would avoid getting a burglar's blood, or mine, splattered around our new furnishings. I desired some method by which I could finish up a burglar properly without having to leave my bed, for although Sarah is brave enough in sending me out of bed to catch a burglar, I knew she must suffer severe nerve strain during the time I was wandering about in the dark. Her objection to explosive had also to be considered, and I really had to exercise my brain more than common before I hit upon what I may now consider the only perfect method of handling burglars. Several things coincided to suggest my method. One of these was Sarah's foolish notion that our silver must, every night, be brought from the dining room and deposited under our bed. This I considered a most foolhardy tempting of fate. It coaxed any burglar who ordinarily would have quietly taken the silver from the dining room and have then gone away peacefully to enter our room. The knowledge that I lay in bed ready at any time to spring out upon him would make him prepare his revolver, and his nervousness might make him shoot me, which would quite upset Sarah's nerves. I told Sarah so, but she had a hereditary instinct for bringing the silver to the bedroom, and insisted. I saw that in the suburban house this would be continued as bringing the silver upstairs, and a trial of my carpet-saving stairs suggested to me my burglar-defeating plan. I had the apparatus built into the house, and I had the house planned to agree with the apparatus. For several months after we moved into the house I had no burglars, but I felt no fear of them in any event. I was prepared for them. 
In order not to make Sarah nervous, I explained to her that my invention of a silver elevator was merely a time-saving device. From the top of the dining-room sideboard, I ran upright tracks through the ceiling to the back of the hall above, and in these I placed a glass case, which could be run up and down the tracks like a dumbwaiter. All our servant had to do when she had washed the silver was to put it in the glass case, and I had attached to the top of the case a stout steel cable, which ran to the ceiling of the hall above, over a pulley, and so to our bedroom, which was at the front of the hall upstairs. By this means I could, when I was in bed, pull the cable, and the glass case of silver would rise to the second floor. Our bedroom door opened upon the hall, and from the bed I could see the glass case. But in order that I might be sure that the silver was there, I put a small electric light in the case and kept it burning all night. Sarah was delighted with this arrangement, for in the morning all I had to do was pay out the steel cable and the silver would descend to the dining room, and the maid could have the table all set by the time breakfast was ready. Not once did Sarah have a suspicion that all this was not merely a household ceremony, but my burglar trap. On the 6th of August, at 2 o'clock in the morning, Sarah awakened me, and I immediately sat straight up in bed. There was an undoubtable noise of sawing, and I knew at once that a burglar was entering our home. Sarah was trembling, and I knew she was getting nervous, but I ordered her to remain calm. Sarah! I said in a whisper, be calm. There is not the least danger. I have been expecting this for some time, and I only hope the burglar has no dependent family or poor old mother to support. Whatever happens, be calm and keep perfectly quiet. With that, I released the steel cable from the head of my bed and let the glass case full of silver slide noiselessly to the sideboard. Edgar, whispered Sarah in agonizing tones, are you giving him our silver? Sarah, I whispered sternly, remember what I have just said. Keep calm and keep perfectly quiet, and I would say no more. In a very short time, I heard the window below us open softly, and I knew the burglar was entering the parlor from the side porch. I counted twenty, which I had figured would be the time required for him to reach the dining room, and then, when I was sure he must have seen the silver shining in the glass case, I slowly pulled on the steel cable and raised the case and silver to the hull above. Sarah began to whisper to me, but I silenced her. What I had expected happened. The burglar, seeing the silver rise through the ceiling, left the dining room and went into the hall. There, from the foot of the stairs, he could see the case glowing in the hall above, and without hesitation he mounted the stairs. As he reached the top, I had a good view of him, for he was silhouetted against the light that glowed from the silver case. He was a most brutal-looking fellow of the prize-fighting type, but I almost laughed aloud when I saw his build. He was short and chunky. As he stepped forward to grasp the silver case, I let the steel cable run through my fingers, and the case and its precious contents slid noiselessly down to the dining room. For only one instant the burglar seemed disconcerted, then he turned and ran downstairs again. This time I did not wait so long to draw up the silver. I hardly gave him time to reach the dining room door before I jerked the cable, and the case was glowing in the upper hall. The burglar immediately stopped, turned, and mounted the stairs. But just as he reached the top, I let the silver slide down again, and he had to turn and descend. Hardly had he reached the bottom step before I had the silver once more in the upper hall. The burglar was a gritty fellow, and was not to be so easily defeated. With some word which I could not catch, but which I have no doubt was profane, or at least vulgar, he dashed up the stairs. Just as his hand touched the case, I let the silver drop to the dining room. I smiled as I saw his next move. He carefully removed his coat and vest, rolled up his sleeves, and took off his collar. This evidently meant that he intended to get the silver if it took him the whole night, and nothing could have pleased me more. I lay in my comfortable bed, fairly shaking with suppressed laughter, and had to stuff a corner of a pillow in my mouth to smother the sound of my mirth. I did not allow the least pity for the unfortunate fellow to weaken my nerve. 
a low long screech from the hall told me that i had a man of uncommon brain to contend with for i knew the sound came from his hand drawing along the banister and that to husband his strength and to save time he was sliding down but this did not concert me it pleased me the quicker he went down the oftener he would have to walk up for half an hour i played with him giving him just time to get down to the foot of the stairs before i raised the silver and just in time to reach the top before i lowered it and then i grew tired of the sport for it was nothing else to me and i decided to finish him off i was getting sleepy but it was evident that the burglar was not and i was a little afraid i might fall asleep and thus defeat myself the burglar had the advantage because he was used to night work so i quickened my movements a little when the burglar slid down i gave him just time to see the silver rise through the ceiling and when he climbed the stairs i only allowed him to see it descend through the floor in this way i made him double his pace and as i quickened my movements i soon had him dashing up the stairs and sliding down again as if for a wager i did not give him a moment for rest and he was soon panting terribly and beginning to stumble but with almost superhuman nerve he kept up the chase he was an unusually tough burglar but quick as he was i was always quicker and a glimpse of the glowing case was all i let him have at either end of his climb or slide no sooner was he down than it was up and no sooner was the case up than he was up after it in this way i kept increasing his speed until it was something terrific and the whole house shook like an automobile with a very powerful motor but still his speed increased i saw then that i had brought him to the place i had prepared for where he had but one object in life and that was to beat the case up or down the stairs and as i was now so sleepy i could hardly keep my eyes open i did what i had intended to do from the first i lowered the case until it was exactly between the ceiling of the dining room and the floor of the hall above and turned out the electric light i then tied the steel cable securely to the head of my bed turned over and went to sleep lulled by the shaking of the house as the burglar dashed up and down the stairs just how long this continued i do not know for my sleep was deep and dreamless but i should judge that the burglar ran himself to death some time between half-past three and a quarter after four so great had been his efforts that when i went to remove him i did not recognize him at all when i had seen him last in the glow of the glass silver case he had been a stout chunky fellow and now his remains were those of an emaciated man he must have run off one hundred and twenty pounds of flesh before he gave out only one thing clouded my triumph our silver consisted of but half a dozen each of knives forks and spoons and a butter knife and a sugar spoon all plated and worth probably five dollars and to save this i had made the burglar wear to rags a wilton stair carpet worth twenty nine dollars but i have now corrected this i have bought fifty dollars worth of silver end of section twelve water goats and other troubles recording by kirk ziegler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk dot com end of ellis parker butler short stories volume one by ellis parker butler